organizing and sharing the, the first three uh, groups, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce briefly, they will probably um, explain better by themselves. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, for the group uh, or uh, block number one, session A, sorry. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mahal Jigwili um, with the general uh, uh, title of Heritage and Cultural Landscapes. Um, she will explain who is she better than me and uh, all the best uh, for you, Maha. Thank you for accepting uh, um, uh, our invitation for collaborating in this event. And in the session uh, letter B, we will have uh, Dr. Hussain Hussain. It's of course a, a pleasure to, to, to meet you here. And the urban topics uh, and complexities would be the the general um, uh, umbrella under this one, different perspectives will be developed today. The third session, these two sessions are in English. The third session, session C, is in Turkish. And uh, here we, we, we are really very happy to, to see uh, the contribution and to thank the contribution of Dr. Seda Mustanchi. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And she will uh, chair the session under the general topic of architecture and urban design. All these uh, um, different papers will be, will be of course, um, uh, talk and uh, presented in, in, in Turkish. So um, I would like to invite Dr. Mahal Jigwili uh, to introduce herself. And then I will do the same thing with the other two ones, Dr. Hussan Hussein and Dr. Seda Mustaj. Please, Dr. Maha, the floor and the platform, as it is now called, is yours. Thank you very much. Um, hello, Professor. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm Mahal Gweli from German University in Cairo. Uh, I'm an instructor of architecture uh, in the GUC, and um, usually I teach uh, computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, uh, and this might seen, be seen a little far from the heritage topic, but actually there is um, a connection using the technology uh, of uh, how we can preserve um, our heritage, uh, architecture heritage, uh, cultural heritage and landscapes. Um, so I will show you in the introduction uh, how this can be connected all together. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, always years. I'm so interested in the uh, topics and the papers um, that the respective authors will present. Thank you, Professor. The floor. Can you can you share? Can you uh, ah, you will do the the introduction in your session, right? Uh, yeah, it was okay. supposed to do that. Very good. Very good, very good. So let us now to uh, follow with uh, different uh, uh, self presentations. In this case, Dr. Hussein, uh, Hussein, I know that he did previously, but maybe some of the of the just arrived in this second session will not know that. Please, Dr. Hussein, are you uh, so kind to uh, to present yourself? Thank you. Probably Dr. Hussam is now starting his session, but I will make sure where he is. Uh, we can go to Dr. Seda. I think she's here. Yes. Very, very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Seda. And a special thanks to, to you always uh, helping at the last minute, uh, dear uh, Professor Roxanne. Please, <laughs> Dr. Seda, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, my session is uh, about. Uh, uh, urban design and architecture, uh, and uh, we are going to talk in the Turkish uh, session. Uh, I am uh, associate professor uh, from uh, Tekirdağ Namı Kemal University, and also I am urban planner and uh, urban designer. Uh, and uh, in my uh, in my uh, university, my area is uh, political science and public administration. Uh, so the a participation and a democracy are uh, also. Uh, interested areas uh, for uh, me, and uh, I wish everyone uh, to a, a very good uh, conference. Uh, 
Thank you, Jose. Thank you, uh, dear professor. Thank you very uh, much. I am trying to, to, to find out where is Dr. Ucham, but uh, I don't I don't find uh, him. Yes, uh, Professor Jose, he is starting. He is uh, stick to the time, and now he is starting his session. <laughs> so. Ah, very good, very good. So let us go to the different sessions Mo one more time. Be welcome, all of you, and enjoy the different uh, panels we have organized. In this case, with all our best intentions to to join all of us and especially to have the opportunity to, to have a successful uh, dialogues uh, alongside the different sessions so i think it's the moment to go each one uh, to uh, the respective sessions please uh, professor roxan uh, can you please guide us in this point yes uh, thank you i'm going to make uh, thank you everyone professor dr magical sorry I'm going to make uh, Dr. Roxana as host of session A. So uh, the, the, uh, our authors may join to session B, please, uh, if you want to go to, to see the titles, if you like them, uh, some titles that you would like to uh, uh, see. So you can join directly uh, session B or two Turkish authors or students may like to join directly to Turkish session. And uh, if you would like to ask or communicate any question, you are most welcome. Uh, so the three fish parallel session is available, uh, not necessarily uh, we may be all in session B, but if you would like to go parallel session of, to see what's happening on Iran, just click the button and you will be in that session. So um, let's uh, split it two, and I'm going to uh, give the uh, pass to Roxana and uh, I hope to have a productive uh, discussion ahead. Thank you, dear Professor Dr. Madrigal and our valuable guests and keynotes. Let's start. Thank you, Professor Jose. So now uh, the floor is your, uh, yours in session A and I'm going to mute myself. So you may continue. Anyone who would like to go to session B and C, you are available. Yes, dear Khadija, uh, the ones who are in session B, uh, we would be very pleased to click on the uh, session B. Dr. Hossam uh, is already in. Dr. Also Sadab Sanji is already in session C, uh, in Turkish session. And we will stay, since we are part of session A, we will stay here. Thank you very much. So in this case, uh, I give the floor to uh, Dr. Maha as the chairwoman of this uh, session. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maha. Uh, thank you, Professor, for having me. Um, Dr. Roxane, please make me a host because I want to share um, my screen. Yes, uh, dear uh, Dr. Maha, you are now host. Okay. So I would love to share um, this with you. Um, as I told you, my uh, main focus in research and uh, teaching is related to virtual reality, computer-aided design. And here I'm talking about the uh, glimpses of what we do and also uh, the relation between this and uh, the uh, heritage. So uh, I'm also um, from a coastal city called Alexandria in Egypt. And uh, according to the by law uh, in Egypt, um, heritage actually uh, is related to time. A building is considered uh, um, a heritage uh, listed building when uh, a certain number of years passed on it, uh, as well as for sure the value or the great value of uh, uh, this particular space or building. However, uh, heritage also can be uh, a current moment um, uh, because of the great value uh, that it provides. Um, because uh, when time is a common factor, uh, people can go around the uh, around the laws and demolish their own buildings, actually, 
uh, before they become heritage listed, although uh, uh, it's uh, they're very uh, uh, high value, but uh, actually this needs a lot of awareness and uh, uh, a lot of uh, effort uh, out of uh, us architects, urban designers, and also people who work in uh, cultural heritage. Um, another perspective or another way of preserving uh, this is to raise awareness and reuse the value. And this is actually what we do in GOC right now uh, by modularizing heritage and uh, historical architecture elements, details and ornaments. Uh, for example, this um, uh, photo from a project uh, of Hassan Fathi's architecture, Hassan Fathi, and we modularize this um, uh, building or type of buildings or uh, construction method in order to uh, make them as modules that can be used uh, in other compositions and recreate uh, uh, heritage uh, of tomorrow. And also uh, we work in, this is student work for sure, and uh, uh, we also work in um, to um, uh, decompose Islamic architecture into also uh, elements and reuse them to evolve uh, new spaces uh, following our heritage. I don't want to talk too much, uh, but I need here to um, uh, go to the uh, program and uh, our respective authors. So um, we are having actually uh, eight uh, papers that will be uh, presented. Uh, four of them will be present first, uh, then we, ha we will have 15 minutes of uh, um, a round table discussion, uh, receiving uh, your respective questions and uh, let them answer uh, your questions. So um, the first part will uh, contain four papers. Um, um, author Meng Lai and uh, uh, Jihan Slim from University of Leeds in UK uh, will present paper about fragmented heritage and collapsed collective memory and uh, identity, the uh, descendants of tomb caretakers at empirical tomb of uh, uh, Qing dynasty uh, in China. This paper examines the phenomena of uh, fragmented heritage and culture uh, in settlements of uh, uh, the caretakers of empirical tombs. So um, this will be the first paper. Uh, the second one is- Dr. Dr. Maha, uh, does you share any uh, program? Because uh, it still is the page is shared of uh, Professor Jose Madrigal. I am wondering uh, if you shared anything. Okay, I can share mine too. Okay. Now you see the, the program, yeah. right? No, still, still not. Uh, this is the, the sharing. If you give me the, uh, give me back the host, so I, I am trying uh -huh, to. Okay. I will stop the share now and. Uh, yes, Dr. Uh, Meng Li, I think they are uh, in and uh, we can also now you are the host dr sana mm -hmm. yes Hello, Dr. Rasane. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, if, if, uh, if the audience look on, the, on their monitor, on their laptop screens, they will see uh, a view options. If you click on that view option, you can see the presenter's name and you click on the presenter and then you will automatically uh, see her slides, her presentation. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much.
So I can complete the the title, the paper titles till uh, Dr. Sane uh, fix this uh, technical issue. So the second paper is about medieval uh, aristocracy, fortified spaces, and contemporary uh, social context. And this paper is about uh, um, a call for a broader scrutiny. Uh, 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 in the field of medieval aristocratic uh, building environments. And this will be presented by uh, Sipan uh, Khalil from Netherlands. So um, we have another two papers, an observation of contemporary conservation approaches conserving uh, the memory and, then, and identity of uh, uh, 20th century architecture. And this paper will uh, uh, is presented by uh, Karen uh, Otsu. Um, she's, uh, or he is a, a PhD candidate uh, in Karatay University uh, from Turkey. These are the first four papers that will uh, be presented. So uh, we will start with uh, the first one. Um, Dr. Ruxane, should I share my screen or you will do this? Sorry, uh, you're muted. Yes. <laughs> I don't know whether it is already shared or not. Can you see the, the yes, picture we can is uh, mainly? Uh, just a moment. Uh, I have to announce one thing. Dear Professor, uh, dear out of valuable authors of Turkish session, session C is available for you. Please join to session C because uh, you're supposed to be on that session. For example, Dr. Gü uh, Jansu Gülner and Dr. Emine. Türkçe bölümü açıktı. Session C'de oradan devam edebilirsiniz. Başkanımız orada sizi bekliyor. Session C'de olan yazarlarımız orada Session C'de bekliyoruz sizleri. Sorry for Turkish. So you may continue. My yes, dear, uh, dear uh, Meng Li, uh, we can see you over here. And uh, shall we start the video? Yeah, yeah. A third year PhD candidate supervised by Dr. G. Hansen Lim, and we are from the Architecture and Urbanism Research Group, the University of Leeds. This is our topic for today. It's about heritage, collective memory, and identity, and the case in point is from China. This presentation consists of these five points in turn. Let's start with a brief introduction. Here are some basic theories related to this topic. We hope to exploit the phenomena of fragmented culture and heritage and rebuilding group identity through selective collective memory after the original collective memory and identity have collapsed. To make this phenomena concrete, the descendants of the term caretakers nearby the imperial tools of the Qing dynasty would be taken as a case study. Here is some basic information about the tombs and the caretakers in history. The imperial tombs of the Qing dynasty are World Heritage Site, but studies of the tomb caretakers are rare. We focus on this group because their descendants still living in the formal settlements today. Take the area of the eastern Qing tombs as an example. As you can see on the left-hand side, the black areas around the tombs are the historical segments of the caretakers. The map on the right hand side is from the current satellite map, which has been identified and marked. The blue dots are the main tombs, the red dots are the current villages. The location of the present village coincides with the location of the formal segment. Qualitative research methods were adopted in this study. Field work in China was conducted last year. 36 interviewees agreed to one to one interviews. All the interviewees were descendants of the tomb caretakers or from the associated community. Therefore, the questions were divided into three sections, as you can see, to investigate their memories and perceptions. Many kinds of material evidence were also collected along with the interviews. In the study, firstly, it was found that the collective memory loss was significant across the group of descendants, especially the communicative memory. 
Communicative memory was part of the collective memory, carrying stories and memories of daily interactions, and could only last around hundred years within the group. The first question to all descendants was to tell some stories about their ancestors' daily lives. However, very few people could answer this question accurately in any detail. Here is an example to describe the good living conditions of caretakers, which was what we expected. But there were very few of this kind of answer. Besides, there's an important part of the collective memory, the cultural memory that was reflected in the space and the tangible and intangible elements, were very vague in the community of descendants. One of the most direct examples was the vanishing of the Japu means ancestral spectrum. A well-preserved Japu could even trace the history of a family back hundreds of years. All interviewees were asked if they had a Japu at home, but none of them gave a positive response. Only one interviewee provided me with this picture. And it's only one page, but as you can see, there's already a lot of information in it. In addition, the old buildings and living space that had shaped the caretakers' lives were dramatically demolished and changed. All interviewees mentioned that old houses could not meet the required standards for living conditions. One example is shown in the response. Slightly older houses in the community are also at risk. For instance, the house shown in the picture was an old house that was preserved relatively well, but in a state of disrepair. Some of the remains of official buildings were even more worrying. For example, the Dongfu is shown here. It used to be the place where the princess a lift that was sent to take care of the tombs. Historically, the layout of a dome was comprehensive and magnificent, as shown in the picture on the left-hand side. However, the only remaining buildings were now abandoned and in poor condition. Nearby villagers had broken the gate, planted their vegetables in the abandoned yard, or dumped their household waste in it. Along with the loss of collective memory, the study also formed a collapse in group identity. Both historically and today, the identities of the tomb caretakers and their descendants include three dimensions. Firstly, they were Chinese, then they belonged to the Manchu ethnic minority, and finally, they were the tomb caretakers among Manchu. Except for the Chinese identity, the group's identities of both Manchu and Tomb caretaker experienced clubs. This process is closely related to the changes in the social and political landscape. According to the responses from multiple interviewees, two detailed lines were generated, taking 1945 as the cutoff point to try to demonstrate the social changes experienced by the tomb caretakers community. In this period, their identities of Manchu and caretakers had collapsed, especially in three time periods, the Land Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, and the Cultural Revolution. After a few decades of social stability and development, the reconstruction of identities in the group started. But the study also found that it was not a full reconstruction based on the complete collective memory. For example, since the 1950s, the state has gradually introduced favorable policies for ethnic minorities. In this situation, not only did the true Manchu recover their identity, but some Han people who have moved into the area later also began to change their ethnic identity to Manchu. Another example is that two descendant villages nearby the Western Qing tombs, which were full of restaurants serving visitors a Manchu dead, 
In addition, we can hardly feel other cultures associated with this identity in the local area. As for the identity of the tomb caretakers, it has not yet been reconstructed by their descendants. To sum up, this study draws three conclusions. Firstly, today descendants are building their identity based on selective collective memory. They chose cultural memories that bring practical benefits and conform to the mainstream ideology to shape their identity. Because of favorable policies, they chose to restore their mental identity. Meanwhile, cultural elements such as food and clothing can serve tourism and bring economic benefits, so they use these elements to shape their identity. While elements such as characters, language, and etiquette cannot directly bring the benefits above, so they are rarely selected by descendants. Besides, some elements that are not encouraged by the mainstream ideology are ignored. This leads to the second conclusion, that is, in the absence of a complete cultural memory to support it, it is difficult for descendants to establish solid identities from the fragments. This leads to the fact that they are confused about their identities. For instance, many interviewees consistently jumped between the descendants of tomb caretakers and Manchu when they called themselves. And this kind of jump has no rules. The last one is that selective collective memory constructs a confused identity result in a fragmented picture of local culture and heritage. We did not find a complete local culture narrative framework to fully describe the identity of man to all the descendants of caretakers. With all the guidance of the framework, local culture and heritage such as old houses, old space, as well as some intact cultural elements cannot be fully preserved. Only bits and pieces of heritage that reflect different identities in the community can be seen. Besides, descendants actively or positively give up the collective memory and identity of caretakers, which is also one of the reasons why the Imperium tombs as a world heritage site has been separated from the original cultural environment. This is a loss of heritage integrity. This is the reference. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you, Langley. So now, um, Dr. Oksane will share the second paper, Medieval Aristocracy, uh, 45 Spaces and Contemporary Social Contacts. It's presented by uh, Sipan uh, Khalil from Netherlands. Uh, uh, we don't have any video, uh, dear uh, Dr. Moha. Uh, let us check whether the uh, author is available. Uh, dear uh, Siepan. Okay, uh, probably uh, the author is not available to do the online presentation. Uh, we can Go to the next one, Dr. Maha. Okay, so we are going to uh, present now the third paper, which, uh, which is titled An Observation of Contemporary Conservation Approaches Conserving the Memory and Identity of 20th Century Architecture. Uh, it's um, uh, presented by uh, candidate Karen Otsu uh, from uh, Karate University uh, from Turkey. Uh, I have to announce also that for people who didn't see my introduction presentation for a technical issue, I will post now in the uh, chat a link for uh, the slides so that you can check them. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Baha, after uh, the, uh, these four presentation, uh, I, I, I already solved the problem after these uh, four presentations. We will give you, I will give you the presentation so you will also uh, present your work. Uh, oh, thank you. 
Thank you so much. Of, of, of course, you will do it your, yourself. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go with our yes. her paper. This is PhD candidate journalist. Today, I'm going to present you my article, which calls an observation of contemporary conservation approaches, conserving the memory and identity of the For the fourth international conference of contemporary ideas, architecture, and identity, held by Alain. This article that I'm presenting you today is produced by the master thesis of the author, written in 2020 under the supervision of Professor Dr. Kovanovice in Vienna. The presentation that is presenting today is produced under the six different categories, which can be stated as introduction, researching this level of literature, assessment and discussion, conclusions and recommendations. As we all know, culture has a very dynamic expression that includes both term and the field. Nevertheless, the evolution of value in the process of conservation is still much debated. Although conventional values such as open fancy circles are widely approved by the common sense, some fundamentals such as memory and identity are still not accepted to be needed for preservation. Hence, today, conservation of scientific infrastructure is dependent on the preference of the culture. And local authorities' preference are changing according to their benefits. Correspondingly, many countries are taking the risk of deterioration and losing their authenticity and history. The built environment is one of the ever changing phenomena of daily life and architecture. The built environment shows the constant changes and, in this way, turning itself into the witness that carries all the traces of life from past to past. Since any deterioration or demolition in the built environment may cause permanent changes, any intervention or change can only accept in such a way that would produce heritage identity and authenticity, of course, without degrading the existing values and social characters. As we should understand this, it is important to understand what is the heritage identity and authenticity by understanding and evaluating what is the existing values of heritage and what even their international conservation principles to guide this significant task and evaluation of value. Yet, following the limits and criteria of conservation is conditioned by the national legislation of each country. Therefore, mostly there is a gap between the national and international legislation of each country, which unfortunately most of them causes the deterioration and losing of authenticity. The ignorance towards physical expertise and correspondingly practice intervention to create a risk towards the culture and heritage together with memory and identity of both individuals and collectors. But this central product is still neither truly understood nor seen as a heritage that should pass through the generation and one common sense in many countries such as From starting from these premises, the study aims to carry the debate on a common ground based on a specific country. And I don't want to develop constant and natural approaches to architectural heritage of the this century. In that part, uh, the study aims to identify both positive, both positive and negative approaches to understand why modern architectural heritage has frequently been placed to danger of destruction or desolation, and what are the main reasons behind those common the biases and dilemmas, and what are the effects of existing conservation attitudes on heritage, identity, and memory. Doing so, the arguments and methods are structured in such a way that displays the existing proof conditions of modern heritage and reacts to the course of unfortunate events that we see uh, too much over the 20 years in Turkey, especially. Suspension and proper abolition and preservation of modern architectural heritage are discussed based on the present examples from the same context and period so that we can follow we can follow how it develops and how the approaches can affect the same context. 
concerning the memory and identity of heritage, assessing criteria how gathered the manage that presents the effective way of approaching the artificial heritage in its value for in checking the limits and efficiency of conservation. Doing so, uh, for assessing the artificial heritage, uh, heritage identity is framed and indicated the tangible aspects of selected changes related to the environment and setting are identified. At the same time, for the evaluation of selected temple buildings in the modern conscious form of conservation, a value analysis card has been framed. With the current valuation of significance of heritage has been introduced through the analysis of several features. With the temple placement, it is important to understand what is the conservation. Conservation is an integral act committed to protecting heritage from attrition of types of changes in the urban environment and in the industry. Although cultural heritage and corresponding way cultural heritage, cultural heritage values in terms are as old as society itself, yet all those terms are constantly reinterpreted or revised. Therefore, it is much more necessary to have a good grasp of the entire development process of human conservation instead of focusing on identified terms or well accepted approaches. Uh, in this way, it is really important to understand the main, uh, the main current point of the field, which is question of value. Appreciating the heritage and its practical heritage value is a crucial and necessary. And starting with this idea, let's show examples of what is cultural heritage values and why the cultural heritage values is important and how we should approach and to this term to understanding the tangible and intangible forms. Uh, that cultural heritage has. As we can say that, the tangible and intangible forms play critical roles as a complementary factors for social and cultural connectivity. Therefore, the developmental, social and memory values of 20th century architectural heritage are considered elemental that how much is necessary to be conserved for cultural integrity and region. And second of all, in literature, memory and identity is analyzed and tried to understand. Uh, as we can understand the holistic connections between the built environment, heritage, identity, and memory is necessary for the continuity and integrity of society. And it is very important to understand if the past change, the present will be affected. And accordingly, if the present change, the future will be affected. And keeping all this in mind, assessment, uh, the selected cases is identified according to being public eye. And there was no intention to debate the facts of specific information or specific cases, yet present a concern in Christian manners concerning the loss of value and memory and identity and diversity was the main aim while selecting these cases. So, aiming to highlight both in custom and intensive approaches to understand what, what is the main biases and dilemmas and how we should they approach, why this is happening and why it's not happening. Therefore, it uh, created a value analysis card as it shown and um, started to analyze two cases as a selective. One can be identified as positive, one can be identified as a negative. As, as you can see on the right side, the inner bank, the purposeful probability bank, is the uh, demolished case, which can be considered as a negative approach is uh, analyzed and uh, from this conservation of 20th century architecture is discussed and uh, try to understand the much resulting and uh, generating dilemma based on perspective of cultural heritage values. As we can say that the evolution of 20th century architecture has fallen behind modern conservation concepts and the existing conservation manners and approaches to have legal gaps in the process of identification, evaluation, registration and conservation of 20th century heritage. These controversial and constant legal excuses have led society in many losses, which is very unfortunate. And second case is shown under the page, which is the Jai Modern Museum. It can, this uh, is identified as a positive approach. Architecture with its various types of structures is one of the phenomena of culture. Therefore, artificial self within the dimension of time, place, and color represent all the past and present of the society with its activities, activities, and progress. 
in it, it's difficult to conserve all the social cultural references and values in a dynamic real context. It should be conscious that any change to spectrum or definition is permanent. So it is very important how we approach this cultural heritage, how we are taking care of them, how we are maintaining, and how we are conserving them for its sake of identity, memory, culture, and heritage. From all this discussion and the case analysis that is being uh, telling you, not so much detail and as much as detail, the definition and evaluation of modern heritage in developing countries such as Turkey uh, is seen as not enough, impressive, or acceptable. The major problems of contemporary conservation approaches in Turkey is the conflict between the relevant institutions, lack of finding cultural mechanisms, Inconstancy in between authorities and professionals, legal gaps between national regulations and international principles, self satisfactory conservation consequences. And the 20th century heritage has been not fully understood or been neglected. This is the second conclusion uh, that is bullish. Destructive or harmful approaches towards the 20th century heritage mostly based on lack of interest or appreciation, separation and tangible and intangible aspects due to lack of public or administration awareness, insensitive profit oriented approaches, and that mostly cause the generational destruction. At the same time, constructive or positive are mostly based on proper documentation and identification, comprehensive evaluation of value, regular maintenance, sensitive conservation approaches. And understanding all these results, based on the assessment of cases, it is concluded that the architectural character and social cultural values of modern buildings should be evaluated in a broad sense. The 20th century buildings should be defined and evaluated as a cultural heritage that needs to be conserved. The 20th century buildings should be regarded as architectural products of yesterday. The cultural significance or social roles of each architectural heritage may change, yet maintaining a community and social characteristic has put the heck on society. The contextual features and functional roles may change, yet alteration should be responsive to the architectural and contextual aspects. The 20th century buildings should be promoted as a contemporary, and race awareness should be extended. Thank you for your listening and patience. If there's a question, I will be glad to answer. Uh, thank you, Serene uh, Otsu. I hope I pronounced the name right. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Not too so much. Jeran. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry for that. But um, we are going to move to the fourth uh, paper uh, Adapt the re re Reuse of the House of uh, Mietza Mehdi uh, Farhash Vachi in uh, Tabriz, uh, Tabriz, Iran. Uh, this paper will be presented by PhD candidate uh, uh, Narmin Papazade um, from Eastern Mediterranean University in Cyprus. So uh, we have the video here. Okay, so Dr. Sana will Hello, share everyone. this with you. Today I want to talk about adaptive reuse of the House of Mesomedia Parish in Tabriz, Iran. After talking about the architectural characteristics of this house, I'm going to talk about conservation and restoration and then adaptive reuse of this house. Tabriz is one of the oldest cities on the northwest side of Iran and it's the capital of East Azerbaijan province. Here you can see the location of the house in um, Karajadali or Dara Sultanate Tabriz map in 1818, uh, which are the list of the buildings of, uh, in Tabriz. Here you can see the location of Sorhab neighborhood, one of the northern neighborhoods of Iran, which the house is located in there, and the map belongs to 1908. There are four main forms of buildings in Tabriz, which we use uh, most of the sun, uh, especially during the winter, which we have cold winters and weathers. And, uh, um, 
Mm -hmm. Either we have on one side, two sides, or the shape of L or U. Here you can see the location of the historic house of Mesameti Farosh Persian in Soha Quarter and the location of historic buildings like Sahibul Anmas and House of Shadatobi or even in studios, studies foundation and time. Tomb of Say Hamza and Makbar Shuaro, which is the burial place of most most poets, something like more than 400, that is said. Here you can see the access ways to the house of Mirza Media Farosh Bashi from the main street. And you can see the aerial view of the house. This part of the house, the northern part, is um, Ajari building, and this part is um, added during Pahlavi period. For the conservation, we have generally three stages. The emergency actions stage, the study and recognition of the building stage, and reconstruction stage. Uh, for this building, uh, the, the issues that cause damage are either age of the building, climate factors like rain and snow and humidity, extra loads that uh, some places are added later, I will explain, and uh, human factors um, which cause damage to the building. Uh, about the conservation of the building, uh, which start time of protection, we have three different operations. Simultaneous protection, the establishment and equipment of a restoration studio, preservation and protection during restoration, and preservation and protection during adaptive reuse. In this building, uh, the restoration work, uh, which are most important, are eliminating disruptive factors, strengthening, improving, and replacing, removing the worthless extension, and restoration of the decorations and ornaments of the building. After analysis of the short uh, analysis of the house, we decide uh, to use. Uh, this building as a museum of points because uh, it is um, near to Mahbarto Shuaro, which is the burial place of almost something like more than 400 points. So these pieces of museum of points, they have three different spaces, cultural spaces, administrative spaces, and services spaces, cultural activity, spaces uh, include museum library and computer site. Museum have biography books and paper conservation part. The biography museum consists of biography and poetry of poets, sculpture and belongings of the most recent poets. We have history books to be conserved in paper conservation room and also new books for sale. The library has reading rooms, bookshelves, and librarians to help the readers to find their uh, book. Also, we have computer sites connected to internet to find the books and also download the audiobooks list onto them and find the list of the books. The administrative spaces uh, consist of managers, assistant employers, and secretaries room. Service spaces, either religious, hygienic, or other places mm -hmm. like ladies and gentlemen's prayer room, toilets, traditional tea house, kitchen, security, and stairs. This is the site plan map of the building. Uh, the northern part of the building is the original part of the building, which is uh, built during a period, period and this part of the building is added during Pahlavi. So for the Museum of Points, I prefer cultural spaces here in the main part of the building and administrative and service spaces here. We have a neighbor here, a bath here, alley, alley, uh, main entrance was uh, destroyed, uh, but we still we have a door here, uh, emergency entrance and emergency exit here. The ground floor of Bajor building. 
is uh, designed for uh, either the sculptures of the poets, poems, and belongings of the poets, and biography of the poets. Uh, we can also sit here on the benches in the inner yard and enjoy reading our books and the beautiful building. The quality of the spaces in ground floor of Bajor building, uh, we have their area and their lighting system, either natural or artificial or both, and ventilation and uh, their access from outdoor or inner courtyard. The plan of first floor of Bajor building, we have poetry reading hall, librarian, reading rooms, uh, with the best light, bookshop, museum of history books, computer site, assistance desk, and stores. And here is the quality of them, their access from outdoor or inner court, ventilation lighting system, and with the capacity of them according to the standards of library. The ground floor of the Pahlavi Building or Museum of Points, main entrance, and we have uh, the stairs going upstairs, the administrative part, the religious part, the service part, which is the toilets and kitchen, and the quality of the spaces, their entrance and access. In the second floor, we have traditional tea house, and the best view is uh, for the building to see the south elevation of Bajar building. These two elevations are the interior elevations of the building and these are the exterior elevations of the building. Um, the A and B section from Bajar building and C section from Pahlavi building, the interior of traditional tea house on the first floor and the interior of the ground floor of Pahlavi building. We prefer transparent uh, furniture and neutral colors. The ground floor of uh, Bajar building. We have some glasses for biography and poets of the um, poems to points of the poets to show, and we have thermal street system for heating. There are so many beautiful houses in Tabriz. Uh, that were abandoned and forgotten, and due to lack of maintenance and function, uh, they are facing in the danger of decay or human devastation. So the adaptive use of these houses can help to prolong their life and um, a way to better their life. And as the historic buildings belong to all generations from past, current, and future, and similarly they belong to all of all people all around the world, this conservation and adaptive use can improve the quality of their life with adaptive use and revitalization. Uh, we can attract more tourists and the permanent maintenance of the buildings, improvement of neighborhood and urban architectural is possible. These are the references. Actually, this is uh, derived from my master thesis, defended on 2011. I want to thank my supervisors and thank you for your time and attention. Okay, thank you uh, for the three presenters. And now we can open uh, the, the discussion for uh, questions and uh, answers. Uh, we had uh, three uh, presentations. Uh, one, uh, the, the first paper was Fragmented Heritage and Collapsed Collective Memory and Identity, uh, that descendants of the tomb uh, caretakers at the empirical tombs uh, of Qing dynasty in China. And uh, the second paper was an observation of contemporary conservation approaches, uh, conserving the memory and identity of the 20th century uh, architecture. And um, uh, the last one was adaptive reuse of the house 
of uh, Mirza Mehdi uh, uh, Farash Bachi in uh, Tabriz, Iran. Uh, so if we have uh, the three uh, respective authors, uh, we can open now the uh, discussion and receive questions uh, from um, uh, the respective uh, attendees. You can uh, open your mm -hmm. mic for that or uh, just write in the chat. So, any questions here? Uh, yes, uh, well, if not, I have one question. Uh, well, actually, all the articles was, uh, were very interesting, uh, the work of Mengli as well. Uh, the question is that, so I have the question regarding the Farash Pashi uh, uh, the house, uh, adoptive reuse house in uh, Tabriz. Previously, uh, I was checking that, uh, uh, dear Dr. Narmin, you were evaluating the case uh, deeply. However, uh, I was curious that uh, this house, wa was there any additional, because I couldn't follow in the maps the additional uh, things or uh, extract, subtracting uh, the, some issues from the houses itself, from the construction point of view, how it was. Uh, I couldn't follow it in the, uh, uh, even the photos that you were provided. Uh, I want to know, did you, uh, regarding uh, why you were evaluating the work, uh, did you find any uh, positive aspect or uh, any even negative aspect regarding this uh, adaptive reuse and how it will uh, influence to the revitalization of the quarter? Was there any effect in terms of a spillover uh, or let's say, um, uh, uh, convincing uh, people to uh, to take part of, especially communities, to take part of this kind of project because it happened in Yaz uh, when the, the first house was renovated. Then uh, private sector started to uh, uh, um, uh, to do th these kind of adaptive reuse and. Uh, eventually that the area, the history core of the city of Yaz, uh, not by government, but uh, by communities was uh, revitalized. Uh, what was its influence in, uh, in that specific near neighborhood in Tabriz? I would be very pleased if you can give us any information if you have. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, actually, uh, your question is the, the second half more of my PhD because this is the, the, the first half of my PhD project. Uh, in, in the first half, uh, I, I would like to understand or know uh, that the community, how, the local community, how do they understand and know their uh, cultural heritage, uh, including the abandoned buildings that you mentioned. And uh, in the second half, uh, I would like to, you know, I would like to adopt the idea of the Eco Museum. Uh, I'm not sure that if you guys know this, the Eco Museum. Uh, because this is a kind of community participation process uh, to preserve the local heritage, uh, including both the tangible and intangible uh, elements. So that is what I'm going to do. Uh, basically, uh, according to this idea, or we would like to uh, encourage the communities to, you know, to exploit, to dig their own culture and their own history. Uh, as well as uh, actually I conduct a lot of interviewees and it's a part of work to collect the oral histories because the oral history can, can reflect a lot of, a lot of uh, old stories of the communities. And this part is actually, this part is a kind of, they did not, you know, they did not find on, they did not realize, but uh, through this process and that we can say that uh, they begin to 
uh, understand or exploring or finding or refunding their own culture. And uh, actually, we expected that um, at the end of the process, and they can engage in into the, the process to uh, to preserve their their heritage, like the buildings, abandoned buildings. Actually, this project is ongoing, and we found that the local people, a community, they began to preserve their uh, their, their heritage. Uh, for example, the, the building, the abandoned one, and the first of all, they clean up there, and they repair the gate, and they won't uh, broke uh, broke down the gate again, and they won't go there to dump their house waste. And all of these are a kind of positive things, I, I suppose. So mm, I'm not sure that uh, in the end of the PhD journey, I, I, I think that I can got the conclusion about how the community exactly can do. But now I think we got the way that is the Eco Museum. Uh, I'm not sure if it is okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much because it is the common question for you and uh, dear Narmin as well. Uh, thank you for your response. Uh, any comments, dear Dr. Narmin, you want to add? Yes, Professor Jose. We cannot see. Oh, yes. yes, 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 yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all the uh, different uh, participants in this panel for the interesting topics. I I would like to, to highlight one point that it's a um, collateral comment to one of the presentations I saw. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to see one um, interior architecture project. Uh, uh, for the Museum of uh, Poets, I would like to, understand, to try to understand better, especially for these countries where there are clear divisions among the architecture and interior architecture. For me, everything is architecture. Um, how can we deal these things in these cases? You know, especially when we are talking about, in this case, uh, heritage, but probably because of the characteristics of the poetry, um, a bit intangible element. So how can we deal with this kind of division, interior architecture and architecture, and at the same time, uh, how the concept of intangible, intangible um, um, uh, heritage is inside of all this mix? Uh, I don't know if maybe the author of this uh, um, presentation could uh, be able to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I may try to explain as much as I can. Um, uh, for my work, I realized that uh, it is very important to understand, the, especially for the society, what is the tangible aspects that this characteristic place has. Because generally, they don't understand it or uh, they don't not aware of uh, the building, uh, other interior or exteriorly, has characteristic why it is important and how much it is valuable. Because generally, that they have this idea about the value, which is much more commercial. It's really uh, connected with the history, ageness, and some special characteristics. Otherwise, they don't understand really. Uh, how they should approach this kind of uh, aspects and values. So I think it's what is more important to understand um, them to show uh, which characteristics that buildings have. Either it is too much important, which is very unique or authentic, or it's much more, uh, let's say, not that much important and regular, but it's very important to show them and uh, tell them why we should conserve and what are the uh, valuable attachments that they give us. Because as we all know, uh, these tangible and intangible bonds as you know, uh, connects us with, with the past, today and the future. So without them, we can't really uh, build our identity on it. 
or we can't really conserve our memory. So that this is really important to show them. Um, they really understand the effects of tangible bonds, but uh, it is really hard for the society and more general common sense to understand the intangible ones. So that this is really, I think, important for showing them the, their connections about their memories, their experiences, so, so that we should really uh, put them forward and highlight them so that they can really connect with it. And in this way, that I believe we can really um, develop what is we are facing today uh, with the heritage, and so that they can really change their minds and settings, so we can enrich these uh, aspects and approaches. I hope uh, this can give you the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I also, if if nobody has any more question, I also have one question uh, for the Mingli. It's okay uh, because uh, since we have in somehow uh, related topics about memory and identity, which was I was very interested with your presentation. I would like to ask about these tomes, and I want to understand. Uh, you were talking about the conserving their memory and identity so that people can change into the, some kind of a uh, living heritage. But I can't really understand why people not uh, really connected with those heritages. Because uh, I couldn't find your presentation, maybe that was I couldn't catch it. But uh, these heritage, uh, whom to belong, it's a very really gap for me because like I couldn't understand why the people living in there couldn't connect with those heritages because you know in the built environment we are connected even the grocery store next to us in somehow so I would like to know the the details if you can thank you okay thank you very much for your question yeah uh because you know there there are two main reasons actually first of all uh, because now uh, the, the heritage site, I mean the tombs, belongs to the state under the administrative management of the country. So this group of people, they, you know, they don't need to take any responsibility or in other right, in, in other words, uh, they don't have any right to manage, to engage in managing or protecting the tombs. Actually, they're just the people who lived next to the heritage site at present. But in the hist but in history, they are actually the people who looking after the tombs. You know, be because of the tomb constructed there, and the Imperium family need the people to recite to to, to to send people there and to get settlements there and to look after the, the tombs. But now, you know, the first their identity, I mean, their job is, is totally different. This is the first reason. And the second one is actually, I suppose it uh, regards to the change, changes of ideology. Because actually, uh, you know, during the almost hundred, around 100 years in the modern history of China, actually, we, we changed a lot. We changed the political system and we built up the new country. You know, during this process, actually, the, the, their ideology changed a lot. So, the, you know, they just say goodbye to the past. And actually, they are not re really realized that what, uh, what their memory is, is very, you know, valuable and is a part of the heritage site. That is also the question about how can we connect the, the intangible and the tangible together? That is why. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was very good answer. Like you were also very right to say that about the ideologies and changing aspects of conservation, the cultural heritage. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, due to the time, Dr. Moha, even you can also present your work as well since you have also the presentation. Okay. So I, 
Okay, so thank you our uh, presenters and then uh, I can share my screen now. Um. Can you see uh, my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. So uh, what I was saying in my presentation is actually how to link heritage with um, uh, parametrics in uh, um, computer-aided design and how can uh, these uh, technologies can be part of uh, the conservation processes and approach or one of the approaches that can be um, uh, can help actually. So um, you might find this topic is pretty uh, far. I mean, the parametrics and the R and so on, but uh, I will show you poetic ideas about that. Um, so I'm also from Alexandria, uh, a coastal city, uh, uh, Mediterranean actually, uh, in Egypt. So. Um, a building is considered local, uh, yani local uh, in the local bylaw in Egypt uh, is considered heritage once a certain number of years passed on it, uh, uh, as well as also the value for sure of uh, uh, the particular space. And this is problematic who uh, is uh, deciding about the value and uh, the years and so on. So um, what I can see here is um, it's not about the time because sometimes um, heritage can be the current moment, the, the current uh, um, uh, event. Uh, the memory and identity um, is uh, forming and shaping in the current moment. So we cannot neglect this and say, uh, uh, there, is no, there is no the years count uh, needed uh, to consider this heritage. So, um, so it's about also the, the great value that is uh, created. Uh, because today is the heritage of tomorrow for sure. So uh, because we, uh, uh, when the time is um, actually a common factor, we find people can go around to demolish their own buildings. And here Nangli was talking about the caretakers who feel like they are just living beside the site, but uh, because it's uh, um, for the state. Uh, but here you can find in Alexandria too many buildings are demolished by their own uh, um, uh, owners, um, thinking that uh, we should demolish this before we uh, uh, complete the count of years. Uh, so the state will uh, force us not to touch the building. So you find here Villa uh, Agyun in Alexandria was demolished after 90 years uh, of its construction, while uh, uh, um, uh, whereas it's very valuable in uh, architecture terms and also uh, um, cultural uh, heritage. Uh, another way of preserve, uh, preserving our heritage in architecture is to raise the awareness for sure and to reuse the value. Um, uh, I think this is one of the projects that we work in GOC, and this is, uh, uh, the, I am showing you the students' work. We took, for example, Hassan Fathi's uh, work at the Great Architect and tried to modularize uh, or taking uh, the elements of uh, his um, architecture language and uh, try to making them as Lego parts or a part that can be connected in another context. And here we can uh, see uh, the elements, ornaments in, in details are um, reconnected um, differently uh, by the students. And we have too many uh, proposals that can use uh, uh, the same uh, objects with the same uh, shape grammar and uh, um, give you generative uh, um, uh, solutions uh, that can be uh, evolved. And also here, um, another current or running project, which is uh, decomposing Islamic architecture into its uh, primitive uh, parts and primitive elements. Uh, and uh, later on, we are going to recollect this and using it to redesign and evolve uh, design in light of uh, the great uh, heritage uh, we have. 
so this is actually pretty uh, much what I wanted to say at the beginning as an introduction for uh, the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now we can uh, move directly to uh, the second part of our session, uh, which contains four uh, respective papers also. Uh, the first one will be um, uh, um, a Levantine uh, mansion, a Buka Guidance Center for Disabled Students, and it's a documentation paper uh, of uh, morphologies uh, of uh, Levantine mansion along 100 50 uh, years. Uh, and this will be presented by Emery uh, Ergun um, and uh, Beste Demerican uh, from Izmir University, Faculty of Fine Arts in Turkey. And um, uh, this, uh, our second paper will be land uses and activities management in urban regeneration projects adjacent to uh, historical areas. The role of urban land uses to promote sustainable urban regeneration development um, by uh, the author uh, is Associate Professor Ibrahim Mohamed uh, Youssef from uh, Cairo University. And this paper suggests uh, viewing the processes of uh, urban regeneration as uh, a long-term cycle of activities. And um, we have also um, the heritage and its surroundings uh, in the face of damage. This is the third paper by Mohammed Nail, uh, Faculty of Natural Sciences in Turkey, uh, which gives the focus to the impact of different um, distortions due to human civilization and urban expansion uh, on the heritage building uh, surroundings. And the last one uh, will be uh, Bitawi's Waqf uh, Mosques in the uh, threat of um, uh, gentrification. Uh, uh, by Fahad Diana, Fahad Diana uh, Yunias. Uh, I hope I can uh, pronounce this better than that. Uh, from the Department of Architecture, Indonesia. Um, and uh, this study attempts to understand the transfer of ownership pattern in uh, Waqf mosques. So um, we can start directly with our first paper. Assistant Professor Dr. Anna Ayrin and I, Dr. Damirjan from Nizmi University of Economics, we present you about the study named Elevantine Mansion, which is a guidance center for disabled students. In the first part of the presentation, after a brief introduction, the methods, historical background of Buja, Nizmi Levantine community, and Buja Levantine horses will be explained. Later, the Guidance Center for Disabled Students will be focused, periodization of the mansion, and the findings of the study will be described. The study is based on two reports, other three, prepared for the restoration project of a historical building completed in February 2020. Looking at what these three reports are, the first report is an elaborated descriptive analysis of the existing situation supported by a group of drawings and photographs. The second is the restoration report explaining the renewal principles and what kind of repayment is considered space by space. And the third is the restitution report attempts to understand the phases in buildings history, the process of change and the now. This study is a summary of the first and the third. The aim of the study is to understand what was changed in each period, and it has scoped into a 150 years period in time, since the construction date of the mansion is 1876. Then the data collection method is constituted of literature review, photographic documentation, and laser measurement. A comprehensive data set with measured drawings including floor and ceiling plan, sections, elevation, and joint detail, has been produced depending on the measurements and photographs. The evaluation method is the comparative analysis to relate the common properties of Levantine houses with the plan typology and the traits in the building. A periodization with three different change phases is proposed by following the traces and a description of each space has been made, as well as estimations on what the chains were. 
Afterwards, as a town center of Izmir, the Buja region was a popular housing area starting from the 17th century. Then, the development speeded up in 18th century with many countryside houses and became urbanized within the social conditions of 19th century. The railway connection to the city center was the main driving force of this rapid development. In other words, it can be said that the 19th century was a golden period for Izmir and Bujaism. Then, looking at the Izmir Levantine community, Levantine refers to the people coming from a European family and settling to certain cities like Istanbul and Izmir in Turkey as an Eastern Mediterranean country. At the end of the 16th century, the land company has been established to trade between militants and Ottoman empires. Later on, the Valentines were given the right to own property, with which they became permanently settled, and wealthy families moved to the old side of the city centre by the royal edict of reform in 1868. As regards the Valentine houses, there is a duality in the special layout of mansions, the main building and an annex adjacent to the former. The main building is where the household is and higher than the annex, which is for the servants. About the main building, upper floor meets the requirements. However, the ground floor is to represent the owner's social status and economic power. Ground floor rooms are flamboyant with rich adornment and interior elements, whereas the upper floor has simple and modest ornaments and furniture. Now, about the Buddha Guidance Center for Disabled Students, the mansion is the property of French Wambi e Icardiona, according to the historical records. Construction date assumed as 1876. Other buildings which are on the layout plan were built in recent years. At the first time of the 1920s, probably the mansion had been assigned to Yurik Ali Afa, was used as a community center starting from 1943 and as a primary school age. But a comparison made with the Flamboy and Buddha Levantine mansions of the time, it is a modest task. About the periodization, the step on the mass, which is breaking the unity of an rectangular form, is highly remarkable. There is a thickness difference of the interior wall, which can be noticed on the plan and a junction disorder on the ridge of the roof. Accordingly, it is estimated that the part and part of the annex had been added afterwards, possibly 15 to 20 years later. In the photograph from the 40s, the single story version had not yet existed, yet, which was built probably about the 60s. Therefore, the side garden might be accessed from the street as well as from the house. Upper floor windows are with wooden shutters and the ground floor windows are with iron seed shutters. Chimney on the left part might be proof of fireplaces. One is on the upper floor and the other on the ground. Consequently, it can be periodized in three time slots. And the first period between 1876 and 1995 the second between 1895 and 1916, and finally the third from 60s to now. As can be seen in the ground floor plan, level differences on the ceiling of the O form imply that there was a wall dividing the space into two. So, the side might be an entrance for the servant, and the other part was probably a service room which was connected to the corridor by a door. There are traces of doors on both walls of the corridor. In here, the Z06 coded area was a dining room and the service from the annex to here has been through these doors. As demonstrated in the back elevation, Z06 windows were the doors open to the back garden previously. Outside and in the side jabs are stepped on the floor and the iron seed shutters are cut. 
all indicate that these doors were turned into windows. So, this is at least to the side and back gardens. This space was at the most important in the lifestyle of the Levantine family. Its entrance hall and might be the main spaces of the parties at the time. There might be a straight stair uh, shown in this photograph located along the walls across the entrance. As first of begins in room M04, so the wall between the two rooms has not existed and the entrance was a larger space. This estimation depends on the discordance between the shape of the stair and the shape of the opening on the upper floor plan. Secondly, there are wooden posts on the MD04 party wall. As can be observed in the second floor plan, the trace of the staircase is seen on the floor because it is ended by the door to M104 and not possible to enter that room when there is an opening on the floor. It can be stated that the corridor was longer to the room M105 in the first period. The inner side wall of the corridor in this case might be expanding to the wall of that room. Double Avengers entrance door of M104 was in on this wall, supposedly. All of these indicate that this room was partitioned by a wall following the beam line at the beginning, and a smaller room was a toilet. The single bench door from 102 to room 103 was closed with a simple wooden panel. 105 has been protected well, except for the main scots on the walls, which also close to the double wings door to 106 partially. The walls and the ceiling are plastered and white painted. Moldings and the simple gypsum roll are typical elements on the building. The main building is located on the lot with a setback, a short distance from the boundary at its left as illustrated in the front colors. Considering the position limits change very rarely, it is possible to say that the service entrance might have been here since there is no other option on a narrow and long road type land along to conclude, the Levantine mansion is periodized in three time slots as the first period from the construction date 1876. 1890-95, the second period from 1895-1960, to and the third is 60 years to now. This study is conducted on basis of morphological properties of the medicine, should be seen as the first step of a more comprehensive case-based historical research, including the anthropological explanation of the change as that. As uh, the last word and a further study, if the same method can be applied on the other medicines of the region, similarities and differentiations might be found out and it might be possible to generalize the results. And finally, these are the valuable references that have to enhance the study. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, we would be happy to open up the discussion. Well, thank you. Um, we will have the, the questions and answers at the end of the session. And uh, then we are going to move to uh, the second paper, Land Uses and Activities Management in Urban Regeneration Projects uh, Adjacent of Historical Areas, the Role of Urban Land Uses uh, to Promote Sustainable Urban Regeneration Development. Uh, the is, uh, Associate Professor Ibrahim uh, Mohammad Youssef from Cairo, uh, University, Egypt. Yusuf Ibrahim, Associate Professor of Urban and Town Planning in Cairo University. The paper is about land uses and activities management in urban regeneration projects adjacent to historical areas, the role of urban land uses to promote sustainable urban regeneration development. To introduce the paper topic properly, I have to mention that Cairo Urban Planning Vision 2050 is released in 2008 and aimed to develop Greater Cairo into a universal city. 
schematic plans devoted to the pyramids plateau and the urban area surrounding the great pyramids and our concern here is Nazlit is a man tourist area the topography of the area naturally making a border of it if activities preventing expansion of the Nazlit to Saman into Giza Plateau, the, re the research suggests that viewing the regeneration of Nazlit to Saman as a process of phases that reflect urban regeneration policy and conclude and depict through analyzing physical characteristics of the built environment together with economic and social aspects as an approach of sustainable urban regeneration that can be adopted into the Egyptian urban context. The project is an attempt to integrate the urban vision of Greater Cairo with an important area that weaves many mega projects and one of the important areas in the globe, which is the Giza Plateau as a World Heritage Site. We can conclude that there is no prescription of dealing with sustainable urban generation practice and no single body of information. That's why every urban regeneration practice has many lessons and experiences. Sustainable urban regeneration can be defined as comprehensive and integrated vision and action which leads to the resolution of urban problems and which seeks to bring about a lasting improvement the economic, physical, social, and environmental condition of an area that has been subject to change. This definition identifies the major keys of sustainable urban regeneration. There are a group of major principles that can dictate the urban regeneration process, such as detailed plan analysis of natural and built environment, preserve and stimulate physical fabric, including social characteristics, economic aspects, and environmental characteristics. Implement the urban regeneration strategy as comprehensive as possible and adaptation of sustainable urban development aims and goals into the project structure. It is a most to approach urban regeneration through an integrated urban methodology and process such as the figure shown in the right is the methodology of the input output of the urban regeneration process and looking into consideration uh, that uh, the methodology should be comprehensive enough to provide sound solutions for urban problems. The archaeological features of Pyramids Plateau are known as one of the world's most important sites in the world. Nazit Saman located, located inside the heritage area, just adjacent to eastern border of Giza Pyramids. The area of the project is about 253 acres and has about 45,000 inhabitants. Strategic plan for the pyramids of Giza and the development of the Saman area has specific goals, such as develop the Saman as a resettlement of, of its inhabitants in alternative locations, transform the Saman area into an urban museum, develop an integrated planning framework for the wider range of the Saman. In addition, improve the movement axis between the project and the Egyptian Grand Museum, develop a vision and strategic plan for Giza, propose tourism development activities, and create a visual image to provide a panoramic view of the pyramids of Giza. The challenge of Nazit Saman's sustainable revitalization can be identified in the complexity of interrelated planning issues surrounding the study area. These challenges can be as complex as the large transportation project, the Grand Museum, the new Kofu axis, 
and all the transportation uh, mega project that surround the area, which made uh, approaching and analysis of the area is very complex. Sustainable urban regeneration, as we mentioned before, giving consideration of the strategic importance of Nazareth Saman, the planning methodology carefully adapted to suit the sensitivity of the area and working to provide sustainable revitalization of the area planning treatment. And comparison between theoretical framework of urban upgrading methodology and as the man has been made so we can uh, deduce uh, the proper methodology for Egypt. The quarantine area indicate, uh, includes Senelago zone as it's shown in the figure to the right. It's classified as unsafe area based on the state-owned land with a surface of 29 acres and a population of up to 8,000 people. The biggest challenge of Nazareth Saman revitalization project was the issue of internal and external drivers changes in the study area and how real to real locate the population and keep the socioeconomic status and integrating the surrounding mega projects and the parameters of the study area which was a big challenge and how challenge and how to deal with external drivers including checking existing plans and policies concerned with the Cairo sustainable vision 2050 in the project proposal The impact of the external drivers highly affects the boundaries of the road study area and the interrelated major hub of various road network also an input for this project. Excavation work in the northern part of the Nazareth Saman area is another challenge. The exit of Greater Cairo Ring Road is affecting the traffic flow in the area, which requires integration of Nazareth Saman internal vehicle and pedestrian circulation into that greater network. Multi-layer physical and social instruments to assure urban sustainability and integrated planning vision to revitalize the project area has been taken. The proposal is extended beyond Nazareth Saman boundaries for the purpose of physical and visual integrity, as it's shown in the analysis and the proposal and the master plan to the right. A social study provided with a large social questionnaire is conducted to reach a community agreement of the project proposal. Conceptual planning approach based on integrating all external and internal drivers that influences the, the revitalization of Nazareth Saman, sustainable urban development. Each of the external driver proposal is treated as one of the inputs of the design and planning criteria that influence the final master plan. External land uses that influence both strategic goals for the greater area of the Giza Plateau and proposed land use for Nazareth Saman project. Final master plan proposal recommends for the future land uses and traffic solution, especially in the northern southern axis that tie together the Grand Museum and the north, then the big traffic interrelated hub that ties for four axes. The master plan coupled with the demolition phases as an issue as an initiative to relocate less suburban population in a way that sustained economic drivers of the area and initial plans. Conclusion, Nazareth Saman Giza Plateau proposal is typically an example of how to regenerate and revitalize an important site. It contains many compli complicated external drivers that has many influences of planning decision making and how to sustain the balance between socio-economic aspects and physical changes in the project. The creation of 
the urban revitalization of Latin system man must have planned, adopted more sustainable solutions in terms of socioeconomic aspects, population aspects, without compromising the jobs and economic drivers of the area. Basically, connect a project with surrounding major plans in one integrated vision that is compatible with Cairo 2050 vision for the particular importance of science in the globe. The study revealed that sustainable urban revitalization needs a social, environmental, and economic aspects, which all together forms a deep and clear understanding of the project urban context. I'm running out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Um, Yusuf for uh, this presentation and now we are going to uh, present the heritage and its surroundings in the face of uh, uh, damage in the face Hello. of damage by uh, Muhammad Nail, Faculty of Natural Sciences uh, in Ankara, Turkey. Uh, sorry, Muhammad Naal. Uh, Muhammad Naal. Yes. Okay, so thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm Mohamed Nahal from Ankara University University. I'm going today to talk about the heritage and its surroundings in the face of damage. The contents are the heritage itself, the impact of urbanization on heritage, the, uh, the damage by the conflicts, the damage by the natural disasters, and the damage as a result of wrong actions, and finally, the heritage conservation. The heritage itself, as what's defined by the UNESCO, is the entire corpus of material science, either artistic or symbolic, handed on by the past to each culture and therefore to the whole humankind. And when defining the state of heritage building, we should define or distinguish between two phases, which are the original situation and the, cur and the current situation after the crisis. Now, the impact of the urbanization on, her uh, on heritage building is concentrated in most in the historical centers that are already suffering fr from urban problems due to the weakness of laws organizing the heritage conservation in these countries or because of the absence of the popular awareness. Now, the first, the first case will be about Mecca. Mecca City. During the last five decades, the historic city of Mecca has faced major and radical urban development, and the Grand Mosque was witnessing a change in its urban characteristic. Uh, the, the surrounding of Mecca has been uh, changed into a field of the contractors to compete for the highest buildings in the area. Amrajil Bait sky, uh, skyscrapers is a pro are a project uh, of uh, uh, skyscrapers hotels, which are at least 232 meters, reaching the 600 meters and 120 floors. In this case, uh, it affected the it affected the, the heritage surrounding government. Uh, the governments must regulate these affecting uh, by making laws that specify the prim, uh, the, uh, the permissible uh, distance for implementing such activities uh, in a heritage area. The second case is Gaza City. Gaza, which date for uh, 1,500 uh, years before the century, uh, and its cultural heritage uh, dates back to the different eras, which are Rashidi, Mamluki, and Ottoman eras. The population increase has led uh, to expansion of urbanization reaching the historical center of the city, and this has led to the violation of the heritage fabric and building within it. Uh, this comes as a result of weakness of the urban plans and weak protection and restoration procedures for the heritage area. Now, talking about Khan Hazir in Gaza, among uh, the manifestations of uh, this change in the texture of the heritage in Gaza, uh, there are uh, Khan uh, near the area uh, near the area of Khan Hazir, there are modern building, buildings began to, uh, to appear, uh, covering the heritage of the region and change, changing the, the identity of uh, Khan Hazir area. Now, talking about the heritage damage by conflicts, 
The conflicts are one of the greatest disasters, but they are affected by the human, not the nature. Uh, and even hundreds of the buildings uh, are affected by these uh, conflicts. Uh, for example, in Syria, in Iraq, in Palestine, and in Bosnia, and all of them were uh, listed in the World Heritage List. The first case will be about Aleppo. Uh, after the beginning of the Syrian conflict in 2011, uh, 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 the conflict extended uh, to include the neighborhoods of the old city, which are classified on the World Heritage List. So the heritage mosques, the Ru, uh, the souks, the Olympian houses have been uh, bombed. 50% 50, uh, 50 were partially damaged of these areas. 10% uh, were completely destroyed. 30 ancient mosques were, uh, were uh, destroyed or damaged. And 60% uh, of the ancient souk, which is 1,200 meters long, was damaged or collapsed. The second case is Gaza city, again. Uh, the heritage building in Gaza has been systematic systematically destroyed throughout the long history of wars in Gaza, starting with the First World War, in which the Allied bombs uh, and destroyed nearly half of the city of Gaza, and ending with the Israeli aggression in 2008, uh, when the Israeli forces bombed, bombed uh, many buildings uh, who have important uh, uh, historical values, such as al Yafa Palace and the Saraya military complex. The third case is um, in Mostar city, the Stari Most Bridge in Mostar in Bosnia, which is built by the Ottomans in the 16th century. It was bombed by 60 bombs by, by the Croatian, uh, Croatian uh, forces in the 19. Uh, 93, uh, which led to the destruction of the uh, of large uh, amount of the, the the bridge, and it was systematically targeted uh, as a heritage element by by itself. Uh, then uh, there should be strict obligations uh, and penalties to the uh, parties which are conflicting, uh, deter the conflicting parties from systematically targeting the heritage. And there should be in, uh, inter there shouldn't be inter international bias towards the attacking parties. Now, the heritage damage by the national, dis national natural disasters cannot be controlled by the humans, and unfortunately, these disasters caused heavy losses in the world heritage. Uh, one of these cases was in Rome, uh, the earthquake of Rome in uh, the fourth, uh, 14th century uh, that hit the Colosseum. Uh, it made major damage to the structure of the building. And the, uh, one of the uh, attempts to, uh, to restore it and uh, reconstruct it was by Raphael Stern, who reinforced the arts of the northeast side. Uh, talking about the heritage damage as a result of the war, uh, wrong actions, uh, it can be uh, caused by the area demography and uh, modifying some elements by the people there uh, to suit their livelihood. Uh, and the, some actions like painting on the walls and making the historical squares as garbage dumps, and uh, uh, the low, uh, the, the, the low, the, the, the low of the fertility, uh, fertility, uh, of punishment laws. Uh, as an example, there was a campaign of plastic art uh, on the walls of the uh, Damascus neighborhoods. The other case is uh, different, uh, some, some kind. Uh, it was in Cairo, uh, by the restoration process, errors are uh, themselves. Uh, there was lack of experience or insuffic insufficient uh, studies. Uh, the Sultan Ahmed Mosque in Cairo, in Cairo was found as, uh, has found uh, errors in the Quranic ins inscriptions restoration. Uh, the heritage conservation and restoration. Uh, some researchers consider that uh, the first conservation and restoring attempt began in Sistine Chapel, uh, but this is, the historical narrates show that uh, it back, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it's back uh, to the pre-Islam times when Quraysh uh, tried, uh, try, uh, tried to preserve and reconstruct the Kaaba uh, when it was fired. The community involvement we should uh, involve the communities in protecting the heritage uh, by holding popular conferences to raise uh, awareness 
and making actual public participation in preserving and restoring the heritage, preserving the identity of the archaeological houses and alleys, and making experiences to participate in the recovery process. Secondly, the institutional work. Uh, they, they should organize gardening for the heritage buildings, putting signs to warn, to warn uh, of the damaging, the damaging of the buildings, uh, arg uh, making urgent uh, procedures or, uh, uh, if any uh, damage occurs, developing, developing the regular uh, restoration and maintenance plans. Uh, third, the regulations and charters and recommendations through the history. The Athens Charter was in uh, 1931, the Venice Charter in 1964, the ICOMOS in 1965, the Ankara Conference in ICCRON in 1980, the Washington Charter in 1987, the Charter for International Cultural Tourism in Mexico in 1999. Now my recommendations, developing documentation methods and increasing the workers in this field, establishing research centers for the continuous documentation of the state of heritage buildings, local regulations governing the expansion towards the buildings and heritage centers, uh, neutral international co uh, commits uh, to prevent the damage of heritage uh, to the heritage uh, buildings and centers, and documenting vi uh, uh, viol violation against them, uh, reinforcing the heritage building to resist the potential disaster in, and local laws that set strict penalties for any violation to or sabotage for the heritage buildings and their surroundings. And thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Muhammad, for uh, this enlightening uh, presentation. Um, and then we can uh, move to um, the last paper, which is uh, Bitawi's Waqf Mosques in uh, the Threat of uh, Gentrification. Uh, by uh, Fahdiana uh, Yunachi, Department of Architecture, um, Faculty of Architecture, University of Indonesia. So let's go. Hello everyone, I would like to present my study about uh, the Taoist Wakam in the trap of gentrification. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, explain about uh, the concept of wakaf. Uh, based on Islamic jurisprudence, wakaf is uh, hold, uh, wakaf means hold its origin and distribute its benefit. That means that when a person donate their land uh, as wakaf for the uh, the importance or the uh, the benefit the benefits of religious. Uh, or religion, uh, then uh, the wakaf should hold its original purpose and distribute it, uh, the benefits to the people. So there are four requirements and four principles of wakaf. First, that it should be a prevention uh, from uh, the wakaf and from being an object owned by certain people or certain institution. Then, uh, Wakaf should be a thing uh, or things that are worth. Third, uh, Wakaf uh, can be utilized without the object disappear. And fourth, uh, Wakaf should not be sold, gifted, nor inherited. Wakaf uh, is regulated in Indonesian legal system uh, by the government regulation number 28 uh, by the year of uh, 1977 about the work of private property. Uh, before this regulation uh, be validated, uh, there, was, uh, there, are, there were many problems around work of. Uh, when uh, the work if, uh, which is uh, the person or legal entity that donates the land and, this, and their descendants, uh, 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 didn't validate the one-off by uh, the certificate of one -off. and then in the future, uh, the descendant can claim that it is still their private property. 
so they can sell it or uh, change the function of the work of. And this problem also came from the Nazir. Uh, Nazir is a group of people or legal entities that entrusted the maintenance and the management of work of. Yeah. They can also claim that uh, this uh, property is their private property, uh, so they can sell it uh, or uh, change the function of this object. In Jakarta, there are uh, 6,000 work of land and uh, from the year 2015 to 2021, uh, we can only uh, find uh, five cases uh, around Wakaf. <coughs> Uh, and Wakaf uh, can uh, preserve uh, uh, the Batawian people expression uh, in religious expression uh, from uh, the gentrification because uh, the Batawian people, uh, the ethnic group of Jakarta, uh, had faced uh, gentrification uh, from years to years. Uh, in 1930, uh, the number of Batawian people is the majority of Jakarta, uh, which were uh, to, to 200,000 uh, people. Uh, and in uh, 2010, uh, Batawian people is only 27% of the total population of Jakarta. So this study, in this study, I would like to remind and uh, to know whether uh, the Wakaf can uh, preserve the religious expression of the Taoian people uh, in Jakarta uh, uh, when uh, they, as ethnic group, uh, face uh, the threat of gentrification. Uh, the Taoian people uh, used to be called Orang Salam, and uh, the term Salam uh, derived from uh, the religion of Islam itself. Uh, so uh, this can shows us that uh, Batalian people uh, basically is very religious. Uh, Islam is a fundamental part of their life. Uh, as we know that uh, the Batalian people uh, have three principles that they uh, should uh, master the reciting of Quran and they should perform Hajj, and they should uh, define uh, themselves by martial arts. Uh, and there were many uh, religious expressions uh, of the Dalai people related to the mosque. <coughs> and uh, this kind of rituals uh, are, uh, are studied in the study uh, whether they can preserve by uh, the function of Wakaf. Uh, so in this study, I would like to highlight uh, four masjid uh, in the center of Jakarta as the example uh, of masjid uh, and uh, the character of Wakaf that preserve uh, this religious expression of the Italian people. <clears throat> the first is uh, Masjid Hidayatullah in Karat Semanggi. Uh, this masjid uh, can preserve the uh, with Taoian religious people by uh, the status of cultural heritage. Because in 1993, uh, this mosque uh, is threatened by uh, property swap because the Dynamon group uh, has suggested to exchange the land of uh, masjid to other place outside Jakarta. And by this status of cultural heritage, uh, this masjid is still there in their place at Karasman. And the second is Masjid al Islam in Karet. Uh, this masjid is uh, known for the strong jama'ah, the strong wakif and nazir, uh, when uh, they uh, persist uh, the amana from the ancestor, uh, from the wakif, then uh, this masjid should uh, serve the jama'ah around Karet. And when uh, the Indian partner want to exchange uh, the land, the property, uh, they uh, reject uh, and suggest uh, that if they want to uh, to the property swap, uh, the exchange should be at land uh, around the area at the 
the nearby uh, place. So uh, this uh, this masjid has two time properties as well, uh, and uh, the location is still there uh, at the current uh, to German. And then uh, masjid by Kumukti, uh, they uh, the masjid is still uh, famous uh, for the uh, the study of Islamic uh, Islamic studies uh, because uh, uh, the famous figure of Guru Mukmi. And now uh, it is uh, uh, the legacy uh, turned to it uh, to his descendant uh, Guru Lutfi. Uh, and the last mask is uh, Masjid Nurul Islam in Tulodong Atas. Uh, this masjid is unique because uh, this mask uh, has no photo certificate. And by this uh, phenomena, uh, there are a conflict between the developer, the center of the Wakif, and also the Nazir, uh, the management of uh, the Wakif land. Uh, they cannot do many things. They can optimize uh, the potential of the mask. Uh, because uh, the uh, the absence of local certificate, so the descendant of the wakif claim that they can still uh, sell uh, the land to the developer by the high price. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> until now, uh, the descendant of the uh, wakif has no uh, decision whether to sell it or to maintain it because uh, uh, they have no uh, decision. Uh, among their among themselves, uh, and the descendant has reached uh, 2,000 people, and it becomes uh, problematic uh, to optimize uh, the potential of the mass. Uh, this is my presentation for now. Uh, thank you for your attention. My okay, thank you for uh, the respectful. Um, presenters and authors. And uh, here uh, we reach the point of uh, the round uh, table discussion. So I can uh, open uh, the discussion for um, yeah, the participants and uh, all the attendees. Um, so if you have any question, you can uh, open your mic or uh, write, just write it down in the chat. Yes, I have a, I have a question. Yes, please. So can I, I ask now? Yeah, um, I want to thank uh, the presenters of this, this section for, for all their, uh, their presentations. Um, uh, but uh, specifically from uh, Mohammed Nal's uh, presentation, uh, do my question me relates uh, all that part of the presenter so they are, they are free to uh, contribute to uh, my question uh, since today buildings will constitute tomorrow's heritage and uh, looking at the uh, adversity happening in heritage surroundings uh, uh, which this holds strongly to heritage futures uh, one, how can we narrate the state of heritage to new generations? And uh, two, um, what will be the influence of our narration on existing heritage principles? Okay, my friend, thank you for this, uh, the, uh, the question. Thank you so much. Uh, about the narrates, uh, my friend, I, I, I talked about the narrates uh, that can um, document, the, uh, document the building itself. Uh, it's kind of documentation. Uh, this is the benefit of the narrates that I mentioned, uh, and we can uh, we can uh, document uh, our our uh, present uh, our present uh, our present buildings, heritage buildings, and historical buildings uh, to the future uh, generations uh, by narrations too. Uh, and uh, now in nowadays we have uh, more uh, uh, more kind of narrations. Uh, in, in old days, it was just uh, by um, narrating and, and writing uh, on papers. But uh, for the future, for the future, we can uh, uh, make more documentations and, and save it uh, um, in better way, like uh, on the saving it on the uh, in the internet and on the computers and like this. I don't know if I uh, read your uh, your point uh, you are asking about. 
Yes, uh, I think that's, uh, that's the answer to uh, the first question. The second one, uh, what will be the influence of our narration on existing uh, heritage uh, principles? Uh, uh, there is a case I didn't mention in uh, my study here. Uh, it can make you uh, uh, give you a uh, give you a, a sight of uh, what I, I mentioned. Uh, some some narrations in um, in Warsaw City, uh, in Warsaw City, when they uh, reconstructed uh, reconstructed it, uh, they um, uh, they uh, the they used the narrations of the old uh, of the old uh, of the old illustrations in the city and. Uh, uh, and not not just the narrations and the, the art they used the art uh, of uh, the city uh, which uh, was documenting uh, the, the the old uh, the old situation of the city uh, it um, it uh, it helped when the city was fully fully destructed uh, to um, reimagine it uh, by these narrations and the, how they described uh, the details of the buildings is it clear or uh, did I reach, to, you reach to your uh, idea? Thank you for the point. Uh, but I, I feel that uh, other participants should uh, also uh, presenters should contribute to this second part of uh, the question. Um, uh, whether what is happening now, if we are looking at uh, uh, the disturbances now happening uh, around uh, heritage uh, surroundings, causing maybe destruction, damage, and the rest. Um, how uh, these, with this change, uh, uh, our existing heritage principles to uh, 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 the future generation? <laughs> okay. And, uh, Um, who, Sorry, uh, has the, the mic now? Sorry, are you talking, Mr. Nordin? I can't hear. Okay, uh, his mic is off. So uh, I can also um, interrupt and, and uh, give you an opinion. Uh, maybe not scientific one, but uh, maybe I'm inspired with what's happening. Uh, these days in uh, in uh, Sheikh Jarrah and uh, in Palestine, Palestine, and also in Gaza, uh, which gives us a glimpse of uh, what awareness and narration can um, can uh, how can this can, can be powerful across uh, uh, generations uh, and. Um, Applying over all uh, all rules, all uh, uh, the laws, uh, because people um, don't have anything there uh, um, except the narration, except their naked body uh, that uh, uh, they used to um, to defend and uh, protect uh, their uh, strong, very strong identity, uh, very strong memory uh, that can. Uh, uh, go beyond the time and, and go beyond uh, 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 the laws as well and go beyond who is ruling and who is uh, 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 who has the power actually so um, and also they they uh, this gives us also again uh, um, uh, a strong lesson that um, when the identity and memory is so strong uh, uh, um, actually, we can defend uh, for all people. I mean, people there are defending not their houses, they are defending the, the, the identity and memory of all the Islamic uh, countries and all Islamic people around the, um, uh, the world. Uh, maybe this is uh, so poetic, and, uh, and, uh, but uh, I should do that because of the enlightening uh, paper of uh, Muhammad Nail. Um, so um, uh, do you have uh, guys any questions to the respectful uh, presenters? Because Thank we you. have uh, very, uh, very uh, again, a good variety of papers here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And then uh, on the chat, check the chat. Somebody's asking one question too that relates uh, uh, 
uh, to uh, the question I also asked. It's in line with uh, those issues that are now trending. Thank mm -hmm. you. Maybe I can see the this question. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Roxane, if you uh, see the question, you can uh, you can. Uh, there is no question since yeah. uh, it is open for all the uh, uh, audience here. Yeah. Uh, and then since we are uh, we are out of to try time. to be on time and yeah. we, uh, deliver the floor to Professor uh, Jose uh, Carvalho. Yeah, to uh, to, to, uh, wrap to wrap it up. Uh, yeah, to wrap it up, we we are uh, out of time now. So uh, thank you guys for uh, all the presenters for this uh, variety of papers. We had uh, uh, glimpses of approaches, different approaches, uh, different models of. Uh, uh, properties like fortified uh, spaces, uh, spaces belong to the state, uh, waqf, um, and uh, several case studies. So thank you about your inspiring, uh, also Giza um, and Lazar Tissimane. So uh, thank you for your um, inspiring presentations. And I will leave the floor to Professor uh, Jose. Thank you so much, Dr. Maha, sorry, El Geweli. <laughs> these, these names are very different from, from ours. So I, I, I start by already uh, uh, beg for your, for, your, for your patience, for my terrible, terrible pronunciation of your names and, and titles. Uh, they are very uh, foreigner for a, a Portuguese guy like me. So my name is José Carvalho. I'm um, a teacher and researcher at um, ISMAT, which is a very small school in the south of Portugal, in Algarve. And uh, my, my main uh, research themes are, of course, um, heritage and also um, research by design. Uh, about landscape, which is, of course, the basis of everything, uh, I would say that landscape is like an open book. You can read it, you can look at it and read it, which means that, of course, each uh, observer, if you want each reader, will have his own opinion about landscape. But again, when we are talking about heritage cultural landscape, now we are not talking about a book, we are talking about a library. And this means that we need to have someone to help us to read or even to choose which book to read from the library. So now we have a, a level of complexity and the detail that grows exponentially when we go to heritage and cultural uh, landscaping. In our panel, we are fortunate to have a marvelous group of scholars uh, that are going to present us with a selection of some of the best books uh, that are on, the, on this universal library of heritage and cultural air and, and cultural landscape. So without further ado, I would invite uh, the first um, the first uh, person to to talk, which will be Dr. Asma Gedria from Tunisia. And I'm asking Dr. Uh, Roxane, do you are you putting the videos on or should yeah. Yes, uh, I am uh, starting okay. after you. Thank you. Please. Hello. Today I will present my work entitled The Urban Renewal of Hamamif, the case of Avenue Casino Habib Bourguiba. The city of Hamamif has known major changes that have affected its natural environment and landscape building. The urban sprawl has reached its limits and the population has increased considerably. 
the strong landscape potential, its location close to the capital, and the presence of thermal springs has made an attractive seaside site since the 18th century. The city is rich of architectural and urban heritage. In the following context, the study tries to demonstrate the different uh, urban and architectural transformations of Hammamid by focusing on the lecture of different modifications of the Avenue Habibuldiva as the case of study. This study starts by examining urban sprawl of the city since the, its first establishment that shows that this sprawl is no more possible since the urban fabric attempts its limits. Uh, since the 70s, the different development pattern allows identification of the urban core where the study was carried out. Photos and postcards dating from the beginning of the 20th century show the state of the occupation of space. This allows tra uh, tracing the evolution of the avenue and its various mutations. Since Venetian times, the thermal springs were famous. Thermal uh, establishments, the have Hafsi dynasty confirmed the curative practice by the use of ancient installations that endured during this period. The Bellical uh, Palace, in order to benefit from the thermal uh, springs of Hamamlip, is the Bay Ali Pasha built a first pavilion and a caravanserai in 1750. On the road connecting Amamlif to Tunis and near the Belical Palace, a new thermal establishment was built and it was opened to the public in 1893. Located between sea and mountain, Amamlif was development on the plain on the sea front. In 1882, the section of the Tunis Hamamif railway line was opened to the public. A station was built in front of the Bellical Palace. The casino was inaugurated in 1895. It is located on the edge of the beach and materialized the extension of the axis that connected the Bellical Palace with the train station. This, this axis was the first urban core of the city. From there, the central square located between the beach and the railway line was born. The city is located between two natural barriers. Its urban extension was especially lateral on both east and west sides. The urban sprawl was in continuity with the initial framework. It took place in two times to the west between 1920 and 1948, to the east from 1948 to the end of the 70s. Between 1920 and 1948, the city expanded to the west over a length of 100 kilometers in continuity with the initial frame. Since 1947, the urban sprawl continued eastward. The urban sprawl continued eastward and the city reached its limited around 1977. The westward extension continued and construction became denser. The new neighborhood was mainly residential and the subdivisions provided housing. This sprawl did not provide any tertiary activity zone. After all the various steps of urban sprawl, Hamamif became a larger city with an area of 16,000 hectares and a population of over 42,000 inhabitants. With such a situation, the city cannot limit itself to its initial functions. It must find the new attractive functions adapted to the needs of its size population. In this sense, the development pattern have reclassified the city center as a very high density multifunctional zone. As you have seen, Avenue Casino, currently called Avenue Habibourgiba, is the very first axis. It is oriented north south. It measures 580 meters of land. The avenue is straight, marked in the middle by 
a central place, the roundabout orthogonal roads cross the avenue, forming a regular shape, urban layout, and rectangular islands. Two radiating uh, uh, roads cross the axis and meet in the roundabout, forming four triangular islands in the south of the axis. According to the different development plan, the avenue belongs to an area of existing facilities and is, and is defined as a center of economic activities. It is a question of densification with vertical and horizontal extension. Since its creation, the avenue has integrated different functions. It is a dynamic access and generated transformation of housings into shops and surfaces. The central square is a meeting place with a symbolic value. As part of our study, we compared the change made to the occupancy of 16 urban islands located along the avenue. The specimens are numbered and positioned on the axis as shown on the pattern below. We have classified these modifications according to their typology in order to draw up the following table. Focusing on different transformations made to all of the buildings studied, two scenarios emerge. First, modification of the building while maintaining its initial structure and demolition of the building and replacing it by another. Concerning the modification encountered, we can identify four types. Modifications relative to the function, changes in the high which becomes more important, fragmentation by multiplying the build masses within the same urban island, alignment uh, of the building mass with the track. Some buildings have always been aligned with the boundary of the street. Demolition and renovation concern 56% of studied cases, while 44% uh, maint, uh, maint, um, maintained their original structure with some modification. The table allows drawing the graph below. From the graph, we can identify some points. All buildings uh, that have maintained their original structure have changed function. The same thing happened to renovate, renovated spaces, except three ones, the roundabout, which retains its function as a public space, the post office and the train station. All, all the renovated buildings are higher, except the post office and the parcel of the roundabout which does not contain any building. The increase of high does not affect buildings that have maintained their original structure. This is probably because of the strength of the structure which is designed initially for a limited high and would not be able to support an extension in high. All the urban islands concerned by the different transformation are now occupied by buildings aligned uh, on the boundary of the street, except the Bainical Palace, where the red tree has been maintained. And finally, the category of modification that we found the least is the fragmentation of the urban islands. However, and despite the various changes uh, identified above, the roads the pattern and the boundaries of the urban islands did not change. As a result, the avenue has been able to maintain certain characteristics. The land has not changed because of the two natural elements and the two monuments that blocked its extension. The width has not changed either. The various changes identified above generate a session link. The increase in the flow of users and the urban congestion. In fact, the densification of urban islands with the multiplication of service 
and equipment spaces attracts a greater flow of users, a source of urban traffic and congestion. The roads keep the same initial width and uh, that causes urban congestion with traffic and parking problems. The loss of uh, sunlight, the height of the new construction is uh, greater than the width of the avenue. That generates a loss of sunshine of their entire neighborhood, especially concerning the construction on this avenue. Finally, the modification of urban landscape with the change of the initial functions and the densification engender uh, the loss of the seaside and thermal character of the city. The urban pattern authorizes the construction up to 24 meters in height, which drive up the price of land. This encourages the demolition of all buildings to the, renovate them with new taller ones uh, that are be better suited to accommodate new functions, which are essentially tertiary, uh, but also more profitable. These demolitions accelerate the loss of architectural and urban heritage. Nowadays, Hammam Leaf continues to uh, experience major changes. It has been able to keep the dynamics of its center. The avenue continues to be uh, the heart of the city. The multifunctional area provides a mix of functions concentrated on the avenue with seven floors high building. Some new uh, buildings uh, replaced the old demolition ones, and no change uh, takes into consideration the seaside character of uh, the city. Finally, the Baylical Palace is squatted and dilapidated. Some of its parts are in danger of ruins, and its restoration uh, is long to come. The casino is now closed, despite the various attempts to revive it. The city continues to evolve and ensure a social and economic dynamic, however, what's the price? And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Razma Gedria. Uh, from Tunisia. Now uh, I will ask you to make your attention to Araf Oyku Turkan from Istanbul and his presentation. Hi, I'm Peshis from the Deals Technical University and I'm also a researcher at the same university. Today I will present your paper called The Changing Urban Identity of Azad Cafe and Evolution from the User's Perspective. I will start with my presentation. Our research has con consists of five parts actually. First, I will start with the introduction and continue with the conceptual framework. And I will talk about some analysis which we conduct on the Azad Cafe. Then I will come to it. General conclusion. Uh, we aim to examine Azad Cup in the context of urban identity and we focused on the changes to the period after 2000 and the various construction activities have been carried on in the area after 2000 and the construction of mega projects such as Belta Park and the Harich Park continues in the area. And we try to figure out what's the perspective of the user about these construction projects in the area through the urban identity and here you can see our research questions. In the literature part actually, we conduct a complete review and our main concepts are the memory, collective memory, urban identity. Then I will briefly talk about the historical process of the Azarkapa. And our analysis in three stages. First, we perform the maps proposition to understand functions variations. Then, secondly, we analyze the content of the news related to the field through the Anchor software. And thirdly, we conduct a survey with 84 people using the field. If we come to the literature, there is our first important concept. For I take this issue individually, but if we Check the definitions of memory. We see the 
form of the power to keep in mind what has been learned or lived in relation to the past, but opposite to the Freud, half back on the other hand, emphasize both the individual and the collective memory and its shared memory with undefined borders beyond the individual. And then Rossi emphasized that it cannot be considered apart from special dimension, and he sees the urban space as the area where collective memory takes place. And we come to urban identity, we see the rough examined urban identity in three main components in relation to these concepts. And the first one is physical settings, second activities, and the third one is meanings. And we also try to understand Azat Kapera through this headlines. So Azat Kapera has a play important role in relation to the coastline. And the region it continues to function as a port, became westernized with the late Ottoman Empire and became a place where the service sectors such as banks are located. With the departure of the non-Muslims from the area in the 50s, the process of the collapse of the region started, and in the 80s, the commercial activities in the field moved to the park in Parpa, and in the 19th, the historical value has been taken into consideration together with the declaration of a project area and protection process. When we come to 2000, it's seen that many mega projects are mentioned in the field, and the trend line continued in in 2005, and access to areas increased. In 2012, tourism-oriented development of the area was targeted, and the hotels start to open. And the design and the construction process of the Golden Horn Metro Bridge brought a lot of discussion in the architectural community and brought the field to the agenda, actually. And we see this um, also bridge in the news is in so much. With the coastal park, the arrangement of which was complete in 2018, the region has gained a recreational identity. Today, the area in the middle of the surrounding college port and delta port construction in a, a certain position, actually. Here you can see the special changes and activities mentioned about the maps. Um, and also you can see changing activities in the tables, actually. As we begin to question the field in terms of meaning, we first want to describe how it's referred to. So we check the uh, names, actually, about the area, especially with the construction of the Golden Horn Metro Bridge, there's an increasing number of the news. In addition to words such as history, water, shipyard, news also emphasize construction activities. Here you can see a word big which refer to mega, mega projects in the area, and we see it's from construction and the other keywords about which come from the news. We interviewed with eight four participants in the survey part of the, our research. We conducted to understand the effect of special changes in the field on identity due to the COVID. Our participants over the age of 65 were limited, as you can see from the table. Without providing any description in the survey, we asked the users how they describe the field, and the most common answer we can be character, fashion, the other. It's the name of the market in the area, actually. And the second one is Azat We divide participants into two groups, temporarily and permanently, according to the frequency of the use in the area, and the opinions of the users whose activities differed according to our hypothesis could also be fair. Here you can see these two different groups. And we try to measure the field usage of the statistics are here. Uh, temporarily, you will talk about the impact of the tourism activities um, in the air, actually. And we describe the, from both groups uh, how you can describe, we ask them to describe the area with three words, and you can see some of the words such as historical, beautiful, and crowded. Um, most common words to use describe the area, and we also describe them to the problems in the area. Nine of them are happy with the area, actually, but most common problems about the traffic and parking problems and collapse building, etc. 
extremely. And here you can see differences between temporary and permanent users on the identity of the era. Uh, both groups think that there is a change still going on this era after 2000, and the changes still continue. Both groups think that the construction of the Halish Metro Bridge, one of the most important trigger of this change in the era, actually. And you can see the perspectives of the users to the construction projects. These projects are ended and using today, and the perspectives of the user is mostly looking at these projects positively. But according to these completed projects, uh, we have a, a complaint about the projects which is going on in the area and still construction. And they think, both groups think it will affect urban identity. But the temporary users think it's um, changed the identity of the area in a negative way, and but permanent user thinks they will affect the area in a positive way. We think there is a important factor that the differences of the users are a profit-oriented approach of the users actually, and also we ask them some question about commitment and the perception of. Uh, of the users and uh, both groups think that the area has a special value and but current user uh, um, can see and feel the traces of the past more easily in the era. Uh, the temporary user are mostly think the renewal process is not uh, suitable for the urban pattern but permanent user mostly think it's a positive effect on the air actually and it's a common result I guess the permanent user feel more committed to the field and here you can see the result of the surveys which already mentioned to you and we have our con conclusion the area has undergone a lot of intervention in short time. This situation has affected the use of the space, type of the users, and the urban identity. Special variations in the field are reflected on the user group. The belonging of the business owners in the area is tight. Seen they approach the realized project that focus on profit growth. And it seems that even basic infrastructure problems in the region have not been solved yet, as well as the ongoing going mega projects putting pressures on the field and it's something important for the local governments actually uh, the area is not in great transition period due to the construction of its projects such as Halish Port and Galata Port and projects have been involved by user groups that they will change the urban identity however its effects on identity are controversial in the eyes of citizens, so it's uh, lots of lots of controversy is returning on the era and there are differences with the opinions so we cannot say it um, so we cannot say they a compromise in the area. Here you can see our the references and uh, the new references which we use for the content analysis. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, Araf, uh, I will not try to pronounce the rest of your name. Uh, now we are going to listen to Endang Sri Lestari from Indonesia, if you please. Hello, good morning. I'm Endang Sri Lestari. I'm from Universitas Indo Global Mandiri, Faculty of Architecture and Design, Palembang, Indonesia. Now I will 
to listen to this young about each director of the Arias Report Corridor, the study of the great loss of our money. Small components of the mass composition of the corridor, the great loss of Thailand is one of the cities in the road, especially is accessed by a corridor that keeps paying the quality of the area. So it has the title Palembang City Center. By looking at the circulation between the or, or leading to an area, it can be seen the description of its character in supporting the economy. Let's view the Great Moors area. And the existence of a city consists of physical formation that function to convert the accommodate the activities of its citizens. The physical form will show very part of the city which has to component of its other and will form a community. The harmony of the physical commission is something that must be considered in order to create a physical environment that will present a pleasant atmosphere. The specific character of this student environment will occur when the physical element, element of the city together with the support of its attractive and expressive surroundings. The visual corridor character of the area is part of the element to reform the urban image in shaping the overall urban character. The area of the Great Mosque of Palembang is the main urban space of the city with a type of not element. It is existence can be reached from the existence of roads with a Corridor with on parts of these corridors, namely the Pasar Nambra Gilir, Jalanitas Ujung, and Jalan Vika. The three roads corridors lead to the Grand Mosque, known about area with its character that occur visually by a composition of mass blocks on either side of the road. That's map of the Grand Mosque area. And it's in good process and up. Materials and I will kindly ask a partner to go. Though the form of these are often very different from the others, it is clear that the process of implementing the city is very complicated and does not happen in Madrid. In the city sector, it is necessary to describe the role of the city system into a clear concept that can be used as a new concept in the setting of the setting of politicity. One of the diagrammatic description of the equestrian city plan is that the city area illustrates idealistic to produce an area that is an urban area. This region has space that are meant areas. Regional corridors is line element, corridor element, reset element, access element, and corridor space typology. The character typology of urban space consists of two types, namely the typology of static space and the typology of dynamic space. According to the typology, this color is included in the typology of static space in the entrance of interest to the typology of dynamic space. Spatial typology can characterize a place based on the set typology. 
of a place fish is not always clear because it can be mixed of static space topology and dynamic space topology. Circulation from the function of the corridor, the truth has true and strong visual influence on the structure and physical structure of the city. To compose the urban environment, the circulation element in the root system is a tool to form direct and control every activity pattern within the urban development pattern. Skyline corridor. The main discussion regarding the visual arrangement of the process along the road section in its corridors is one of which is observed from the arrangement of the rows of masses which will show the skyline, which can be seen by making the row silhouette. The shape of the building is posed in a row along the road section. The skyline will be profit an overview of the composition of the building showing the visual you will see a prince of the building. The good ground along the road that will show the two-dimensional spatial structure is by looking at the patterns of the up and non-structure areas. The basic theory is implemented from urban running as a textual relationship between the construct from my building and open space. The visual character of corridor is based in the research objective, namely this lesson is to find out a picture of the potential visual character of several points in the form of supporting corridor on the map with a case study of the grand most area. Then the literature review step is to get a formulation of the visual character of the map and not set scenarios in forming urban space so as to direct the analysis process. Set in closure of a side relate to the control and placement of buildings on a site in a part of city area, where the meaning includes building density control, control of air, corridor and mass fissures, environmental and building operation, the types of pressing activities in the building that can be accommodated in this site. Visual aesthetic factor beauty in a sector is a visual art that has various pleasing in the mind eye and the ear. So the type of its beauty will be various that can please the eye and mind on in other words, the values of form and vision expression. The result of a visual analysis of the visual character of the image support corridor, the study of the grip most of Palembang can be conclusion as follows. The road of the categories of supporting the Palembang area is challenging in Sudirman, Jalan Rebecca, and Jalan Rebecca, and Jalan Rebecca, and Jalan Rebecca, Area is based on visual aspect in the form of states. The quality of the visual character in each parting corridor of figure ground, scaling, setting, unity, and limit. It can be concluded that Jalan Jalan Sudirman and Jalan Beka has the best visual quality. It was found that the visual character there is Creation of each road corridor in support of the grid most area, namely in sequence as follows: Jalan Jalan Sudirman is the main visual support for the grid most. From about and Jalan Mereka has the second, second visual support for the grid most of Palembang area. The influence of visual quality by each of the regional corridors will form the grid most are area which has an urban area which is the main node of Palembang city so that it can also provide guidance to the city community in determining the orientation of its direction and position, position namely by looking at the skyline and the function of the buildings. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you so much. So um, now we are 
getting to the first round table of this panel. Uh, as we as we could see, uh, we had first Asma Gedria, who show us a report on a study case of a city on constant change uh, and uh, its risk of losing some kind of identity as a thermal city. Uh, secondly, Arif Yoko Turkan, sorry. <laughs> Uh, again, fo uh, follows the case of, a, of something that is changing his identity. It's an, an analysis uh, based uh, on, on a, some sensible parts of, of the territory, namely symbols and meanings. And uh, it's very curious to the link she makes with the, with the users and the people over there. Finally, Hendug three, sorry, Hendug, uh, show us uh, quite a, a curious uh, analysis of the visual qualities of a city center, uh, looking at uh, a city center that is made in fact of a composition of linear um, elements and uh, which are both uh, symbolic and, um, and important. So from this, from this, three uh, interventions i would say that change would be the the main the main focus on this panel uh, some kind of old versus new versus contemporary uh, which calls for a fundamental question can we make new heritage are we are we produce, producing new heritage um heritage, heritage seems to be related with time uh, and its age but what, what about the future? Don't we have an obligation towards future people? Is there a change to create a, a dynamic and sustainable contemporary heritage through the creation of documents that will show our era to future inhabitants? If so, how to proceed? So with this, I, I open the discussion in our panel, please. Uh, yes, in fact, it was a good comment, uh, Dr. Jose, because uh, as Sharon Zukin also mentioned, authenticity, part of the authenticity is old and part of it new. Uh, and so uh, uh, why not we, we can also create the contemporary heritage for the future uh, generation as well. Uh, also, uh, to um, uh, support your um, discussion, Dr. Jose, I want to ask also a question uh, to Araf, since uh, is of any of the uh, right authors wants to uh, respond to a uh, question, discussion of which was opened by Professor Jose? Okay, I will ask the question uh, from uh, Araf uh, the, regarding the changing urban identity. Uh, the thing is that uh, the use, you were uh, pointing user's perspective and then you were discussing the temporary users and permanent. Uh, these temporary users are um, do you mean by the tourists coming from other cities or other countries, or there are, uh, let's say, people living in the same cities but coming from other neighborhoods? And uh, let's say the, um, the uh, permanent uh, users, do you mean the local community? Would you please discuss how this process of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, understanding because it was totally the opposite view. Uh, the uh, the tourists have the opposite. Uh, I mean, the temp, let's say, temporary users and the permanent users. They had completely the opposite view. Although it was very interesting for me, I would be very uh, uh, pleased if you explain a bit more. Uh, I think it is uh, muted, the voice, if you unmute, we can hear you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question and the opportunity to be here. Uh, I did 
the research actually on the COVID time, so we are not able to find any tourists around the area. So I mentioned with the temporary users, the people who come here for the mostly recreational purpose. And the area actually more like a commercial zone and famous with the hardware store, the kind of market and the fishing market. So. Uh, not really a, a housing zone, so not people live there much. The neighborhood population is 112 or, or something like this. But it's the a very important zone for the Istanbul because it's located at the beginning of the Golden Horn. So the um, permanent users actually the owners of the business of the, this area. They are uh, frequently use the area every day or making sale and the other stuff and we have some also make uh, we have some participants uh, which are um, working in the service sector in that area or so something like that they are like visiting the area it's f at least five times a week uh, I can say um, the I think this the most uh, the main point there differ so much because um, uh, the pe people who come here for the recreational purpose and a new user type for this area. Before this, uh, maybe you can catch from the mess, but I pass so quickly, maybe you can see. Uh, this recreational land is open in 2018. Uh, so uh, the, before that, you cannot like so much don't have so much coastline activities in that area uh, and they are not the able awareness to, they are not have the awareness of this um, local culture around there so they are looking like the more recreational thing uh, this area but uh, opposite to this um, uh, how can I say the result we figure out, because the Galata port and Haric port is uh, um, so much discussing going on about this construction, construction and it's a land, it's um, stuck in these mega projects. Uh, the permanent user find the dams more positively. Uh, uh, but uh, the, another point that I should say about this, because the uh, they are looking more economic profit approaches there because the, when the mega projects open there, they will um, be more attractive point and they will sell more products. Uh, but they are, they are not aware of the identity, even they use more them. Uh, because I think it's they're not local community actually. They are just all shop owners and they are looking it like more com commercial perspective, not like the living somebody in housing zone, not like the, a community actually. So, okay, th I hope it's the answer for yeah, you. Very, very <laughs> Sorry for my bad English actually. No, it was uh, very good and clear. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see that in the in the in the chat, uh, Mr. Mohammed now has some something to say to all of us. So I would ask him kindly if he wants to be vocal about it, because uh, I think in the in a round table it's it's uh, always a, a pleasure to hear from the people and maybe to respond to them. So please. Uh, Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, just because the connection has a, 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 a bit uh, problems. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I, I, I told that uh, you, you say that, uh, um, that uh, for the future, we, we should uh, ma make our uh, current uh, heritage for the future. Yes, of course, our documentation is not just for the historical things, the old historical things. We should document, document the, the present too. Uh, the the old things uh, and the, the present uh, elements uh, that can last uh, for uh, the future as uh, good heritage that that can be valuable heritage not uh, not everything can be documented but something uh, for uh, uh, just uh, uh, some buildings for example for the uh, 
the buildings for the architecture, we have some buildings that can really uh, be val valuable uh, heritage for the future that can last for uh, hundreds of years. And, uh, and it depends on the every country uh, laws. They sometimes they say uh, uh, tens of years, uh, some uh, consider as hundreds of years, but uh, there are buildings really can be valuable. Uh, uh, valuable heritage for our future for our future and even the non-tangible uh, things uh, we have some habits in our in our present present days can last for uh, for the future as uh, as more uh, more heritage things not just the tangible things i hope i uh, reached the answer that you are asking about yes uh, thank you so much because as thank i can too. see uh, there is some uh, very profound and valuable uh, analysis of the past and uh, also of the risks that we are taking today uh, as it seems to be uh, universal this question that uh, the new uh, uh, changes the whole and uh, so somehow and uh, i would put the question maybe to to our first our first um, panel um, dr asma gedria um, you show us the the a view of a city that if, if I look at it uh, without passion, I would say that it's a very dynamic, uh, a dynamic city, which it's in itself seems to be a very good thing because you have a motor. It's not the same thing that in, on other heritage places where the thing is dead. Sorry about the, the word. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I would kindly ask you if you believe that uh, you can take that dynamic and turn it for the better. Uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I would like to, to say that uh, the heritage uh, of uh, the city Hama, of Hamamik is a very recent heritage. It's a colonialistic heritage from the 19th and the 20th century. And we are uh, just uh, beginning to be interested in this heritage. And we can uh, say that we are not uh, able to be um, sensitive to this heritage. So uh, that moment when, when the city has uh, uh, be began its expansion, at any moment we had uh, uh, taken into consideration this heritage. So we, we made this sprawl um, uh, without uh, planning uh, the future of this city. So nowadays, uh, the urban core, the urban uh, historic uh, core of the of the city, is uh, beginning to be uh, to have expansion, vertical expansion, and to be very uh, densified. And uh, there is two uh, important monuments uh, there. What I, I, I have shown in, the, in my presentation is the casino, which is a 19th century uh, monument, and a Baylical Palace, which is a, a palace uh, built by the Bay of Tunis uh, since uh, the 18th century. And uh, we are now. Uh, 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 uh we are uh, 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 we, we are now uh, making so uh, extension of the city without taking into consideration these uh, two monuments and the historic character of the city and uh, i am not uh, very uh, very optimistic about the, the future because we are losing a, a, a long part of this uh, of this historic core uh, we are uh, the two monuments are one is abandoned and closed the other is um, squatted and there is uh, some tentative to 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 save this 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 uh, this heritage but uh, uh, maybe we 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 had to plan other extension uh, other part or maybe we it would be uh, uh, more benefit to the city to safeguard this uh, this core uh, and to make extension uh, 
uh, on the west or in the east or uh, to uh, renovate some other cities, quarters, some uh, reconverted some other uh, quarters, but not the, uh, the historical core because we are losing the, the symbolic uh, uh, core of the, of the city. That's, so it's it's a quite a problem. Yes, <laughs> but, uh, great problem. Yes. yes. While, while people are talking about it and, and studying it, maybe we can find some new solutions and dynamic solutions to to get it to it. So uh, I will ask now the, our our audience if is there any other questions, please. We still have time, fortunately, not not too much, but uh, some two three minutes. Well, if not, I will make a question <laughs> um, to our to our dear professor from Indonesia, which I, I'm I'm quite. I will try again to say your name, but uh, please, please, please don't be, don't be shocked. Um, so, um, Endang Sri Lestari, maybe. Uh, uh, I was very very moved by your analysis, the idea of visual analysis. And uh, and uh, because sometimes we confuse uh, science with architecture, and uh, and we we seem to 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 um, don't don't understand that architects are sensible uh, uh, to 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 the view. So the idea of using a view of visual analysis is very very nice. Uh, do you think that you can take this? Uh, Let's call it method, and and make it a, a productive um, uh, to to a, a new place of of the city and, and and use it as a as a tool, even a project or planning tool. Um, thank you. Uh, that's interesting, and I think that's uh, the great most in Palembang. Uh, is one of his centers, which usually is accessed by a corridor that gives value the quality of this of the area. So it has the title and the uh, if you be a bit louder so we can hear yes. your voice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, by looking at the evolution between a uh, visual component of the mass composition is in the corridor leading to an area. It can be seen the description um, of the character in supporting a regional center. Uh, seeing visual signs through the arrangement of uh, arrangement and relationship between elements for its corridor. How to adjust uh, the component of the visual system to one another and what sign in can appear in the visuals uh, that will determine this component to be part of a system so that it can manage the character visual support uh, of central this area mm. uh, and i think the visual quality to be each of the regional corridor will from the grand most most area which has an urban area which uh, the main node of Alman city and it can also provide within um, to the city community in determining of the orientation of the of its direction and position um, namely by looking the skyline and function of the buildings um, that's thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, so now we are one, one minute late, so we'll try to hurry things. <laughs> thank you so much, so much. Uh, and I, I, I will kindly ask Dr. Hosanna if she can keep helping me uh, as we uh, now pass to the introduction to the presentation of Professor Architect Dr. Domenico Giuseppe. Kizonitini, Kizoniti, and architect Dr. Dr. Tommaso Loli. Thank you. Grazie.
uh, traces, juxtaposition, and mirror things, critical reconstruction. Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm Tommaso Laudi from Universita La Sapienza di Roma, and today I'll present uh, traces, juxtaposition, and mirror things, critical reconstruction, a strategy of reinventing seeds, conducted with Professor Domenico Pizzanetti from Politecnico di Milan. The theme of reconstruction is increasingly important in the discipline of architecture, uh, since uh, from one end, the rapid climate changes causes all more, always more often natural disaster and catastrophe. While from another point of view, uh, from politics, there is a, it's always more common to have deliberate and artificial destruction of cities of uh, mankind due to war. So, I mean, the question is strategies to consolidate and transmit the, the memory which is a very key feature for the discipline of architecture. Rather than uh, starting from an uncontextual datum to analyze this aspect of uh, architecture, the city of Mosul in Iraq will be took as a pretext to identify some methodological criteria uh, for a strategic plan, since the city of Mosul is being harmed in his monumental identity notes from the civil war with ISIS. We can see the, the report of uh, destruction uh, from uh, UNESCO to see the diffuse destruction of monuments and uh, urban fabric. The issue on urban identity is a complex task to analyze for architecture since it uh, involves also other disciplines like urban sociology, semiotics and politics, but probably there is some aspects in which uh, architecture can uh, have uh, a word on it, uh, identifying uh, some uh, urban identity devices uh, as the symbols and records of meaning in uh, monuments, collective spaces, and primary elements, but also immaterial elements and absences that leaves in the urban fabric some operative memory. This is a beautiful quotation from Carlo Monino, in which he uh, identified the meaning of cities as the capability to be meaningful for multiple generations and multiple purposes, uh, thus generating a sort of surplus of, uh, of meaning that can be clear or not, complex and also contradictory, but realized here the possibility of cities to be meaningful. It's interesting to make a report on uh, the post-war European situation of the World War II, since the problem of identity and reconstruction was very similar to the one that is going on now, since it was cities like we see in Warsaw, which, in which destruction reached the points of 90% of the fabric. We tried to have a categorization of some reconstruction strategies identifying different case studies. The first part is case studies in which there was a or draw exactly the previous urban structure that you can see in Saint Malo in France, in which uh, there is a, like a stylistic restoration of the city, and Neustadt in Germany, in which the block division is completely uh, and exactly respected. Different case studies that uh, doesn't don't redraw but confirm the previous urban structure, like uh, the zone around Ponte Vecchio in Florence and uh, Frankfurt in Germany. In, uh, in which the block division is completely confirmed, even with different architectural bodies. There are also case studies that relate the previous urban structure back to new incentive methods. We can see Maubeuge in France by architect Urca, in which is the recognition of the perimeter walls, but the insertion of a new axiality goes into the city center, or the Havre by architect Perret, in which uh, the architect recognizes two main axes to relate, but the urban layout uh, is uh, arranged more freely. And also cases that deny the previous urban structure, as you can see from uh, the Corbusier and the in France, in which the, the permanences are completely forgotten. We can assume so some no, the notion from this case is that the practice as it was where it was doesn't work well on a large urban scale. And uh, it was a common strategy to, to rely on the urban block to preserve urban identity, even introducing minor changes, mainly for functional reasons as traffic and digest. But probably is uh, it's feasible to find uh, a more subtle reference to previous urban structure and find some substantial elements to, to relate with. As the interpretation of urban character uh, 
and find a relation that links memory to the natural evolution of, uh, of cities. And probably the problem of reconstruction uh, is uh, start exactly uh, within the definition of a context of, uh, of relation. We identified two main ways of relation to, to history and memory. One is vertical, that is more easy and uh, relies on historical and cultural variants and can be defined like traces as uh, we can think about related to archaeological pre-existences. But there is uh, another way that is an horizontal way that uh, involves the natural physical datum, the, the built context around what we are building and can be ascribed to the world of juxtapositions. It's interesting because this division is required also in Islamic uh, world. We can say the city as palimpsest by Andrzej Korbos, but also Palukun identify a prolactic method in, uh, in the settlement of uh, most, uh, a lot of Islamic cities. We can find two clear examples uh, in uh, the city of Damascus, that is a palimpsest, you can see in red the Greek settlement in the black, the Roman grid that, that overlaps the Greek uh, settlement, and then in light gray, the Islamic layout that takes some elements of both but uh, overimpose this figure. While the city of Mosul uh, is instead a parallactic method settlement in which there is a clear contraposition to the old uh, Assyrian capital of Nineveh and is a specular position uh, respect to the Tigris uh, river. But uh, what we found on an urban level, we can find also an architectural one. We can take the same two cities in which we find the Umayyad, the mosque, Damascus, with the juxtaposition on the, an old uh, temple and Temenos from uh, Greek. Then uh, the temple became a church, and then uh, all the Temenos became the Umayyad mosque, of uh, the main mosque of the cities. While in Mosul, we can see in red going from north to south on the Tigris River, the, the parallactic the, the development of uh, the governor palace starting from Bashtabia, then to Karasarai, then to the citadel of Alcala, and uh, going to the governor palaces by Ottomans going on the river. Uh, so the scenario is complex, and probably these two sides from one from the, the horizontal relation, the vertical relation must be interpolated, taking into consideration uh, some features of the cities like residential fabric, urban axis, monuments, and physical limits. European cities uh, uh, is common to find the distribution by parts. We can see the city of Padua, in which the development of the city have an identity that goes almost by neighborhood, that have an historical uh, very determined uh, the development, while the city of Mosul is different because the, the, the urban fabric changes a lot uh, and it has almost the same features and it configures mainly with the city by made by nodes, as we see from the monuments in black on the right and uh, all the, the, the pattern streets that involve these monuments. Uh, so, as a strategic plan, we identified uh, some of these nodes and uh, some of these lines that link the nodes, uh, trying to, to make a, a, a common group that could link some main uh, institutions, starting from public uh, function that can be also hope for a future identity of the cities, relying both on the physical uh, displacement, but also on the vertical possibility of recognition of historical places. And uh, we suppose the, uh, the work of uh, uh, our studio at Pontecco in Milan, some main function uh, that we developed, like an educational complex, the restoration of a new mosque, the, the reconstruction of part of the souk, and the, the location of a non city museum on the site precisely of the old city. So trying to interpolate a vertical and historical knowledge with the precise position of monuments led by the structure of the city. Thank you for your attention. Thank you um, for this presentation, which follows uh, our main subject. Uh, now I, I would ask uh, uh, Sarah Rabi from Politecnico Milano to present uh, her study. 
That's Hello it. everyone, this is Sarah Ria. I will be presenting my topic, heritage recognition between evaluation and monitoring. First, I would like to start by stating that the most controversial aspect in heritage conservation is determining the true values of monuments. Each value has attributes that can be shaped and consequently impact the society's mindset and its approach towards their heritage. The whole process starts with historians and conservators who can contextualize the monument and set up their conservation plans. However, this process does not guarantee their recognition of heritage by the society. Therefore, the after plan phase is crucial in evaluating the conservation project's effectiveness in various aspects. And also, this paper is aiming at questioning the discipline of heritage recognition and the conservation projects in Egypt, where many conservation actions neglect the true values of these uh, residents and also the monuments. Moreover, investigates the role of monitoring as a new actor in reestablishing values to be pursued by the society through a site visit to some of the successful conservation projects in Egypt and analytically uh, review their uh, responses uh, and performance within the society. So first, uh, stating that, that the process of monument recognition and practice in practice and reality, the professionals are responsible for reading and determining the various values of monument declare that there are two types of values that stand at the test of time and, uh, and the space and they constitute very well the self-awareness of time and values related to the past but they re-establish the originality of the monument while the new ones they regenerate a unity of the monument within the social context coming to the reality uh, and facing one of the major underrated problems in conservation in egypt which is uh, the value identification egypt has a very wide range of the values and ever expanding one which include both of the past and new values but uh, it's very challenging to identify them especially the new ones due to the lack of integrated conservation actions and the scientific tools to do so so because of the uh, inconsistent and, uh, and discrepancies between the different parties and actors who are concerned in reminding these factors and the lack of historical records and documents the evolution of national uh, administration started after the colonization period, which shows in this graph that the Egyptians had the, first, the chance for the first time to study their own heritage by the year 1953. And more than one governmental institution is responsible for defining a monument and setting consistent, vague, and vague, very vague laws. Uh, this was regarding the tangible heritage, while the intangible heritage is completely neglected and unfortunately the majority of the people living in cultural heritage context uh, haven't yet developed uh, a sufficient sense of self-identity and community due to the ways of displacement and lower level of education which weaken the general national awareness of the local society and the sense of belonging and marginalize the building especially the monuments in many cases and these newly constructed uh, administrations is adapting a new plan to preserve the luckily a registered moment without taking into consideration the social context. As a result of this scheme, the, of this scheme between the people and the monument, the gradual, gradually the sense of identity and the ability of recognizing the importance or the significance of monument is kind of lost or fading away. And here we see the dilemma of heritage recognition. Although uh, some officials and governments they uh, they they tried to have this. Uh, uh, a negative approach is that they cannot find a common ground between the uh, ministries and the collaborations in defining the duties of each sector. So I decided to select three case studies of conservation projects in Cairo that have started from a different base. They are started from the community and they are mainly uh, private, non-governmental uh, parties focusing on detecting the social behavior and interaction before and after the conservation plan as an attempt to monitor a uh, relatively successful project. So to undercover the uh, existence of intangible heritage and also to insist that in every single case there is something to be reported and detected. The following case studies represent a specific approach in an attempt to put the gap between the execution and those and administrative institutions and the sustainable intervention. So each one of them uh, was uh, kind of uh, neglected building and preserved by different parties, but all of them are private. And after collecting information regarding the social interaction and the implementation phase of the project and their, their response and interaction of the uh, of people with the, uh, within the the, the project after the execution of the project, 
and presented these results in a graph which, uh, with a score which uh, represent uh, a true positive impact on the society in case we consider them as part of the project. And here we just highlighted the few participation during the execution and the social interaction level after the, after the, uh, the conservation actions. And here we can find that the ones, uh, the last two ones are, have uh, more interaction with the society. And as a result, to establish a sustainable uh, policy and framework between the different institutions, most importantly, to establish a shared information platform. These efforts did not reach the local community and could not start a prosperous discussion. And this is a milestone in successful conservation actions. And we definitely need to collaborate with social scientists who can study the ethnic groups and detect a certain behavior. Coming to the most important aspect uh, and result of this research was the value to the society. We can never improve our vision unless we know how to deal with the new values and emerge that emerge from the sustainable conservation projects and actions that must be driven uh, from the society. And knowing these new values could be extracted from the monitoring phase, which is uh, I mean, claim in my research that monitoring could be a reverse tool in generating successful conservation plans after monitoring both and uh, before and after phase and built up on the new extracted values uh, that also can be used in an improved authenticity test, which is something that's still absent here in Asia, but we definitely need to improve it. And since the, each culture has its own inherent integrity with the unique values and practice here, which must be contextualized. And I would like to also insist on the place contextualized with monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this really, really fast <laughs> talking presentation. Um, now we go to. Uh, Dr. Eli Erem Yetkin, also from Turkey, and uh, please start it, Sam. Uh, yeah, professor, I think uh, it oh, is. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Nehan, Dr. Nehan. I'm jumping, I'm over our third, our third uh, Congress, uh, which is Dr. Nihan Kolama Pavlovich, maybe, from Turkey. Hi everyone, I'm Nihan Kojaman Pavlovich. I'm going to represent a new approach for the camping interventions of architectural remains and archaeological sites. The context of the research is archaeological sites in Mediterranean basin, particularly in Spain, Italy, Greece, and Turkey. Camping interventions on masonry architectural remains in archaeological sites. The aim of the research is to classify the capping interventions in archaeological sites, propose a new approach for capping on masonry architectural remains, discuss the advantages and disadvantages of hard capping interventions. Among conservation and restoration interventions, there are practices that can be called also as preventive interventions, such as comprehensive and time-consuming practices and that are carried out immediately after the artifacts are excavated. Conservation and restoration interventions, which are shaped according to the conservation status of the architectural domain, the structure it has, the conditions it is in, the budget of the archaeological excavations, the workforce and the working time can be carried out by following different methods. Interventions in archaeological sites can be divided mainly into two titles, ex situ and in situ interventions. The topic of the research is in situ interventions, which can be called as a subtitle covering. Motivation of the research is keeping practices for the conservation of masonry architectures or artifacts unearthed during the archaeological excavations. Frequently applied hard capping interventions are classified considering the examinations. 
Related to this classification, the relation between the current heart capping interventions and the remains, the advantages and disadvantages of this relation are discussed. The research proposes a new approach in order to eliminate the limits and disadvantages revealed in heart capping applications. In the research, the archaeological sites are examined and some problems are detected. These problems can be classified by calling physical problems, chemical problems, biological problems, and authenticity problems. When hard campings on the sites are examined, we will face with five different common types. The most common type for hard campings is the mortar-based capping. Secondly, stone, and thirdly, brick-based hard cappings can be discussed in this research. I'm going to share some examples from archaeological sites for hard capping interventions. This picture is from Herculaneum, and you can see mortar-based hard capping intervention. Another sample from Mykonite, which the capping is done by using no stones. Another example from Miletos. This is an example for hard capping, which bricks are used. Forum of Rome, stone, last layer are followed by bricks and mortar on top of stones are placed with mortar for capping inside this. Instead, again, extension of the walls with small stones and mortar covers. From Sagalosos, different layers are done for capping progress and some special layers for isolation are used. Again, from Sagalosos, a membrane uh, with bitume is used to separate the new additional capping from the existing walls. When we discuss advantages and disadvantages of hard cappings, it's compatible, it's less labor, less cost, rapid execution, and considering the other applications as a thing. When we discuss disadvantages of the hard cappings, we can say it brings mass load to remains. Most of the time, it detaches from remains. It's poor for preservation. It's irreversible most of the time. Accelerated water entry and poor drainage for the new approach. A very basic capping system is improved. In this capping system, a metal plate, which is stainless plus epoxy covered surface, is placed by bended in two sides. Underneath this metal plate, it's a mass to separate the connection of the metal piece with the remaining. So a caoutchouc is used underneath this metal plate. Then non-sticking isolation foam to protect the original remains is considered. For the water drainage, both sides of the metal plate are bended. Then, from some points, a stainless chain is considered to drain water coming from the top part of the plate. By this chain, the advantage is to remove the water 
to the floor plus to give a weight for the wind for this metal plate besides all this advantages of this metal capping that is recognizable by the visitors which proves that it's an addition in a late period for the monument. Another advantage is there is no mass load on top of the fragile archaeological remains. The other advantage is water isolation. When it's done, it's easy and fast to set it on top of the remains doesn't need a special labor. It's reversible. There is nothing sticking to the original remains. And it's flexible and sustainable. That in the case another restoration intervention is considered for this remain, this cap can be taken easily because it's not attaching to the original monument, then it will be recycled or reused for another piece of monument. Besides this, there are also disadvantages of this metal capping approach. First of all, it needs visibility in advance before application. Then, for the epoxy parts of the stainless steel plate, maintenance is necessary. It is poor in strength, and when it's compared with the masonry cappings, long-term cost is higher of this metal capping approach. In conclusion, archaeological excavation should be limited for providing more important budget, labor, and time to the protection of existing unearthed archaeological heritage. The serious number of interventions of the recent years on remains are not protecting the heritage as it expected, hence even gives harm. There should be always reversible new approaches for protection of the architectural remains, only if they are tested and controlled. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. It was absolutely interest, interesting. Now, uh, I wonder if we can hear from Dr. Ali Aaron Yetkin, which I think it makes the... I think uh, I was, che uh, I was uh, checking, I think uh, she is not uh, attending, and then we, we, do, we do not have any video uh, coming from her side. Uh, we so, so go directly to the second, uh, well, the fourth round table. Uh, Again, I will do some some very short comments on on what we just have heard and see. Um, again, time seems to be <laughs> seems to be an important matter, <laughs> not only for humans but also for for heritage and everything around us. So we we saw that uh, Tommaso uh, was able to talk about something that is absolutely critical, which is heritage risk. And uh, he was very um, adamant to, 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 to tell us that there are natural and artificial risks. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the question is how to do with, with uh, something that has collapsed somehow and how to re reconstruct it without losing his uh, identity. Um, of course, the... It puts in it puts forward the importance of let's call it city historical footprint, um, which is in fact a continuous timeline that uh, united united us to the past, to the present, and to the future, uh, while at the same time uh, remembering uh, through the words of Carlo Aimonino um, that uh, we are not only technical; we should also be sensible. And uh, the, 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 the idea of interpretation doesn't mean only making a survey, but also to understand the meaning and the and way the things are going and 
they were as they were before. After Sar al Rabi show us uh, the the well somehow somehow she reveals us that, that, that in fact there is uh, two times one before and one after the 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 intervention and uh, the importance of understanding what's what's before and what's after the, the when you when you go and and try to rescue somehow uh, some kind of heritage, being it uh, intangible or not. Um, the, the idea of uh, participation, because this it's a uh, very, very uh, opportune, uh, op well, uh, opportune <laughs> once, uh, because it's in fact something very contemporary and very new. And uh, uh, we learn a lot with the Sarmarabi um, uh, exposal. And then again, <laughs> we come to Nihan, which uh, reminded us that the uh, okay technique is also necessary. It's uh, it's very beautiful to have this all these uh, let's say poetic views over poetic in the good sense, of course, over heritage. And uh, but at the, at the given moment, we need to know how to act. And uh, the presentation of this capping uh, technical it was it was uh, almost clinical presentation which i think it's a, a, a scale that should be present all the time while we are uh, looking at the heritage uh, from the first moment so um, I, I will i will i will ask someone if she if if someone wants to have a um, some kind of intervention over it, or shall we shall we continue? Please. No. So. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I will try to make some kind of some kind of. Uh, I will start with Niham. I was uh, really, really. That was really interest, interesting. This uh, this metal capping technique, which I understand is is something that kind of floats over the 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 archaeological walls. And uh, I, I I didn't manage. I was writing your words, so I I didn't manage to see if there was some kind of images. So my my question is. Do you have some ex practical experience with this technique? And uh, uh, if there is anything else that you want to, to add to your already very good presentation, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, we are working on it, actually, because um, there are some technical problems for replacing the metal cappings, because uh, you need perfect size, perfect um, survey for the walls that you're going to apply this capping. Uh, because of this, um, the producing process, like I mentioned in my present presentation, the feasibility uh, process, it's uh, really taking so much time. For the other hard uh, cappings, uh, it's easy you to find the good labor and start doing this masonry additions after the uh, isolation layer. But uh, in our case, you need to be very precise. And um, there are some errors in the field, but uh, as you already know, uh, excavations are limited with two months most of the time. So if you are over the time, you need to wait one more year to make it uh, real. So. Uh, we are working on it still with the uh, metal producing uh, process. Uh, hopefully this uh, year we are going to have chance to apply after July. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I do understand because I also work in the field and I do mm -hmm. understand the, the problem with the quality workers, which exactly. seems one of the most, uh, one of the biggest uh, and, <laughs> uh, so on, on the on the on the subject of uh, let's call it artificial risk, uh, I would ask uh, Tomaso 
if um, you can show us, uh, you can show us, sorry, not show us, you can talk to us a bit more about your experience in a, well, it, it seems to be a, a work, uh, a war zone. Uh, and uh, and how do you really compare a war zone with a earthquake zone, maybe? Well, uh, hope you hear me. Yeah. Uh, there are, um, of course, some similar aspects between uh, wars and natural disasters. Uh, wars are more violent in uh, symbols because uh, we see also nowadays that uh, while uh, an earthquake uh, destroys uh, without discrimination all the city, war can decide what to de destroy, as we saw in Mosul, but uh, we are also seeing now between uh, Israel and Palestinian war. You can choose what to destruct, and often you choose to destruct the symbols of a community just to erase uh, the identity. And it was uh, similar to what happened uh, in Europe after the Second World War, because the Although some examples in was uh, saving some monuments, it was the precise uh, will to destroy symbols. So my my research one tries because once is too much, tries uh, to to understand how to relate with uh, this identity because it's not uh, probably possible to rebuild uh, as it was. And uh, a very important point, uh, as uh, you were mentioned before, is try to understand the dynamics of in which a phenomenon take places. So, um, and certain send the logics of generative processes that uh, leads uh, a community to build uh, in a way, in a place. And um, because the dynamics stands among the material conservation of, uh, of stones, of bricks, and the immaterial heritage of people because it's how people behave how people react and for me it was uh, it's of course important to, to focus on the building on uh, reconstruct uh, something that can be uh, known from people but also the position of the building in the city because the city has its own logic and so it's interesting to to merge the architectural aspect of reconstruction to the urban aspect of reconstruction and uh, investigating the processes that led to some chapter. That's him, Tomazzo. Um, in fact, the, this, this takes us to, to my last question to, to Sara, because uh, exactly as Tomazzo, I think Sara has pointed out the question about the relationship between people. I, I was almost uh, um, saying ordinary people, uh, but uh, I would say real people uh, with their monuments. And uh, the method she exposed to us is, is, seems to be one, one very, very um, fertile. And uh, this idea of past values versus new values, values and, uh, and uh, how to put um, the intervention either conservation or whatever, between these past values and those new values. Um, so, uh, Sara, please, can you tell us uh, if somehow this is working or this is still um, a theoretical uh, approach? Uh, you, you show us three very, very different and very interesting case studies. And uh, how, do you, how do you feel that uh, uh, we should proceed from now on. If Sarah is around. Uh, oh. I think she lost the connection. She was around. Okay, okay. So if she can hear us, uh, thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. Very, very nice. So I will ask for a, a, a less time in a, in in a, in a Catholic um, weddings. At the moment, the priest says, "If you have something to say, you say it now, or you share up forever." So <laughs> I would say the same. Do you have any other questions to our panel, or any comments on the on the panel itself? 
um, I would I would urge you to talk now. We still have some minutes to um, to perfect, perfect, uh, to use. So maybe this is the siesta time. <laughs> <laughs> now we can use the time for taking a uh, strong coffee. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I believe you, Jose, I need. <laughs> <laughs> I have it one here. <laughs> I am looking around. I, I cannot find this. Well, well, you are welcome. You are welcome in Lisbon. I, I will give you some strong coffee. It's not Italian coffee, sorry, Tomazzo. Uh, in fact, it's Ely coffee. But <laughs> um, so I, I will wrap up our 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 panel uh, again. Many, many, many thanks to to our um, speakers, uh, which were very efficient and uh, very. Uh, time uh, preci precise which uh, as as a chair i i have so much to to uh, to thank for uh, of course thank you so so much to um dr Hak how do you say your name roxana yes roxana and i want thank you thank you so much for and uh, and thank you for um for our, uh, inviting me and hopefully, hopefully next time we can meet uh, oh. physically. <laughs> okay. Thank you so, for accepting our invitation. Thank you. A huge yes, pleasure. Thank you. See you soon. See you. Thank you for this uh, good uh, organization and your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear uh, Dr. Minha. And yes, we have a time uh, till we start the, uh, the next round table. Uh, which will be the chair will be Dr. Anna. Yes, she is in. Hello, dear Dr. Anna. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. Very nice to hear your voice and see you. Uh, do you want to start now or you need a, a break uh, for a coffee? Uh, we can start. I think uh, the, uh, uh, the authors, are, well, I was checking also, they are available. Yes. And uh, um, uh, ready to start the session. We are ready, no worry. Okay. So at first, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, at first, I would like to thank uh, for this invitation, of course, and thank to all of speakers for your participation and for your contributes uh, at this 50 round table. Uh, where we are going to talk about and reflect about uh, landscape and heritage. I would like to start with a very small presentation about myself, just uh, you to know. My name is Anna Bordalo, and uh, I'm a PhD architect. I teach project studio in the first level of studies uh, in the ma uh, architectural master's degree uh, at Ima, Ismat, that is a small university in Portimão, Algarve, in the south of Portugal. And uh, I'm also the head of this uh, uh, degree. And uh, uh, when we nowadays, and just to start to make a small introduction for this uh, table, when we talk about uh, heritage and landscape, we can talk about everything <laughs> it's nowadays. I think it's very interesting for that because uh, it includes the territory, the nature, the buildings, and uh, also the people uh, there uh, and so on. So we, I think it's a very, very interesting. And uh, nowadays we, we are uh, in a period marked for, by the pandemic and global in a global scale. Uh, and uh, some structures of our societies uh, were exposed to our weakness and uh, our uh, incapacity to, to resolve uh, a lot of problems. So I think uh, uh, people and nature and our territory are nowadays our best heritage. So um, after that, just a few words about uh, what you are going to assist uh, in this table. 
Uh, it is, uh, I show, I already saw uh, the, the videos and I think it's very interesting because all of them uh, abort different perspectives and concerns about uh, the team, of course, the heritage and landscape. And uh, they are very focused on case studies. And I think that's very interesting. So uh, I think we have the privilege to, to watch that. And I think the, the videos will prove that. Uh, the, uh, this table, we, ha uh, we have 10 presentations, but only nine videos. I don't know if uh, the author of the video, uh, the presentation without video is here or not. In the first video, uh, we'll, uh, uh, it's about uh, the evolution mutations in the city of Haneba in Algeria. Sorry for some names. I, I really don't know how to say a lot of them. Sorry for that. <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's a, my problem, of course, <laughs> with the focus on colonial areas where social and economic development with the liberalization of the markets have changed in the the urban and architectural heritage in the city. Uh, the second video is a presentation about the impact uh, that revitalization could have in the territories. And it presents a case study in Kenya. And, and to finish the first, uh, the first block, we have another case study uh, at this time in Malaya that uh, reflects about the evolution of station buildings uh, plan and uh, the train sheds and also the evolution that is uh, in the cities we, uh, that have this kind of uh, buildings. Uh, in the second block, uh, we have uh, uh, four presentations and uh, we continue to, uh, they, they are based uh, still in the case studies. The first one is that uh, we don't have the, the video, so I don't know if uh, author is here, if he uh, wants to make a presentation or not, but it's about uh, the, um, the square of uh, Museum of uh, Louvre, Louvre Museum Square in, the, in Paris, uh, and where the author reflects about the uh, connections uh, between the the, the historical places and new constructions around. In the second presentation, we will continue to talk about urban places and its transformations. Now in the city of Erbil in Iraq, with a case study that tries to develop a conceptual model focus on a tangible relationships between identity of the places and cultural aspects. Uh, then we will continue with another study that analyzed the, a territory in, sorry, I will try to say it, Kakiakara, <laughs> Kakiakara uh, state uh, garden in China, and uh, uh, that amounts to present the exit, existing natural culture uh, settings and proposing an interpretive guideline to these cultural landscapes. Uh, the second block will be complete with a study that presents the restorative effects of biophilic design elements in the Egyptian and the, the uh, and the uh, in the Egyptian urban garden. Sorry, and the, its potential and effective incorporation in urbanism of the city, of the country. Sorry. At last, uh, in the third block, we have uh, three more presentations. Uh, the first one reflects about the impact of tourism in Turkey and the consequences in the stages of uh, special transformation for touristic areas. The second one presents uh, a stat case about uh, a territory in Turkey also. Uh, and it uh, reflects about the different uh, cultures that lives and the, the consequences for the territory. With the last presentation, we will, uh, we will re return to Bangladesh, uh, more precisely to uh, Dharma, Dharmash Hagar, probably, uh, that is one of the earliest pieces of evidence of urban water heritage in the country. 
Uh, at the end of each block, we'll have 50 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, it uh, reminds me to wish you a very good conference. Thank you very much for your attention and for your participation. And I think we could, we could start with the first video that uh, I hope to con uh, uh, just a minute because I, it's not opening. Sorry for that. Are you seeing now? Yes, uh, we yes. can see your screen, which is okay. There. Okay, that's good. Uh, sorry, I. It's here. Uh, here, Dr. Anna. You uh, don't have sound. In, yes, in sharing the screen, uh, we should uh, uh, click on uh, the yeah, the, the video legendas. Link. Yes, the video link. You you click on the screen. In fact, uh, you may click on the, uh, the 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 YouTube link, which is open. Uh, I can do the work if you wish. Sorry. I ela, ela pode pôr o vídeo, ela é mais simples. Ah, ok, ok. You can, uh, sorry. I'll stop it. Oh, ok, I will, I will do it. Uh, let's go for the first audience. Is it all right? Ok, you can, you can, sh ok, ok. Hello everyone, I am Munira from the University of Dhamma, Algeria. I will present my work entitled The Impact of Commercial Mutations on Historical Buildings in Algeria, Case of Colonial Districts and Survival the Objectives of the Work. After I will present the geographical location of the city of Anaga, evolution of the urban fabric of the city of Anaga, evolution of the commercial forms and their impact on the old Anabi building. And objectives of the work. After, I will present the geographical location of the city of Annaba, evolution of the urban fabric of the city of Annaba, evolution of the commercial forms and their impact on the old Annabi building, the government measurement. I will finish with the conclusion. The retail sector is constantly evolving. It tries to follow the changes in consumption or proceed the demand by proposing new commercial concepts. The evolution of the urban spaces and the development of technology, these changes have an influence on the built heritage and the image of the city. The gains due to social and economic development and market liberalization have changed its urban and architectural heritage. Located in northeastern Algeria and created before the 10th century, we have seen many civilizations and seen a few close by. Every civilization has left behind traces that time has sometimes taken care of protecting them, it freed us or erasing them completely. The heritage wealth testifying and telling the story of ancestors past unfortunately began to lose its value and originality after the transformations and modifications that took place in the old residential building inherited from two opposing cultures by integrating new forms of commercial activities. The, obje the objective of this communication is to analyze and measure the evolution of these mutations with a focus on the ancient colonial areas of city of Annaba, where the phenomenon is most pronounced. Annaba is a city situated in northeast of Algeria. It is the fourth city of Algeria in number of inhabitants after the capital Algiers, Oran and Constantine. The city of Annaba is a coastal city. It occupies the west of the Khlij and Murchan Gulf, more known under the name of Gulf of Bonn, and located at 152 kilometers in the northeast of Constantine, at 246 kilometers in the east of Shijil, and at approximately 100 kilometers in the west of Tunisian border. This privileged position of the port agglomerations offers it the possibility of opening up to the international space and naturally offers on it a function of crossroads in international exchanges. The city was founded before 10th century BC. 
Situation in the north of Africa gives it a strategic place and it has seen several civilizations and dynasties pass through. Phoenician, Numidian, Roman, Vandal, Fatimid, Zirid, Hamadid, and Mawahidin have seen Ottoman and French conquest. Each civilization has left traces of vestiges that time has sometimes taken care to protect them, bequeath to us, or erase completely. Each civilization had a method of planning its market space according to economic, social, cultural, political, and technological requirements. The initial Koran Zal Medina dates back to the 11th century. Between 1833 and 1840, the city underwent the first urban interventions carried out by the French military, which consisted of widening out the streets and the transformation of the western part of the city. From 1870 onwards, the extensions of the city began according to a planned system, widened straight streets as well as the establishment of aligned buildings. The old colonial districts of the city of Anaba occupy the center of the city and present a multiplicity of functions and commercial and residential activities. The old districts of the city which occupy the city center present a mix of architectural styles. In red, the old town, which is characterized by the dominance of Arab, Muslim and traditional colonial style buildings where the shops are located on the ground floor. In blue, this colonial part built towards the end of 19th century hosts Osmanian buildings in neoclassical style. In black, this area is occupied by traditional colonial modern, postmodern, and the style produced by the current inhabitants. Before 1962, Ottoman period, Anaba has functioned as a port located two kilometers northeast of the ruins of Hippon. Before 1832, Anaba was a structure city like the majority of the Arab Muslim cities at this period. Trade practice in open air markets, souk, and in artisanal streets specialized according to the type of product. Repartitions based on the principle of the culture and the religion of the society. In Buna, as it was called in this period, there were 14 markets. Souk, 13. French colonization period. The city changed from a closed city with a wall to an open city, high buildings and wider aligned streets. The weekly markets and specialized handicraft streets were replaced by covered markets and shops with windows on the ground floor of buildings. Impact on the aesthetic and urban character of the city. During this period, trade was monopolized by the French colonists, whereas Algerians were involved in small businesses. Between 1950 and 1962, the industrialists dominated, supply was lower than demand, the industrialists dominated the other economic actors. I sell what I produce. The sales points were small and very numerous. These sales points belonged to their traditional and dependent trade. Well, after 1962, the city of Anaba has been subjected to a major change from an architectural city to an industrial city, with the realization of large industrial complexes which caused a considerable rural exodus from the bordering regions in search of work and good living conditions. Because during the first years of independence, there was a high level of unemployment and poverty in the country, particularly in the rural areas. As a result of a massive rural exodus, demand in the city began to exceed supply, leading to the emergence of so-called legitimate housing and at the same time, the emergence of informal markets and trade inherited from the rural population. This type of trade appeared in several forms. The trade of trabando, shopping bags, import of small quantities of products, night market, so illegal during the 1990s. This situation was amplified by a second wave of rural exodus, escaping insecurity. onwards, the transition from a plan to a merchant economy has given rise to the other economic forms, particularly in terms of commercial activity. The retreat of role of state in domestic trade, with the exception of public sales companies. The disproportionate occupation of ground floors of buildings by small shops. Illegal occupation of shopping streets in central areas by street vendors. Surface area divided to smallest because of the rent or various activities. 
birth of a popular shopping center. Occupation of the empty spaces in the city center by houses of completely different architecture from the existing ones on the upper floor and shops on the ground floor. Functions appear through a disfigured urban landscape, high urban density in the center of inauguration of new commercial bazaars. On several levels, treatment of facets with materials not compatible with existing architectural styles, loss of authenticity. The exercise of certain commercial activities in urban areas in inadequate spaces causing troubles and disagreements with public order. The circulations of goods and people and good neighborhood pollution and reasons. Opening of supermarkets and mini markets that do not have car parks or parking areas in large cities. It generates traffic congestion and difficulties in accessing the public road network. Executive Degree Number 12111 of March 6, 2012, issued by the Ministry of Trade, fixing the conditions and the methods of establishment and organization of commercial spaces and exercise of certain commercial activities. OG Number 15, 2012. Implementations of the provisions of Articles 26, 27, and 28 of the Law Number 0408 of August 14, 2004, filed and supplemented to relating to the conditions of exercise of the commercial activities, progressively putting an end to the dysfunctions that characterize the disorderly establishment of commercial spaces. In this work, we presented an overview of the impact of historical buildings in the colonial districts of Anaba City. We have observed a population that is not aware of the need to preserve the authenticity of the buildings. Also, the traders are only interested in profit while not considering the importance of heritage for commercial attraction. Despite all these laws, the preservation of colonial buildings is far from being achieved. The operations carried out by the state until now have concerned the repitulations of degraded buildings without taking into account the authenticity which is not yet considered as an integral part of the heritage. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Ajisi Ayu and uh, I'm here to present about revitalization with the focus on the Gomi's urban landscape. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be able to talk about this particular topic. I'm trying to bring about uh, a regenerative approach towards understanding this <laughs> uh, which is in the so the idea is to make it more of like an inspiration to the people and uh, trying to unify them towards a common goal and uh, because uh, I believe in the words of Mount Hunger and the Genesis that they uh, are <laughs> uh, Inspired. <laughs> short introduction about Mikoni. It's located in the southern part of uh, Mombasa County and uh, it is uh, it, it forms part of part of a mainland section of Mombasa County because there is the island part of uh, Mombasa town that uh, all in all consists of uh, Mombasa County and uh, to get to the other side of the island, they use a ferry. They've been using a ferry for the for over uh, half a century right now because there's no uh, a, a different connection to the two uh, portions of Mombasa County. So this, this is a simple map to just understand where the colony is and where the Mombasa Island is. 
in uh, relation to each other. This is general information about the area. It's the poorest of Mombasa County, an area of 51.3 kilometers squared. And uh, the population as of 2011, the census, we was at 200,000 people, which by now has probably doubled or even tripled because of the first growth that Nikon experienced over the, uh, the recent past. This is to give an understanding of the ground and geological properties of the area because uh, to be able to build my case, I needed to have a look at uh, how the, the, the area is in, in terms of the geology, the rainfalls, the, uh, the, the, the ground itself, and uh, to be able to understand exactly what is the situation in Mombasa. And if you can notice now, the image clearly depicts the, the island of Mombasa and uh, where the colony is and uh, the other side that all in all make the county. This is uh, part of the study on the, the rocks. So I have to touch on the physiography, this make a summary of the geology and the stratigraphy, just to understand how rich this area is in terms of the uh, the coral uh, rock that uh, will now set a basis of uh, our study that will lead us to the idea of us proposing revitalization. So, human activities from time in the moon have been agriculture, and this is just uh, a few pictorial uh, images to show how the colony has uh, developed over the period of uh, time. So. Uh, the images above shows uh, a chronology of time for the past uh, two decades. And uh, we see the agriculture made the area rich in terms of uh, produce and the population increased. But uh, that's so, with the increase of population came the need of housing. And uh, not only in Nikoni, but also to the island of, Mumba, of Mombasa. So there was the fact that uh, the fact of people mining, acquiring in the corner and taking the stones to the mainland and also to parts of the corner that later on led to this uh, intensified uh, congestion in the small urban center. So the bar shows how big the agricultural land increased over a period of time. So we are moving from agriculture to now quarry. And these are a few areas which I consider to have experienced this uh, environmental destruction due to the quarry activities. And uh, they show the hierarchy of activities now as of today, where people are living on uh, 2 to $4 a day, so that's why it's the poorest area of the county. And uh, people have resorted to go into the port of Mombasa to work as day laborers. There are other areas, but on the mainland, and uh, living this destitute life to the world, to, to only an evening time when they come back home. So uh, they either quarrying, uh, working as day laborers, quarrying or informal street vending, and finally agriculture. So agriculture has gone down from being top of this hierarchy. But what is the spirit of the place? So we notice some rebellion. So we've got uh, different rebels in, in, on different scales. We've got uh, the cartels that are rebelling against nature, and uh, they are all mindful about how much they can be getting from the quarry and uh, how to enrich themselves. While at the same time, the people who are the custodians of the environment are rebelling against these movements, and uh, that's why there they are always constant protests and uh, a cry to the people because this is not what they envision the environment to be. So these are three proposals that um, we, we, we developed, and uh, they are in particular order, but just uh, uh, proposals to see the idea of revitalization being achieved. These are the site potentials. So looking at Likoni growing as, a, as, a, uh, as an urban center, it's now a town that we believe in future to be able to become even part of uh, uh, a remote uh, maybe uh, area of uh, Mombasa. So there's a need of uh, to establish some city making uh, activities, culture making activities as well as, well as place making to be able to uh, make the area have a newness of some sort. As we are trying to 
look into Afghanistan potential, then what you find is, I mean, is uh, what you find you are in roles are we also incorporating in such an area with the deputy quality close to the society. So we came with up with the economic, environmental, and social values that can be helpful towards uh, modifying this particular area. And in order to touch on the different areas, we came up with the, this sort of uh, mapping where we are trying to identify the, the patches which are the deputed and active quarries as a the the corridors that are uh, and the roads where people use in the into the activity and this is a close up of some some area so we are looking at how to engage uh, a correlation between these the patches and the corridors in the midst of the community and uh, some of the things we've been cooperating and then doing infrastructure so instead of having a quarry that is neglected close to the houses, some of them being used as dump sites, then what can we propose as, a, as, as a, uh, being part of uh, custodians of this environment, because this is where we come from. So um, we propose uh, designing for evolution, so it's more of a metamorphosis kind of uh, uh, idea, whereby uh, there's uh, moving from the deputy quarry in, uh, as seen in part A and uh, all the way to uh, part B, which uh, shows uh, the engagement, and then finally part C. So the initial stage would be in, in bringing up topomous uh, vegetation, which is the, the, the locally uh, found vegetation, to be the initiator of this. Uh, sort of uh, reforestation, let's say, for that matter. Then uh, there'll be the bringing in of different trees and uh, that can be able to facilitate the common world. As we're doing that, we will also be highlighting the capitals of gene in the world. So can we find a, a platform where natural capital, human capital, built capital, and financial capital can all come and uh, being able to, to work together for the common good of the corn as a, as, as a town. And uh, this is why we did this mapping and image here. And uh, some of the appropriate technologies that can be incorporated. And uh, instead of having a depleted quarry, whereby uh, when it rains, it's a site for stagnating water and mosquitoes bring malaria, build hearts here, and some of the depleted quarries are also used as lynching places where people are killed and dumped into this area. So the insecurities and all the negative aspects that come with, the, with, with the, having the depleted quarries is what we're trying to counter in this uh, section. So in conclusion, we believe the economy needs revitalization and truth be seen in the words of Prentice model that nature can live with man, but man cannot live with, without nature. So what can we do to be able to live with nature? These are the reference that help us uh, to develop this short presentation and I believe it will spark a conversation somewhere and uh, one day we will be able to actually engage the community towards uh, revitalizing this particular area. Thank you for being my audience and uh, I highly appreciate it. Thank you. Greetings to all. Hi, I'm Hafiza. Today I would like to share with you about an evolution of a type, a case study of station buildings in the West Coast Line Malaysia during the British era, 1885 to 1957. Okay, first let's talk a little bit on the historical background of the Malaysian railway development according to the sectors. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, railways were the pioneers of modern transportation introduced by the British to the Malaya during 1885. They started in 1886 because of the emergence of the tin and uh, later on, on the rubber industries. The railway, there are three phases of development in the railway line. The first phase 
They are connecting the short distance railway lines to the center from the center of the mining from rural area to the western port. And the second phase, they are connecting the railway lines from north to south, where the third phase, the new sector emerged where they amalgamate all over the peninsula Malaysia. So as you can see from the first um, map in the 1890, the first two, the mining area that was open from Taiping to Portwell and also from Kuala Lumpur to Klang. And later on, that we will see in 1900-1910, where there are the amalgamation of all of the railway lines through states. And in 1935, they completed all the railway lines until Singapore station. Now we'll talk about building technologies. Building technologies can be separated into two types, the plan types and the train shed. Station buildings were determined by its layout plan, certain architectural elements and its surrounding area from the small ticketing office as its basic needs that include two additional spaces such as waiting area and a shelter provided to make a simple form for a special purposes building, a station building. According to mid 1956, there were only four station types according to their basic circulation routes of departing and arriving passengers. The four station types were one-sided type, where the passenger route takes place on one side of the track, two-sided or twin station, the arriving and departing routes handle on opposite side of tracks, the headhouse type station building, which allows both arriving and departing passengers coming across each other and mixing on one platform, and the L-type station building, where passengers arrive at the end of the track and depart at the, at, at the either side or vice versa. Nevertheless, in the Malaysian West Coastline Station buildings, plan types can be categorized into two types, which is the one-sided plan, which is divided into two types, having a single platform, and also some having two platforms. And the second is the head house plan. One-sided plan. One-sided plan is the earlier station building in Malaysia used as it was the most basic plan and it accommodates open waiting area, ticket office, and a track. This type is basically seen all over the world. This basic plan of long rectangular buildings extending along the rail track were built to fulfill the basic function that is to discharge goods and passengers quickly as possible when the train stop. At the same time, the covered veranda gives the needed protection for the boarding passengers. As you can see here, we have an example of the Malaysian having a one-sided plan. The first one is the Taiping station. The second one is the Kuala Lumpur railway station. We also have a schematic plan of Tenang station, Nabi station, Baikok station, and also Renggam station. And also you can see the two pictures below are the one-sided station plan type of Mekeche train station by the river of Sakarya in Turkey and also a 1900 photograph of the one-sided plan type of Newcastle station shows only one active platform for passenger use. Now we'll go to the head house plan. As the station grow bigger, the head house plan type seems to be more appropriate but only one station in Malaysia has a chance in adapting this station plan type. The head house plan type allows both arriving and departing passengers to pass through each other. Both share a common waiting area or launch in a single building having separated platform, platforms for arrival and departure. The U-shaped station is one of the best examples of the head house type station buildings where it offers easy access and allows passengers to move freely without crossing tracks. The Tanjung Pagar station was the last station built by the British in 1932 as it was the last station in the West Coast Line from Padang Besar, Perlis to Tanjung Pagar, Singapore.
The Chongpa Gao Station, having a U-shaped land, allows all the passengers to enter and exit from the head house of the building, giving opportunities for the people to mingle. This might be inspired from the York Station, which also employed U-shaped station land and became one of the most accessible stations. The U-shaped station was easily accessible and permitting passengers to move freely without having to cross track. There are also examples of the Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus, India, which is also applied a headhouse plan type, but the headhouse located at the side of the platform. Meanwhile, the St. Pancras London United Kingdom, built in 1868, enveloped the departure and arrival platform had close similarity to the Tanjung Pagar Station, the second building typology, the train shed. Train shed is a structure for shelter, either adjacent to the station building or having roof coverings over the tracks and platform. It may also be an independent building or structure to cover the platform area. Train shed evolved from a simple wooden ring to shed into a long span iron and glass structure used to shelter people and trains. The evolution of train shed can be seen further from the use of materials of the time having modern technology. The first train shed, lean to wall and single structure train shed. The first type of the train shed is lean to wall shed and a single structure train shed. Some of the station building apply the lean to wall or single structure train shed methods, which covers only the platforms. But sometimes both methods were used to apply in one station building. Normally, timber and steel materials were used for the structure. The first wooden train shed were built with timber, timber frame structure incorporating gable ropes and finished with red clay tiles. The structure covers the island platform only and not the overall area. This can be seen in the Taiping station buildings. When steel was introduced, the, the shed were built in both steel and timber. The train shed in Gemma station applied this combination of steel and timber train shed. One of the train shed is placed adjacent to the station building wall and the other is placed on the island platform. This is similar to Ipo station. They are also having a lean to wall train shed and also an island platform train shed. There are also um, examples of the station buildings of Britain, namely Baron Cots and Turnham Green. Station buildings can be given as a matching example. Baron Court Station train shed with steel column and timber panels as covering on its island platform, while Turnham Green Station train shed with steel column and a timber panel as a covering. The second type of the train sheds, the long span train shed. Long span train shed was popularized in the middle of the 19th century whereby many large station buildings started to cover bigger area, which is the platforms and the tracks. The train shed is made of iron, steel, and a glass materials. This development was inspired by the Crystal Palace designed by Jason Paxton at the Great Exhibition London in 1851. This building has given a great impact to large station building designed with innovative features such as curved roofs made of iron and glass application. A large train shed made of steel and glass as a roof covering both platform and railway tracks was applied in the old Kuala Lumpur station buildings. It was the first station building that used such train shed. Later, it was demolished when the new Kuala Lumpur station was built. The old train shed had a double pitch roof from the 1893 pictures of the demolished station building. The material used of might be steel and glass. The, grain, the train shed resembles Preston Railway Station's train shed which was built during 1880 in the United Kingdom. Meanwhile, the new Kuala Lumpur station applied a similar train shed 
which is larger steel frames covering all the platforms. Combination of roof truss system are used. A combination of fin and prat trusses, each having a roof lantern on the top covers of the twin shed and tracks of the station. Kuala Lumpur station was the only station built by the British which having enormous steel and glass train shed. It is like one of the earliest train shed at Garamon Parnas, Paris, which have a similar symmetrical twin arches with a pylon in the middle of the island platform is used. But the composition of the trusses used were different. The trusses of the train shed are a combination of post station, Gara Montparnasse, Paris, and also Manchin Station, Germany, as they apply pitch roof and lantern concept on top of the shed. The third train shed, Butterfly Shed. Butterfly shed known as a butterfly shed because of its upswept wing shaped roof. The butterfly shed can be seen in Luang Station and Tanjung Paga Station. It only covered the platforms. It is more economical compared to the previous train shed in terms of the usage of materials and maintenance wise. At first, it was made from steel, but later, concrete was used. The design of the butterfly shed in Guang Station used a single column and can be seen in New Haven Railroad Station USA and Mahalakshmi Station India. Meanwhile, the, butterf the design of the butterfly train shed in the Tanjung Paga Station used two columns to support the shed. The same butterfly shed can be seen in Manchin East Germany Station. The railway station building started its construction during 1886 by the British and ended somewhere in the middle of the 20th century in 1957. As Malaysia gained its independence throughout the decades, the railway station buildings experienced upgrades and matured into a form that they must last for the next 100 years. Initially built small, the railway station buildings were a key in necessity. The West Coast Main Railway Station building 10 types can be categorized into two main types according to its evolution. One side, the plan which was mostly found on small and medium-sized station buildings and the head house plan found in a morning panther or large-sized station buildings. Meanwhile, the train shed can be divided into three types, the lean to wall shed, the long span train shed and the butterfly shed. From short span to longer span of train shed and later to a much simpler form of shed due to the introduction of the new materials during industrial revolution. Due to the increase in demand of the tin ores and the agriculture product, as well as the population growth, station within there were expanded from medium to large size with added facilities to fulfill the needs of ever-growing population. Thank you very much for your help, uh, Roxana. Thank you. Um, I don't know if the authors I, uh, are here. I just saw Jess uh, from uh, South Africa. It's true. I would like to invite the other authors to. Or we can have the round table, dear Dr. Arno, uh, till I find the other author. Yes, I think uh, Said Mehran is not in because I checked uh, quite a lot uh, the, uh, the author. Uh, yes, the first article was presented. Uh, if you wish, we can have the round table if anyone has a question. Yes. Um, we will go to the next panel. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I saw. Uh, I think Jess is the from is the author for the second presentation yes. in this year, and uh, I would like to ask if uh, anyone has questions for him. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. I don't know if you have something yes. to. Yes, I have a question for for Jesse. Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Um. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I recently I read a, a paper written by Dr. Uh, Rassane on the revitalization. So, uh, but I want to ask this question uh, in relation to the various the previous uh, uh, presentations we have listened to. 
from the perspective of context and uh, the human elements in your study area. What is included in the new proposal for the revitalization of Likoni urban landscape to control over gentrification of the locals and their place identity? Should I come again? Did you hear the question? Come, come again, please. Okay. Um, from the perspective of context and the human elements in your study area, yeah. what is included in the new proposal for the revitalization of Likoni urban landscape to control over gentrification of the locals and the place identity? Okay. That's, that's the question, or, you, or I'm waiting to see if it's done, then I can try and, and give a response. Did you get the question? Yes, I got the question. So uh, basically what uh, we, because uh, we are two authors of the paper, so we are just trying to see what uh, was uh, like, can we take people back to 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 to, to their indigenous uh, uh, like uh, set, setup? Because we are trying to ensure that uh, these people can be sensitized first, and then uh, be able to be accommodated in the same space. Because yes, Likoni has grown, but uh, much as uh, there's growth and uh, there's still space because where the quarries have been taken out, there's too much land that has been left depleted and, and, and unutilized. So in case of uh, a, a particular growth, then these uh, spaces, they are like voids in the, in, the, in, the, in the area. They can still be able to accommodate uh, any sort of uh, population growth. If uh, looking at it from a regenerative uh, point, point of view, just not uh, building, building, building and designing, but uh, just to try and understand how can they use the same area. So there's, uh, to be honest with you, there's no particular plan set aside by let's say uh, the, the, the local government there. But uh, this is just like a conversation, as I said, to spark a conversation that we are trying to see, can this, now the empty empty spots in these areas that uh, have not been utilized, can they be put to good use? It's okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, if this is not captured, uh, I would suggest that since this is happening in Kenya, yeah. uh, uh, you guys you guys should uh, incorporate this into uh, your the the future. Uh, uh, development or evolution of uh, your proposal since it's still at the uh, pre-stage of uh, uh, developing it. Thank you very much. Thank you too for the question. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if anyone have more questions. Uh, I was curious about the case of Algeria. Uh, well, I saw the author was available, but I cannot see her at the moment. Uh, dear uh, Maunira. Probably she missed the connection. Uh, yes, uh, so, so sorry. <laughs> question. Modern times. Yes. <laughs> it's not very easy. Uh, yes. No. And I think the authors for the Malaysia are not here too. Dear Hafiza? No. Okay. Thank you, Jess, for your contributions and thank you for the answer. I'm sorry, but I can't say your name. Yes, it's easier, but the other, <laughs> it was a little bit difficult for me. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think we can start the second block. The first has no video. I don't know if. It, 
also available. I was checking uh, the participants, unfortunately. Uh, I, I can uh, play the second one. Okay. Uh, author is oh, uh, uh, Gino. Yes, they are in. Familiarity with the physical feature of place identity could assist further evaluation of places identity. Uh, the research is about appraisal of place identity through tangible elements of cultural features in urban city, which, ha which has been prepared by the Gino Sushi and Dr. Hasina Nafa. The main keywords of the uh, the research will be place identity, cultural landscape features, tangible elements, and every citadel. The structure of the uh, presentation will be uh, six parts introduction, literature, methodology, case study, analysis, and the uh, last part will be conclusion and recommendation. The problem, main problem statements of the uh, research is the rapid growth of the city with transformation of tra traditional urban spaces has caused a gap between cultural characteristics of urban and their identities. The identity of a particular place emerges from a set of social and cultural characteristics of the related society embodied in the physical forms and shape of the urban area. Uh, the aim of the study is to fortify urban identity and keep it alive throughout the time. This is through the development of a conceptual model focusing on the tangible relationship between the identity of the place and the cultural aspects of the city of Erbil. The main objectives of the study is finding out the tangible elements of the place identity in relation to the urban cultural landscape and then finding out the uh, physical elements of the cultural landscape after that investigation of the, the cultural heritage characteristics of Erbil with the physical indicators of the identity of the place, then examine the relationship among the elements of the place identity and the elements of urban cultural landscape. The main questions of the study is, what are the major quantitative elements to evaluate the identity of a place throughout the cultural landscape, and how historical cultural features can influence the identity of a place, then to what extent the physical cultural features can assess the urban identity of a place. The hypothesis is by interacting and linking the past with the present and the future, the historical cultural landscape provides a sense of identity. The main scope of the study will be, uh, will focus on understanding the relationship between the place identity and cultural features in urban heritage of Erbil. The second part is uh, talking about the urban and place identity, which the appraisal of the urban context value and meaning in the process of the relationship among the physical objective and the material waste of the people's experience in their daily interaction with the urban area surrounding them. And since identity refers to the relationship between the self and the outer environment, researchers have skewed to introduce an objective and comprehensive definition, which is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. Then there is the common elements of urban place identity according to the Ibrahim et al. 2014, which are uh, physical features, activity features, and meaning features. Uh, they have the main elements and the secondary elements, which it will be the base for uh, making the uh, model in our research. And tangible and intangible aspects in the place identity is explained in the in this uh, model uh, with the uh, uh, using eleven references to connect the uh, the tangible and intangible elements and uh, explaining the relationship between uh, uh, each element. The elements of cultural uh, landscape is uh, clarified more in this table uh, uh, in detail and talking about all the aspects and factors of the uh, tangible uh, and intangible, uh, which tangible is physical and intangible and physical. 
Then in the third part methodology, I'm going to explain the uh, methods which uh, uh, have been used in this research. Then uh, pro explaining the proposed model, then clarify the matrix checklist. So the methods will be uh, uh, the conceptual model, developing the conceptual model, then the case study methodology applied, then uh, in the practical part, uh, uh, we worked on the skill of RB, and the analysis concerned of the effects of main cultural tangible components, then the uh, matrix list produced to evaluate the uh, elements. The conceptual uh, model is uh, uh, explained, explained in this table, which is cultural landscape tangible aspects, physical, and it is relation with the place identity, physical, environmental, static, tangible aspects. Uh, clarify the relationship between uh, their factors to uh, be applied, uh, analysis tools and methods to reach the evaluation. Uh, then uh, the matrix list uh, contains the cultural elements which are man-made main elements and natural main elements. And uh, identity elements, we have the land use, layout, and patterns, topography, and self-FKC. And for uh, each of the uh, uh, fact two factors, cultural elements and the identity elements, uh, we put the uh, symbol, for example, X1 uh, to 1 is the con uh, clarifying the connection between the structure and the land use. Then the, uh, uh, the fourth part uh, is the case study, which will be the small uh, introduction about the case study and the reason of choosing the case. Uh, the case study is the Erbil, which is the one of the oldest continuously populated city, which goes back to almost 6,000 years old. Uh, then the uh, citadel will be the main uh, uh, site area which uh, we have been working on, which located in the middle of the Erbil uh, city and uh, has its own identity and characteristic. So uh, the reason of choosing the uh, citadel is uh, it is uh, affection on the development of the shape of Erbil city first through the traditional neighborhood surrounding the citadel and then by much modernized, modernized, modernized extension when distancing from the center core. Uh, according to the new master plan of the airway, the expansion of the airway is uh, going to the northeast. Then the analysis uh, of the case study uh, will be explained, uh, which a cultural landscape of every study acts as a core that has shaped the uh, recent city and the oldest part of it through the proposed model, the assessment has performed with the support of analysis of the development matrix table which it will explain the cultural landscape on the place island. Then the following secondary elements of the place island will be tested by the effect of cultural landscape components. So uh, the uh, land use will be uh, evaluated of Airby, then layout and patternness of the Airby city, then the topography of the citadel, then the self-FKC uh, of the same place will be evaluated. Then uh, we in the matrix we put one is considered for the uh, contribution of the element either positively or negatively, while zero is for the natural or non contribution of the element. In the conclusion, uh, the study concluded that there is a remarkable influence of the citadel on Airbnb identity, and this influence could be increased through the development of some functional activities inside the abandoned area of the study. According to the study, recommended strategies to enhance the identity of Airby through the study of Airby. As a recommendation, development of the specific activities inside the study to increase functional identity. This is through the some strategies like dissembled architectural and design strategies and adaptive reuse to prevent the uh, negative impact on the historical and uh, preserved area. 
Thank you very much. Yes, hello to everybody. Thank you for listening. I'm ready for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. you uh, the questions are in the end of all videos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Sadi Afrin Mujumdar, and my co authors are architect Koshik Shaha and architect Mahinul Haq. The title of our research is An Interpretive Analysis on the Heritage Values and Morphology of Tea Cultural Landscape, a case study on Kakiasura Tea State, Sri Mongol, Bangladesh. Tea is the most widely consumed drink in the world, which is originated in the region encompassing today's Southeast China, Tibet, North Myanmar, and Northeast India. But in this research, we are introducing tea as a cultural landscape, where tea cultural landscape can be identified as a transmuted form of natural landscape, which has evolved with time by setting up a tea industry in the suitable areas and influenced by the activities of the tea community around it. The landscape formation of the tea estate lies on hills or mountain sides. The tea factory is adjacent to the main road, mostly constructed during the colonial era and widened or reconstructed during the post colonial time. The labor community lives next to the tea factory, while some other labor houses are scattered throughout the plantation to enable greater estate efficiency. Livers often grow paddy beside their land by their shelters. They use the waters from the nearest chorus, and gradually, by the development of the tea states, the livers get to build their community spaces at a central location of tea state. The staff quarters or bungalows are located at the higher elevation than the plantation terrace. From the literature review, it is understood that cultural landscape always contains some cultural values and values can be described by the several typologies such as historic, scientific, social, aesthetic, spiritual, and symbolic, etc. The study area is Kakiaswar Tea Garden, which is located at Sumongol and popularly known as the tea capital of Bangladesh. The key aim of this research are to showcase and promote the existing natural and cultural setting of tea garden areas and to provide a future management guideline for cultural landscape conservation. To achieve this broad goal, we are proposing a methodology that is analyzing the connection between the existing tea trails and the heritage value elements by identifying the value elements, categorizing them according to the value typologies, and developing a network. As a result, we are proposing a route or network of the most highlighting features of tea garden. All the data were collected by on-site survey and user interview of 100 people from the local community and visitors and 50 people from the administrative sector. As the result of the physical survey, a map was prepared which is showing the identified heritage resources around the study area. Among them, here are some prominent features such as the tea factory, chara or natural channels, Rubber Garden, Bhanga Pahar and the nearest forest area, tea plantation area and Najkar, which is the central community space of a tea state. The map and the graph are prepared by the audience perception analysis regarding the heritage resources containing aesthetic values. According to the graph, Najkar is the most prominent cultural element that has aesthetic values. And in the other natural elements, the tea plantation area and the existing tea trails were identified as the most popular aesthetic feature of tea gardens. Here is the findings regarding the history values. The graph shows majority of the green structures in tea state settlements provide a strong connectedness with the pastimes of British colonial period. The unique architectural styles of Najkar, the bungalows, the factories reveals the origins of the present forms. 
Religious sensitivity is an identical characteristic in the tea community people. In almost every house, they usually have a small temple, even though their living space is too small. In some cases, their sense of spirituality and rituals are closely connected to nature. They are often seen to worship the natural elements like tree, water, animals, etc. During their marriage ceremonies, they arrange some rituals using the water of Chara. The central community space brings their diversified cultural identity and group values into a single platform. The tea factory and the community living area are the core features of tea estate settlements which contribute to make the whole system socially sustainable. Here is the symbolic values analyzed by the audience perception study. In Kake Chorti Garden, the community has not only deleted their individual identity largely by practicing a common language, but they also have started celebrating a host of common festivals into the co common cultural platform Natskar that conveys the meanings and information of the community and asserts their cultural individuality and make them socially sustainable. From the graph, it can be understood that the tea factory can be considered as the most important scientific element that pulls together the whole system of a tea state area. The historic bill forms along with the tea garden is an important source of scholarly study. Extensive research is needed for its further development. This article analyzes and studies the heritage values of tea cultural landscape of Kalkeshwar Tea Garden as an example of interpreting heritage values which are worthy of preservation and exploitation. As an outcome, we can get a basic picture and description of the spatial structure of tea ester settlements and the common heritage values that we may find in the other tea esters as well. This is a preliminary study about tea cultural landscape and more research is needed to conduct about this. Therefore, the achievements of the study can highlight the importance of protecting this valuable heritage as well as refine and upgrade the system of conservation of the linear cultural landscape. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Tarek. I'm assistant professor at the architecture department at the Faculty of Engineering, Cairo University. I am presenting my publication entitled Enhancing Biophilia as a Restorative Design Approach in Egyptian Gardens. The presentation agenda includes six points. Introduction, theoretical background, biophilia and requirements of restoration, methods, results, and discussion, then conclusion. The introduction starts by the significance of this research, which is understanding the relationship between biophilic design and its restrictive impact, and identifying the impact of different gardens' characteristics forms, uh, which hasn't been investigated sufficiently in terms of stress reduction. That's why the research aims at identifying restrictive effects of different biophilic design elements in gardens. The research studies the hypothesis that Restorative experience in gardens differs according to its characteristics in terms of area and biophilic design elements and the context. That's why it answers two main questions. How could biophilia principles enhance restrictiveness in public gardens? And to what extent do biophilic design principles are applied in Egyptian gardens to achieve stress restoration? The research methodology combines both qualitative and quantitative approaches to understand and read the relationship between biophilic design and restrictive effects in gardens. Starts by the theoretical background, aiming at determining the relationship between biophilic design elements and enhancing public health through reducing stress and mental fatigue. This could be achieved through reviewing the historical background of nature restrictive powers, theories related to restrictive effects of nature, stress restriction, then concluding the relationship between biophilic design elements and the stress restriction. Then the empirical study aiming at investigating the restrictive effects of biophilic design elements in three gardens in Cairo by identifying different biophilic design indicators by visual analysis and field survey and exploring the restrictiveness of nature by measuring the perceived restrictiveness scale, then the findings of the field study, conclusion recommendations and future research. 
theoretical background starts by reviewing several theories that were developed to prove the restrictive potential of nature, like theory of biophilia, prospect refuge theory, stress reduction theory, attention restriction theory, theory of supportive garden. This research mainly focused on theory of biophilia and the attention restriction theory. Theory of biophilia starts by defining the term itself, which is the passionate love of life and the living things. It focuses on biophilic elements and its great benefits for people, like stress reduction, boosting creativity, and increasing productivity. Then principles of biophilia were reviewed and identified, and its different patterns, they were summarized in 11 principles showing how to integrate biophilia in design. Elements of biophilic design were also investigated, identified, and categorized in six categories. And there are 71 elements coded from B1 to B71. The elements were used in the empirical study with this code. The attention restriction theory focuses on restrictive benefits of nature that overcome mental fatigue, which negatively impact people and their attention capabilities. It focuses mainly on the direct attention and the spontaneous attention of human mind. It introduces four requirements of restriction, being away, fascination, extent, compatibility, and it analyzes and identifies how it could be achieved through different physical and mental features of, and the impacts of natural settings, how these all work together to hold attention, both direct and spontaneous, to achieve restoration. In the light of nature, contribution to health and well-being restoration could be considered as a result of biophilic principles integration with the design process. Accordingly, it's possible to identify the likely relationship between biophilic principles mentioned and the restrictive requirements. The four requirements of restoration in this table are represented in four columns and the 11 principles of biophilic design are represented in the rows and this is the likely relationship between both. This is how to achieve being a way through the 11 principles of biophilic design. Same for the other three requirements of restoration. Methods and procedures starts by identifying the investigation objectives, the research limitations, multiple techniques of data gathering, the analysis of the collected data and the results and findings. The selected gardens are typically used for recreational purposes. The three gardens were selected in Cairo, Egypt, easily accessible, different areas, different contexts, and the different levels of services were represented in the three selected gardens. The Azhar Park is one of Cairo's largest parks, located in the heart of historic Cairo. It lies on the top small hill, offering magnificent view for its users. Its area is 71 fadans, representing the largest area in this study. International Garden is located in Nasser city area. It has a variety of plants and flowers, which is brought from foreign countries. That's why it's called international. It also includes a small zoo inside it. It represents a medium area in this research study, 47 for dance. The Hooray Garden is located in Zamalek Island, across from Carl Opera House, known for the presence of 11 stages for people who had made positive major contributions for their countries. And this garden, representing in this study, is a small area, 7.5 for done. The study was conducted at the end of winter and the beginning of spring. The gardens were visited in random days and in random order. The three gardens had the same amounts of visits. The questionnaire results were analyzed using SPSS software to calculate Cronbach Alpha to measure the reliability and consistency of the survey answers and the different mean scores for the different items in the perceived restrictive scale. The study sample consisted of 180 participants, 60 participants in each garden, representing both genders, males and females, representing different age groups. Participants were asked to rate their current mood after staying in the park for 25 to 30 minutes on scale from 1 to 10. One represents very sad mood, five represent neutral mood, ten represent extremely happy mood. All ratings started from five, and Al Azhar Park scored the largest percentage of an average happy mood. Then comes the International Garden and Al Hari Garden. The visual analysis of the physical site helped in documenting the existence and condition of different biophilic design elements. The tables are presenting the existence and the different conditions of each of the biophilic design elements in the three gardens. Al Azhar Park showed the majority and the highest percentage of existence and variety of biophilic design elements, 
Most of the elements are in very good and cool condition. International gardens showed 76%. The Horea garden showed 58%. The three gardens were analyzed using the proposed interrelationship matrix between biophilic principles and four requirements of restoration. The results of mapping this relationship highlight the potential of each of the biophilic principles and the, uh, achieving restoration in the three gardens. al Azhar Park and International Gardens achieved 87% of restoration requirements, while Iharia Garden achieved 77% of uh, restoration requirements uh, with the help of the biophilic principles and patterns. It's clearly noticed that the richness of biophilic design elements uh, give higher contribution to achieve the four requirements of restoration. Water feature and wildlife offer the new experience of being away and fascination, which appear to be stronger in Al Azhar Park and Ahare Garden based on the visual survey. On the other hand, the form and structure of the garden contributed to its extent and comfortability, which appeared in the three gardens at the same. Perceived restorative scale based on the attention restoration theory is conducted to measure restorative impact of the selected gardens. It measures the four requirements of restoration on scale from zero to six. Zero means not at all, six means agree completely. 26 items are identified to measure users' perception for the restorative factors for each of the four requirements of restoration of the attention restoration theory. The overall mean of perceived restorativeness turned out to be 3.57 for Al Azhar Park, 4.4 for International Garden, and 3.46 for, for the Al Haria Garden. Mean and standard deviation for each of the 26 items were calculated for the three gardens, and the mean scores for the four requirements of restoration were also calculated for each of the three gardens. PRS mean scores for the four requirements of restoration were close to each other in the three gardens. However, the international gardens showed high scores than the other two gardens. Recalling the tested hypothesis and comparing the three case studies, in terms of area biophilic elements, Al Azhar Park showed the larger area, the biophilic elements with good contribution and good quality but medium restorativeness. International garden showed medium area good contribution of biophilic elements and a high restorativeness. al Hare Garden is the least in both area and biophilic elements with medium restorativeness. It was similar to al Azhar Park. This could be explained due to further factors like diversity in user activities and in the user typologies as well. That was clearly noticed in al Azhar Park and not in al Hare Garden and the International Garden. This caused distraction and it impacts their being away and fascination. Moreover, large area and different zones impact the extent and compatibility requirement of restoration in El Azhar Park. The study concludes identifying the likely contribution of biophilic design elements and perceived restorativeness, the introduction of biophilic outlook for designing restorative gardens. However, it's important to consider area and design characteristics in addition to context in the design process. The study points directives for future research investigating the impact of biophilic design elements and principles on connectedness to nature, investigating the impact of biophilic design elements and principles on perceived restorativeness in more specialized gardens, like the healing gardens. In the end, I would like to thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, all the authors are here or not? Or only Zeno? Uh, yes, I think they are in, uh, Doctor. I was checking when Zeno was in. And uh, I check even. Maybe I I invite the authors to turn uh, on the, the cameras to, if anyone has any questions to. Uh, not maybe question. Uh, the one thing I, I I want to ask from Gino because the last slide uh, was the question Gino. Uh, the one uh, issue was that since uh, the condition of the castle, which is I don't know whether Gino is in or Dr. Hasina. 
dear Gino. Uh, anyway, the question was regarding the um, castle, since uh, I couldn't really understand whether uh, uh, it uh, has the um, uh, it has uh, the uh, they they reuse it the interior condition of the castle they reuse it or, uh, or uh, the condition because uh, he was using the word of adaptive reuse and then uh, telling that it is not in a good condition uh, that's why I, I was a bit confused whether it was reused but not an appropriate function. Uh, to the uh, to the castle, uh, th that is the uh, question mark in my mind. I wanted to ask from Gino. Anyway, uh, and uh, one issue it was quite interesting because Sarah Tarek was talking about uh, because one of the keynote speech was also talking uh, the Dr. Ihab El Ziadi as well. Today was talking about uh, the. Um, uh, performance of the biophilic design in order to bring the indoor thermal comfort. And now uh, Sarah is talking about bringing the um, biophilic uh, um, uh, in uh, enhancing the uh, landscape, which was even curiously we could see in case of uh, um, the student, uh, which was the case of uh, tea culture landscape. This was the, uh, the interesting the case uh, that they were uh, evaluating. And uh, curiously, it was not just about uh, cultural landscape, but in fact, it was also the community driven uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the morphology itself. Uh, Thank you. No question. It was just the only comment that I wanted to. Uh, Thank you. To... Sarah is here too. I don't know if anyone wants to. No. Has anyone else a question? Please. No. Well, can I comment, please? Yes, yes. please. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Roxana, for your uh, comments. Um, actually, uh, uh, bio, the theory of biophilia uh, could be applied on different scales, the interior scale and the exterior one. And um, like uh, it was presented um, at the first uh, slide of the theoretical part, uh, they are, there are several theories related to um, a restorative impact of nature and the healing effects of nature and uh, the therapeutic effects of nature. Of course, this is the bigger umbrella. And um, actually, uh, the theory of biophilia is quite interesting because uh, it has been uh, deeply investigated uh, through the previous strong literature uh, from different uh, uh, great authors and um, they uh, um, applied uh, like different elements on the very uh, different levels. And this was very beneficial for the research uh, I presented, but unfortunately not the three cases uh, were selected were cultural landscapes. In fact, uh, only an other part is uh, in a historic uh, context, is attached to a historic context, the context of historic Cairo um, uh, in Egypt. And um, it was more related to uh, enhancing the, uh, the urbanism, the compact urban areas, you know, uh, with all the dense population and the pollution and the negative environmental impact. Uh, that was uh, the main objective of uh, how to reduce stress uh, related uh, to these negative issues in the urban, uh, contemporary urban community not right now. Uh, so uh, this is um, like more elaboration for uh, our extension for what you uh, thankfully contributed, Doctor. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very interesting study. And um, the bio, uh, bio, uh, biophilic design could be also coordinated with a co, uh, a co creation or co, co participative design. And I think that uh, it result, uh, could have very, very good results. Uh, I don't know if anyone. Uh, Gino, I can see Gino here, but I don't know here. 
as you know, could hear my voice. No, probably. No, he, he has already talked in the end of the presentation, but now probably something happened. Oh, yes. he's here. Uh, yes, dear Gino, we cannot hear your voice, by the way. Hello, I can. No, I can. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, Gino, it's... Sorry for the internet problem. Uh, uh, the question was, uh, since you were in the... It was uh, near to the last slide, you were showing the condition of the castle. Okay. Uh, exterior, and then questioning the interior part, which was not in a good condition. Uh, yes. Uh, what What is the uh, interior condition of the building? Is it going to be used? Because you uh, you yes. use the keyboard of adaptive reuse. I don't know whether yes. uh, adaptive reuse means uh, well. Uh, the, yes. The... Uh, yes. Yes, please. Actually, Doctor Roxana, I can explain like this: uh, the uh, inside the citadel is uh, now abandoned. Uh, it's like 10 years, before 10 years, before the economic crisis in Iraq, the UNESCO decided to, ad to uh, uh, restore and uh, revitalize and uh, rehabilitate the area. Uh, after that, the ISIS uh, war happened in the Iraq and the economic crisis and the petrol uh, price uh, uh, became down. Then uh, the revitalization is stopped, the adaptive reuse. It has a different type of the restoration. So it, uh, it stopped it till now. Uh, the area is abandoned now. So uh, in my uh, research, we were thinking about the sale of investors to not only the big waiting for the big budget from the government to uh, make it the adaptive reuse. If we uh, uh, use same like the, uh, uh, for example, some countries that they are doing by giving directly to the investors to uh, give the life again to that area will be better. This that was my recommendation. Yes, because it has to be with the genus loci. It's a, a Latin expression for the spirit of the place, isn't it? Exactly. I think that center is uh, is a really must have a, a, a spirit or a, and I think exactly. it's very interesting that. Yes, in the beginning of the slide is also I showed the contemporary area of the air bill. So this spirit of the place is not ex, uh, ex, uh, exceeding in that new contemporary area. It is looking that another comp uh, another city and it looks that you. Uh, travel it to a modern city. So I want to make balance between this old area and the new area. Okay. Yeah, by affecting the identity of the citadel to the modern area of Erbil, even. According to the new rules of the uh, post-modernization and the, uh, I don't know, contemporary architecture stylist, that things. In your presentation, you talk about a conceptual model. Sorry? In your presentation, you talk about a conceptual model to, to use yes. in, the, in the study. And yes. do you think you, can, uh, you could use the same, the same mo uh, conceptual model in other cities or just in circle, uh, circle of cities? Yeah, it is check, checking list uh, for sure. I plan it to, uh, to uh, do such a uh, standard and to uh, do such a, a list that could use for any city that have the same case of the Arabic, for sure. Because according to the sources, I built the, uh, the, the, you know, the international sources, I use it to be used it in other cities. Not only the local sources are used for constructing the model. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. For... Any more questions or 
comments, not questions, just comments. <laughs> no? Thank you very much, Rox. I Thank think you. we, can, you, we can start. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind patience. Thank you. Today, I will be talking about the role of Mimalik magazine in historicizing tourism architecture in Turkey in between 1963 to 1980. The ongoing coronavirus pandemic affected many aspects of everyday life everywhere in the world. Global mass tourism also had to pause without knowing when it will be back in full scale. Many of the tourist businesses and sites have lost their functions as well as social and economic means. This process also revealed the scale and amount of the spaces in use of this mass industry, now disused due to lockdowns and travel restrictions. What is now revealed is a grandiose spectacle without its anticipated audience. Investigations on the history of tourism may also help to visualize how this major transformation occurred in a rather short period of time in world's history. Today's tourist is no different than the pre-19th century traveler, as traveling in the modern era is no more an elite privilege as it used to be. Tourism may be one of the oldest cultural industries since when British entrepreneur Thomas Cook launched the first package tours with the expansion of railway technology in mid-19th century. Soon, in Europe and in USA, more and more people were mobilized to see new places in parallel to the advancement of transportation technologies with cars and aeroplanes. The hotel was another feature of the travel industry, which had to be adapted to the rising demand of the mobilized masses. 1960s were thus called the golden age of mass tourism. Starting in this period, package tours, sightseeing, paid vacations, recreation, hotel change, resort towns, beaches, and many related concepts were introduced into the shared material culture of the modern societies. This, according to Ellen Furlow, was also connected with the new understanding of the relationships between leisure, vacation, politics in modern societies, where paid vacation was seen as a legal right of citizenship by the late 1930s. The formation and proliferation of a new uh, sites and itineraries for traveling is commonly linked to the special expansion of the mass consumerist culture. The expectation of having new experiences in places providing shade standards of comfort and services seem to have created a world of similarities with slight differences in the end. John Uri has named it as the tourist gate, which pro proposed a new way and shared way of seeing and experiencing the world as a socially organized and systematized yet dynamic reality. The transformation of the Mediterranean countries into a whole chain of sunny beaches, classical heritage and resort towns is part of this rich history. Started with the shores of Spain, Italy and France, the Mediterranean tourism gradually moved southwest and the east so that countries like Greece, Yugoslavia, Turkey and Egypt started to become alternative destinations for the mass exodus to the south to the south by the 1960s and 70s. This also necessitated the building of a standard tourist infrastructure merged into the mutual economic and cultural system of the mass tourism industry. The official and political programs and actions of the same period also need to be described briefly. The 1960s for Turkey is marked as the period of planned economic development following the coup d'etat of 1960. The state planning organization, DPT, was also founded in 1960 and initiated five-year plans in 1963 according to the economic, social, and cultural goals of the government. In these plans, tourism had been designed as a priority industry for development, and much of the financial investments were made in the field. 
This was a shift from more liberal economic policies in 1950s where both the state and the private enterprise were active agents of the already started touristic development. The building of Istanbul Hilton Hotel in 1955 under financial support of the Turkish government marked the path and the process of internationalization in that manner. Later, the 1950s plans on tourism marked by singular iconic hotel buildings in big cities had shifted to 1960s visions of large-scale investments constituting hotel chains. Also, the 1961 constitution recognized the right for expropriating coastal lands or transferring to investors. Along with these macro-scale strategies, the Aegean and Mediterranean coastal regions were planned to comprise a new network of resort towns and hotels, holiday villages and archaeological sites, all to be at easy access for the tourists with a main highway system. Based on this background information, in this paper I aim to focus to the shores of Turkey and revisit their process of becoming new vacation scapes of international mass tourism in the 1960s and 70s through the lens of the Nimarlık magazine. Nimarlık is the official magazine of the Chamber of Architects of Turkey in line with its political and professional perspective, which started to be published every two months in 1963, nine years after the Chamber was founded. Stated in the Constitution, the Chamber of Architects works for the interest of public, so public and society and responsible for regulating the architectural profession while registration to the Chamber was compulsory for practicing architects. The journal was sent to the members of the Chamber without any charge, and the journal st still continues this policy and entertains its long and systematic publication life and large audience. The role of Mimari for not only recording, representing, and reflecting the current field of practice and theory, but also for its critical engagement with this field as an actor, needs to be highlighted. And here you can see the tourism section of the initial uh, Mimari issues. In 1963, when Mimari entered the field of architectural publication, Architect has been the only journal with a long publication life, besides few other publications with rather short durations. And in a very short period of time, Nimarlik provided a new discursive field, visible and accessible for the expanding community of Turkish architects, and being free from commercial constraints also provided relative independence for the editorial committee. Based on a chronological ordered systematic survey of the Neymarlik issue starting from 1963, here I propose to investigate themes brought to life by the magazine related with the transformation taking place in the coastal areas for mass tourism. And starting in 1963, the new editor of Neymarlik has announced the introduction of a new thematic layout for the magazine, Hence, the interior tourism section, as we have seen earlier in the slides, was removed and the black cover page was replaced with a more socially engaged content and a new and powerful graphic language. The five-year plan period started in 1963 as a national strategy, till it was abandoned in 1983, provided continuous statistical information, projections for the future, and hard facts to discuss and rationalize the plans for economic development. And in line with this national uh, context, problems of efficiency in housing, solutions to informal housing, and demand for new master plans and new strategies on housing comprise the core of the themes published in the market. And despite changing perspectives of the authors, if I generalize, the 1960s was a period of optimism and hope, believing plans, numbers, graphics, tables, and strategies of, of regional development and new important areas. And according to the plans of this plan period, not only the foreign tourists, but also 
local tourists were in targets. And major goal was providing a country-wide mobility to experience the natural fields and archaeological sites and provide new employment fields. And since this protection provided a new and developing field of architectural practice, architects seem eager to be involved in the process of transforming the country into a favorable tourist destination among its rivals in the Mediterranean, like Spain and Yugoslavia. The 1965 was the most optimistic year or golden year of tourism because there's almost 80% increase in number of foreign visitors, uh, almost doubling its numbers. According to the ideal scheme, Turkey would be hosting more than 4 million tourists in 1972 with 50% annual increase in foreign visitors and 10% in locals. And this meant the total number of beds had to be doubled from 1966 to 1972. In 1966, tourism plans for Denizli, Pamukkale, Kuşadapısı and Efes were completed while Antalya and Chukurova were in progress. Yet, according to these sources, most popular tourist destinations then were Istanbul and the Marmara region, and due to their convenience in transportation and lodging facilities. At the end of the 1960s, a specific event, the International City Planning Competition, seems to be a critical point in the history of historic strategic development in tourism. The first prize of the competition was given to the Turkish office, whereas many problems occurred during its actualizations. Following the 1971 military memorandum and the constitutional changes, the Chamber of Architects took politically active role against it with a strong language. The role of foreign architecture and planning offices in the process appears as a very problematic issue in the local discourse. The articles discuss how the state intervention caused unfair competition in the touristic investments and how the native architects were excluded both from the planning and the building processes. There were two special issues on tourism published in 1964 and 75, and former had the hope and provided recommendations, whereas the letter presented the disappointments and rigor on the ex executions by the state causing vast failures in tourism. The shores were occupied by land speculators causing privatization and class segregation in the end of the implemented tourism strategy. And this, we should lean on our own power campaign, expose the con contradictions of the large uh, scale projects commissioned to foreign offices. The campaign had a particular graphic language with handwritten text, large scaled arrows, ex exclamation marks, and newspaper titles for reflecting the public opinion, noticeably represent represented resentment and anger of the architects. And another issue of Neymarlik in 1976, Seeing the Shores, discussed the privatization of the coasts and their exclusion from the public use. And in 1976, according to the OECD sources, Turkey was the second country, country from the bottom in tourism revenues above Canada. And holiday villages built on lands provided by the state and designed by foreign offices were owned by international hotel chains and they were criticized for creating islands of isolation, even called ghettos. And the 1980s started with another political turbulence caused by another coup d'etat and constitution, while the 1970s ended with a huge disappointment for the architects. To conclude, Mass tourism brought many changes and transformation in the country, especially at the coast. Through Mimarlik magazine, it was possible to see this change not only through buildings and projects, but also see the actors involved or excluded. Mimarlik revealed how the complexity of tourism, 
as a myth or illusion of national development, or else the space of opportunities and discontent for actors with diverse roles. Thank you for listening. Thank you, it was very interesting. interesting. Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write uh, I'm very sorry, by the way, I wasn't here uh, when it started. <laughs> sorry, we, we also uh, started a bit late. Yes, you are right, we should wait. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was in another session, so I just came and I saw myself <laughs> yeah. on the screen. A very deep study. Um, I was even waiting to continue, even till this moment. What happened? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, uh, let's go to the next. Hello, Professor. Uh, this is Sadia Frim Mojumdar. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, I, I was also not pre uh, present during my presentation. Um, so, so uh, is there any questions or any comments about my presentation? Uh, thank you to, for telling us. Uh, yes, uh, we will ask us after these two uh, presentations, we will ask the question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hi everyone, and welcome to my presentation. I am Najla Juma Al Gabor. I'm a student, a master student at Okan, Istanbul Okan University. With advisor assessed Prof. Dr. Oskon Arin. My research about speak about study of culture space interaction in Istanbul Katana Corset District. The aim of, of the study, the aim of this research is to make a study on different, on different culture that is seen in Katana Corset District and City of Istanbul, as well as the different environment and the diff difficult nature of the, of the place that led to the lack of information, interaction of Eurasian society in relation with Arab urban open space. Analyzes history of Katana taught historical and present side picture to understand the historical value uh, of that district more clearly. Research question. Does culture has a fact on the usage uh, of urban open space spaces? Are there difference between Arab communities living in Istanbul in terms of their public open space use? Are Arab communities living in Istanbul able to adapt to social life in Katana Gorsain? This lies limit of the study. The study of concluded concluded on the urban side of Istanbul Katana district. Case study area it shows chosen as Gorse district, which is located near of Katana River and Park. Methodology methodology of the study is composed with descriptive approach included and question a questionnaire the survey contents of 72 multiple chosen choose question and a five point legal scale response uh, the results are analyzed towards 
set a scale analyze with the quantitative research method approach proxy and k square test the research problem are decided with focus on on field phases and um, and interview and the question uh, here i have a reference from work uh, reference from work i have tropical bath and critical bath In case study area, Gorsen District, Gatana is region, is a region in Istanbul, Turkish, formerly a working class area. It has become one of the large rail, rail assist development, development areas in the city. The area is on the European side and stretches the shores of genders that follows Invo the Golden Horn, uh, Sandros Villa Ali is surrounded by Sarair, Eyo, Shishli, Bakhtash, and Pio Oglo district. Here in this slice, the map of Katana Gorse district. Physical analysis of district. The physical analysis has been performed of uh, to Katana Gorsel district, which is located in, in Istanbul, Turkey. The analysis includes topography, regular ground, building type, transportation, green area. Topography analysis, the train of Katana district. Topography maps are, uh, are maps that show that there the three terms dimension of any specific point, meaning that they clearly all points uh, in terms of terrain, height or horizontal projections of any natural or industrial landmark. Located. Wait in the area. Finger ground analysis. According to finger, to finger ground analysis, it can be inferred that Corsair District has a dis densely uh, constructed space in comparison with its non-built spaces. Building type analysis. Here I have resident building and res uh, uh, Gorset district consists of uh, resident building, resident complex, convert building, education building, hotels, health center, build, uh, health center, building area, green area and bar Transportation analysis. Uh, according to transportation analysis, the transportation system in Gorsi District and converted off Main Street that by red color and secondary street that is by orange color, I was the street uh, by yellow color. In addition, there are seven parking area in Gorsi District. Gorsi District has significant green area potential in terms of parking, but according to site observation is in found that only some of them area activity used. Uh, survey, survey re result. The usage of open space affected the urban culture of those residents in Gorset District. In this result, this diagram shows the most visited park uh, 
uh, value for agents. For agents, it, uh, it is included <coughs> that firstly, Mahmoud was the park, and secondly, Narges Park is the most preferred green. <coughs> this gram show, this gram show the impression of the Arab community about the living in Katana and the Gorsa district. According to, to the, this result, it seems that Libyan and Syria mostly agree to try speaking with Turkish residents. Most, most region try to communicate, communicate it with, the, with the Turkish systems without exchange by trying to speak the Turkish language with them. <clears throat> Most of our community interested, interested with the Turkish people and public places mostly in bars. Conclusion, different culture have effect on adaptation process of the Arab communities from the perspective of user perspective and public space. According to side abstract observation and interviews, is it found that Arab communities gain habits such as sharing their lesser time of public space, open spaces in Gorsa district between themselves to socialize. And here reference and thank you so thank you for listening. Thank you. Can we go to Rafi Ahmed? Hopefully he is in. Yes, I can see him. Very good. Hello everyone, this is... Hello everyone, this is Rafi Ahmed with Architect Koshik Shah from Shah Jalal University of Science and Technology, Sidi, Bangladesh. We are here to talk about spatial conservation planning for ecologically critical water heritage of Bangladesh. Our discussion starts here in eastern region of Bangladesh, a city named Kumilla, which has quite a rich history and higher tradition and civilization flourished from ages. The city was always been a center of trading from the very beginning of its existence. One of the oldest highways of Indian subcontinent, the Grand Trunk Road, passes through this city. It was mentioned as the gateway of Northeast India before the partition of 1947. Kumila has a long history that is closely linked to the natural configuration of the topography. To facilitate the local habitat with mineral water, Dharmashagar founded by the Tripura's king, first Dharma Manikko in 1458 AD, which is considered as one of the earliest evidences of urban water heritage of Bangladesh. Since the establishment, this water body has been the center of the social and economic growth of the city. For the last few decades, like all other major cities of Bangladesh, Kumila has been facing the problem of deterioration of its unique historical element caused by rapid unplanned development, which harms the primordial urban fabric and character of the city. This research aims to evaluate the applied urban conservation strategies and policies for Dharmashagar to preserve the heritage while maintaining socio-cultural, socio-economical and environmental aspects of its users. The primary aim of this study is to identify cultural and natural significant elements which requires preservation and finding the points of restoration according to the user preference and as the city desires. This research is based on a brief physical survey in the study area. Two types of survey techniques were used survey and questionnaire based user interviews. Through the survey, two types of relevant inter information were collected, physical characteristics of the key and surroundings and 
perception of the users. The interview is carried out among people of different ages and professions, including local inhabitants and passerbys to collect information about the Dih and its surroundings. Study summarized by providing a sustainable conservation plan for the Dharmashagur Dihi and the surrounding environment, which includes land use analysis of the Dihi surrounding, socio-cultural aspects, economic and local factors, and ecological connectivity. Dharmashagur is a man-made water body founded in 1458 AD, which has a bold rectangular shape with an area of 23 acre. For the last few decades, these water body has been facing the problem of deterioration of its unique character caused by rapid unplanned development. From the beginning, the central recreational zones of the city were developed based on the east bank of this water body. By the time which was divided and converted into a stadium and central Itka. The North Bank can be defined as the administrative territory of the city. A walkway which is developed beside the West Bank is the only public open space of the city. The South Bank is completely blocked by the private residential blocks. Unplanned in development and interventions backface maximum peripheral areas of the site. From the beginning, Dharmashagur is the center of several cultural and religious activities. Over time, these activities were changed their shape. Several public institutions developed without any consideration. There have some infrastructure which, which were built during the British Raj, which have lost connection towards the water body over time. The economic growth of an area depends on its accessibility, proper placemaking of commercial or other amenities, and prevention of existing problems. From the physical survey and user interview, we tried to understand and find the way to develop a fluent accessibility network that will complement to find proper drainage and water retention system. As the Dharmashagor is a massive blue infrastructure standing for the last six decades, it holds an ecological system of its own. By the time, it has been disrupted in many ways. Here, we tried to find out the existing ecological patches which may conserve and connect it through some ecological corridors and tools to restore their significance. This water body holds approximate 1.5 kilometer periphery, which is connected to several individual neighborhoods. As this holds the only public space of the city, we tried to maximize the area of it Existing historical landscapes are preserved. Public amenities are placed to satisfy the activities of these public spaces. The small local business based around the Dihi is not planned or coordinated, resulting in loss of potential growth. Pathways and drainage network has been proposed to improve and connect the commercial zones with their surrounding public activities and local stakeholders. Some distinct layers were determined by analyzing the survey data. The elements of creating a biodiverse system are present but scattered and waning. By protecting and improving the present condition and connecting them with proposed tools and policies, sustained biodiversity has made an effort. The proposal intended to provide a guideline for future spatial uses of Dihi surrounding. The preliminary design framework ensures multipurpose use of this Dihi surrounding, which protects the cultural and ecological values. The framework considers a minimal footprint in the existing landscape based on three clusters of intervention, which will facilitate local neighborhood and general users. The proposed sections are showing the generative responses towards the water body, considering neighborhood needs, public desire, environmental factors, and obviously historical significances. In the design proposal, Biodiverse areas will be protected by creating a green network. Each point of intervention has been identified and carefully analyzed to determine their specific environmental conditions, user base, and traffic volume. This study analyzes the socio-cultural, socio-economical, and ecological values of Dhammashagor and its surroundings, which are worthy of preservation and exposition. 
As an outcome, we can evaluate the scopes of sustainable development, a summarized description of the spatial structure of a dihi and the common heritage values that we may find in the other water heritage as well. The achievement of the study not only helped to realize the importance of protecting this valuable water heritage, but also serve as a sustainable solution. Thank you, Pion. Thank you very much for all presentations. Roxanne, well, I don't know if you want to start it. Uh, yes, actually, uh, well, maybe not uh, our question, but in fact, uh, the, the way that uh, Dr. Gopsun uh, was um, evaluating the, uh, the case of a Mimolic magazine uh, and uh, the influence uh, which the magazine was in fact not uh, talking about the theory, uh, the practice, however, it is also uh, criticism, uh, especially in case of uh, coastal zone, which was uh, in a period of time was going to be designed, uh, privatized for the, per for the touristic purpose. It was um, curiously interesting. Uh, not uh, in, in the coastal zone because we are living in Alanya. However, in north of Cyprus, uh, we were seeing these kind of uh, privatization of the coastal zone uh, to the uh, uh, touristic purposes. And, uh, and uh, in, in, in that way, the way that you did those chronological studies of the influence of uh, a magazine, Mimalik mag architecture magazine to, uh, uh, the, and their influence, it was qu uh, quite interesting work. And thank you very much for the effort. Thank you very much for the comment. I saw it was very interesting too, because here in, I'm from Portugal and we have the same, <laughs> the same hill <laughs> of tourism and uh, uh, it, this, the process was very similar here. Um, so uh, I think the, using the magazine to, to make the chronology was very, very interesting. Th thank you very much for, for, uh, for your presentation. It, I think it was very, very interesting. Thank I don't you very if, much. If anyone has um, questions or something that wants to share with us, yes, please, Salar. Salar, is yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask uh, uh, Rafi Ahmed about uh, his uh, presentation in Bangladesh. Uh, I wonder if uh, if these uh, uh, water bodies. Uh, he considered them as a cultural landscape or a herat heritage uh, cultural landscape or what exactly? What is the, uh, what is the function of these uh, places in his uh, research? Actually, uh, this, uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. We are listening. Uh, this uh, water body was uh, act as a, reser uh, a water reservoir for a certain time when it was established. Uh, but uh, last uh, 200 years or this time, the, this uh, water body is acting as a public open space. It is connected to several uh, neighborhoods uh, surrounding them, surrounding of it. Uh, uh, Um, yes. I didn't hear the answer. I don't know. It is my, uh, the problem with me or with uh, him. I don't know. I think it's a problem with the internet, prob uh, probably. I can't. Uh, I can can connect. Hello. Yes, we can hear you here, Rafi, if you uh, can. 
Yeah, this was a good question, dear Tavar, since uh, in the book of um, Afrin, uh, if I'm not yeah. pronunciation. Uh, yes, in that work, uh, it was quite interesting that uh, those uh, T, uh, it was defined directly uh, T cultural landscape. Uh, and uh, the cultural landscape, it was also the community as well, uh, which was. Uh, which uh, in that study we were yes uh, Rafi is here maybe he can again answer your question I was missing something Ravi, uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Can you can you answer uh, again because we couldn't uh, catch up with your answer last time? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I missed something. Um, as I as I see uh, the these uh, water bodies, uh, and as you said, it is. Now we miss him. Yes. Cultural landscape in your in your thesis in your paper, or what do you consider it? I missed again. Sorry. Uh, here, Salabi, Dr. Salar, we couldn't hear the voice from your side clearly. Would you please again repeat the question? So, uh, I will write down the question. I will write down the question. It is better. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, I considering this water body as a water heritage. So, uh, is that, uh, in your opinion, affecting the affecting the identity of the place? Uh, uh, yes, this is uh, this water body is affected in many ways. Uh, in, uh, uh, we, if we consider socio-cultural aspects, uh, there have uh, there have significant number of uh, activities beside this uh, water body for uh, few, for last few decades. Uh, uh, if we consider uh, the socio-economic aspect, then uh, there have some issues. Uh, there's also decreasing. There's the issues that we worked with actually. We, we uh, by the physical survey, we uh, tried to find out the what was it and the, what we have to do with them. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. And the last question, dear, uh, asking from uh, Dr. Uh, Goksun, how was the approach uh, in order to uh, evaluating the, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the role of mnemonic magazine? How was the approach? I know uh, one, of course, it is obvious that it was the chronological studies that you used. Uh, and uh, what was the other, uh, did you use any other method uh, to understand uh, this, uh, the role of the, the magazine in, the, uh, in, in Turkey in the context of the country? Um, thank you for the question. I uh, contextualized uh, Mimarlık as an actor uh, in the field because uh, it is a it is the official magazine of the Chamber of Architects, and uh, and it is as I have shown in my presentation, it is highly uh, politically engaged. Uh, so its um, concern on the, the uh, spatial transformation of the country is not only uh, for maybe celebrating the new projects and the transformation, but also having uh, concern on public space, the public uh, right uh, of access to costs, and also uh, inclusion of different uh, classes and different interests. Um, so apart from the chronology, uh, maybe not a fully discourse analysis, but a partial discourse analysis. And also uh, I try to understand the positions of the uh, actors. Uh, especially, of course, uh, Mimarlik magazine and the chamber. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. I don't know if you want, if you have, uh, we have more participations. Uh, no. Uh, Dear uh, Dr. Anna, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you are now very fast. Uh, we, we can have a 10 minutes uh, time since uh, Dr. Merve Asmaja will join us and take the, um, the other panel of the studies. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Anna. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And thank, thank you for you. all presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here, let us have a break for five minutes so, and then let us see whether doctor, uh, we can start again. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, I want to know there. Burcu Kismet is uh, in uh, the author. Since I want to know, then we can start uh, the uh, the pandemic panel. Mm. 
no okay even not dear dr merve atmaca is not in yet Okay. Uh, I saw one of the author, uh, Udumia. I think he is in. Yes, Udumia Emmanuel is in in the pandemic panel. yeah yes i'm here i'm here Maron. i am trying to uh, to uh, see whether is other uh, auto yeah, i'm here rokshane hocam can you hear me yes diet so how are you hi hi hocam thank you so very good you are also in probably the first author we don't have because uh, we are a bit, uh, I mean, we, we finished earlier, so I am, I am asking to make sure that the, the, our blog author are in, so we can start the next uh, panel. Yeah, yeah, if you need any help, I can just replace Merve Hanum, if you need any assistance, because you said that she is not here at the moment. Yes, uh, she, she did not appear yet. Uh, thank you very much. Probably we will start uh, with uh, Emmanuel, since uh, Burju Kismet is not in, and or uh, Tayebe Simon Gurai, Dr. Tayebe Simon Gurai is not in. Mm -hmm. We can go to the next one. Menot also is another author, even the coacher. Let us see. No, seriously. Uh, and then we have uh, the the thing is that uh, in this panel, uh, the the first three presentation was regarding uh, the um, the pandemic, and then the four uh, presentation after the eight round table will be about post pandemic. Uh, uh, this was the uh, division of this panel. Seriously, I think uh, Dr. Hidayat, we can even start at, uh, within two minutes, uh, we will start. Hiçbir istersen gir, erken bitmiş seni sorup duruyor Roxana. Evet, tamam canım, hadi öptüm. Görüşürüz. Hi. Yeah, Sorry, I just turn off turn on my video because I don't know what is the problem about internet in Alanya at the moment. Uh, I don't know why, but it is just immediately cut and then come back and then cut and come back. So it happened at home also. It happened the uploading is very uh, let's say uh, low. Uh, the uploading, but uh, downloading is very fast, so that's when they upload. Uh, we have a problem over there. Uh, yeah, we have distance education at the moment, and we we have serious problems about it. But so if something happened, that's not about me. That's about internet connection. For your information. Yes, we are Dr. Merve Atmaja is uh, here with us. Very good. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, do you sleep the, uh, here to the, the first author is not with us, Burju Kısma, for the moment. Uh, in can, my session? Uh, yes, in the in the session of the um, pandemic panel, since we, start, we, we finished earlier. Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Also, I noticed that it's a little bit late. I'm sorry about it. Uh, uh, now, um, in, in this yes, case, maybe... Uh, author uh, Emmanuel. Yes. 
to share the work. I can do it, uh, in fact, and then we will see whether if Burju Kismet or Dr. Tayebe uh, um, Simon will join us. Okay, so uh, now we are starting with the second uh, author uh, and uh, second uh, topic. Uh, the topic is environmental sustainability, sustainability for infection prevention and control in healthcare facilities. Um, this paper is dealing with the role of sustainable design architecture in curbing the pandemic, especially the development of guidelines in healthcare buildings. And now um, uh, I'm sharing. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, My name is Udume. Now. Now I'm sharing. Yes. Hey, Manuel, and I'm presenting this paper on behalf of SADC Osondo, Kalu Cheche Kalu, and Aminu Aman Haliru. The title of our paper presentation is uh, Environmental Sustainability for Infection Prevention and Control in the Healthcare Facility. The presentation will be in the four outline introduction, material and uh, method, result and discussion, and uh, we'll conclude by making some recommendations. By way of introduction, the sustainable environment is that environment that enhances the well being and coexistence of inorganic elements, living organisms, and humans that make up the ecosystem. Now, healthcare settings and Hospital associated infections are highly influenced by three main factors. One, the host factor, two, the agent factor, and three, the environmental factor. The emergence of the novel coronavirus, increasing microbial resistance, quest for more ventilators, personal protective equipment, and of course, the extensive behavioral change as expected by the Center for Disease Control with regard to the present pandemic have made it imperative to appraise the link between the sustainable built environment and infection control. Thus, the aim of the paper is to identify the nexus between a sustainable built environment and infection control in healthcare facilities with a view of developing guidelines and highlighting the role of architecture in curbing the pandemic. Material and method. The research relies extensively on existing literatures, visits to healthcare centers, and interaction with healthcare uh, workers. In the paper review, the study cla classified the evolution of environmental design and infection into three categories, the pre-modern, modern, and contemporary. From the review, the study found that there are many key players that influence the evolution. Top among them is Dr. Tenno, who introduced pavilion plan and stress on the need to have isolation units for peculiar uh, disease in 1854. Another uh, influential, uh, another personality that influenced the, 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 the design or the environmental design is Torres Nettige, who stressed on the need for ventilation, circulation within the patient, good lighting and hygiene in 1853 to 1856. As a, as, a, as a result of her discovery of the link between environmental space patterns and patient healing, that rate among soldiers that were, uh, that were involved in the Crimean War were drastically reduced from 42% to less than uh, 30%. The photograph in the screen shows us the typical pavilion uh, plan of a host, uh, hospital ward as, um, as made popular by Lawrence Nettigen. Now, to understand the relationship between uh, infectious disease transmission and healthcare environment, it is imperative for us to take a closer look at the mode of infectious disease transmission within the healthcare environment. Transmission of micro uh, microorganisms in healthcare facilities are through several routes, and the same microorganism can be transmitted by more than one route or with one, more than one route. Basically, there are three main uh, modes of uh, transmission 
of diseases within the healthcare uh, environment. Number one is the airborne and droplet. Number two is contact um, or surface. Number three is waterborne transmission. It's important to know that built environments such as homes, offices, schools, workplaces, hospitals, and transport terminals have potentially harmful pollutants. Result and discussion. From this paper that we reviewed, the study established that natural daylight and cross ventilation are significant components to disinfect and lessen the infections occurrence in hospitals. And in other words, natural daylight and cross ventilation could be a panacea for the control of the spread of coronavirus uh, in the present pandemic. The study also found that the rate of survival of coronavirus on building material surfaces varies from one material to another. For instance, while coronavirus survived for up to 120 hours on the surface of ceramic, metal, and glass, coronavirus can only survive for four hours on copper surface. And why can coronavirus can only survive for eight hours on aluminum surface? Therefore, it is important to have this basic idea on how building materials respond to uh, bacteria or uh, micro uh, bacteria. The study also found that droplets do not remain suspended in the air, but travel only a short distance, about a uh, distance of about one meter before settling on surfaces. Also, for ventilation to be adequately enough to, to inhibit the spread of uh, uh, micro bacteria, the ventilation rate must not be less than 12 ACH. Based on the finding, therefore, the study therefore suggests the following as a design strategy for infection prevention and control within the built environment. Number one, design for uh, safe distancing. Based on the studies of uh, the behavioral pattern of, uh, uh, of droplets, not being able to travel more than uh, one meter, but within one meter, the study therefore suggests that enough space should be provided in the hospital uh, environment, especially the lobbies and the corridor to guarantee the safe distance of no less than one meter. This study therefore proposed that corridors in the hospital should not be less than 2.6 uh, meters. Number two, designed to enhance natural ventilation. Since it has been established that ventilation and non ventilation within the uh, hospital environment can inhibit the spread of infectious disease, this study therefore encouraged uh, 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 that natural ventilation should be designed into our structures, especially by the use of um, open ended corridors and introduction of courtyard, functional courtyard. Number three, designed to enhance daylight or sunlight. Study reviews show that sunlight was a major uh, antibacterial uh, agent in the pre antibacterial uh, era. So, the study therefore suggests that, based on this present happening, design of healthcare centers should be oriented in such a way that more light will be um, into the environment. Number four, design with adaptive finishing material. It is therefore important that. When designing a healthcare center or healthcare environment, building materials that can act as antimicrobial agents are uh, encouraged to be used, such as copper and aluminum, that have a, where it was shown, proven that coronavirus, for instance, stays within a shorter period because you cannot really guarantee this uh, idea of cleaning and mopping after use. Number five, Design hospitals to be flexible with sustainability uh, features. This is to enable the hospital to easily adapt in case of any epidemic or uh, pandemic. Conclusion The paper survey historical and contemporary proof supporting the influence of key design strategies, natural ventilation, daylight, and antimicrobial building materials in decreasing the threat of infection in healthcare facilities. Design strategies can play a significant role in infection prevention and control. And with the present effort to contain with coronavirus outbreak, it has become necessary that a multidisciplinary approach be adopted. It also proposes that architects, engineers, allied professionals directly involved 
in designing, constructing, and maintenance of healthcare facilities should be given a form of training in public health. By doing so, these professionals will be conscious of the implication of their decisions when it comes to healthcare facility design, because the architects are responsible for mater building material specification. So there's need for him to be aware of the, of the implication of his decision with, with regard to healthcare delivery. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Dr. Merde. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tayebe uh, is uh, here, the first author. Okay. Uh, we, can... So we can start with. Uh, uh, we, we can uh, go on with. But we How can I? Nope. So. I'm sorry about it. I will. Uh, when I start now, That's can you? This is Taibet Seyman. Can you see the? Okay. Hey, welcome to ICCAU conference paper presentation of the study model proposal for integrating VR AR technologies in building construction project in architecture education during COVID-19. Prepared by Taibet Seyman Gulay and Fuji Kismet. The content of the presentation will be as follows. As an introduction of the study, uh, information technologies, including VR, AR, by providing, providing an immersive environment, contain wide range of innovative opportunities in architecture education. The urgent need for adoption of uh, information technologies in architectural education that based on virtual reality, uh, abbreviated as VR, and uh, augmented reality, uh, abbreviated as AR, is growing rapidly as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, which is the first healthcare disaster for the last century. Aim of the study, the study aims to close the gap in this area by proposing a model, integrate VR, AR technologies in building construction education by the assistance of BIM tools in order to boost the effectiveness. The study aims to introduce a model in order to integrate sufficiently and effectively VR and AR technologies into building construction project course. Building construction costs it's, uh, basically uh, involves the production process of construction drawings and documents in order to make the construction of the building. Main focus is generally on the construction details, building material selection, system requirements, design of detailings, and etc. There are various technologies and tools about these technologies, AR and VR, and also IT technologies. In this study, best solution to have maximum level of students' interactions is considered. In the meantime, the model involves selection of tools and specifying the methods to be used with an order. As a result of the distance, ed distance education due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Zoom video conferencing platform is selected as an online platform for the weekly live classes. The tutors and students are using share, uh, screen sharing option to show and discuss the model and the drawings. Also with annotate option in Zoom, the tutors are capable of to draw, highlight and correct during critics and revisions. When we come to uh, the proposed model, uh, as you see here, the real environment and virtual environment, AR and VR, VR, AR and VR technologies, uh, you can see. Uh, AR, uh, as AR, uh, we can use laptops and smartphone tablets uh, in order to generate QR code or, or some video. Uh, when we come to virtual environment, screen and uh, SimLab, SimLab will be used by importing 3D models into the SimLab uh, from Revit platform, uh, creation of real lifetime experience of the design. Uh, SimLab uh, can be connected with Revit or, or, or uh, together with SketchUp. 
Revit uh, drawings, 2D drawings, 3D drawings, and structural system can be produced. Also specifications, material conformation, quantity, construction processes, and energy efficiency report. As analysis, also Revit has some tools uh, or uh, plugins like Revit Insight, energy, energy efficiency, and Revit sun analysis like SunPad. So this group uh, will, will compose the BIM part of the uh, models. In this study, a systematic approach is adopted into building construction course by scheduling weekly to determine when to use uh, which, which tool, which proper tool. The scenario of the building project is prepared and the requirement list is given to the students. Uh, the model is developed for the building construction course, show, showing step-by-step -step integration of related tools and techniques to obtain the learning outcomes efficiently. Multi construction project course aims to develop a technical approach to architectural design and teach detailing in building construction by introducing students the phases and the techniques of the preparation of a construction project. As you see on uh, a weekly, a weekly schedule of the building construction course, uh, each week, uh, which, uh, which subject will be uh, shared with the students and then which tools for that subject will be used and the outcomes of, of, the, uh, of that uh, course is given here. As of the sixth week, obtaining the first simulation with the SimLab software and by seventh week, making decisions such as choosing the joinery systems that affect the elevation of the drawings by using, again, uh, Autodesk Revit. In this eighth week, the jury as a midterm is prepared for the students show their works by using Revit, Lumion, Auto, uh, Photoshop, and with QR code creation and mobile device applications. Assigning material decisions to wall systems, that floor systems, and one over 50 details for the ninth week is planned. Processing the details that are created in Autodesk Revit can be transformed in Autodesk AutoCAD, and specific de details can be modeled in SketchUp software. With the final delivery of project work set, including 2D, 3D drawings, illustrations can be created through mobile device applications and QR code generators and 3D VR environment simulations, the aim of the study is data. Today, as the, uh, as the fourth part is discussion, today we are great variety of options and technology to use in architecture education. However, the crucial point is showing the limitations and possibilities of each tool to use in building construction projects. Hence, it's fundamental to prepare a guideline for students and tutors that which uh, tool to implement at what stage, step by step, to increase efficiency and effectiveness of the learning outcomes according to architectural curriculum. In order to adapt this model properly, main consideration is comes introducing these digital tools to our students starting from the very first year. Uh, in addition, integration of digital tools between each other and mixed usage of hand and digital possibilities should be considered as advantage. Understanding and designing building construction details and decisions, making process on materials and systems are the most difficult stage in architecture education, especially for building construction project course. Traditional methods of 2D drawings and 3D image doesn't give the necessary perception of construction to the students. It's not possible to demonstrate for them how real construction is, how building systems are composed of. On the other hand, it's not practical to experience real construction site during the course for each week. This current situation doesn't allow students to apprehend the relation between the real system and the drawing. Therefore, it turns into a bottleneck. In order to figure out this bottleneck, VR AR simulations are the most effective solution as providing the real-time experience in class environment.
uh, also as a result of distance learning due to the COVID-19 pandemic, VR AR headsets and handsets are not involved in this study uh, because it's not possible for each student to provide this equipment. Desktop-based VR mode and mobile-based AR tools are easy to access and use for students as they are involving these technologies in their daily life frequently. Furthermore, integrating daily life application with building construction projects will give full engagement of students as a significant advantage. As a conclusion, uh, the proposed model is composed of tools and their workflows for process of 14 weeks in order to simulate building construction decision from analysis to preparation of construction documents. Considering COVID-19 pandemic conditions, the proposed model involves creative use of the job, VR, AR tools in distance learning, integration of VIM tool within VR, AR, advantages of desktop-based VR and mobile AR applications are involved. It's the aim to have a guideline model for tutors and students to demonstrate the whole building construction process and all systems as solid. In future studies, the proposed model can be adapted to other building construction courses. Furthermore, recent uh, developments about 3D printing and robotics will improve the proposed model and will give an opportunity to model physically in 3D as a result of integration VR, AI, and VIM. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Again, to Shema Hoja and... Human uh, beings today to realize you. that. The virus lies for the virus is between us. So we accept that we have no more priority over unhuman entities like viruses or other things. However, the main reason behind the coronavirus is still unknown. We blame laboratories, we blame food or human beings, but but eventually we still don't know what the real reason was. Um, philosophers, specifically uh, phenomenologists, suggest object-oriented ontology, alternative theory, or a flat ontology to analyze these kind of events to see this dynamic relationship between objects and human bodies. Therefore, today I'm going to take stink and cholera during the Victorian London to remap this object map to show this interactive relationship between objects. So what is objects? Tom Harman described object as everything that exists. So it doesn't have to be physical, it can be uh, diamonds, it can be armies, it can be fictional or can be dream or it can be just a thought. So everything can be an object. And in this research, I will try to find as much object as possible that were involved in great stink and cholera in Victorian era. Latour, on the other, on the other hand, uh, says that we should call them actors because they have will to do something, so they act. Therefore, uh, he called objects, rather, uh, objects like the actors or actors. When we look at the story of Great Stink, uh, we have to start with the, the sanitation system. When Romans arrived in Britain, they brought their sanitation knowledge with them. However, when they left Britain, Saxons came and they didn't want to adopt what the previous generation left for them. So they start using potties and chamber pots, and during the medieval time, they were just throwing their waste out of the window, especially during the night time. Street, streets of London were dirty and stinky. It, they were like huge sewer that, that includes waste from, from any kind. But in Victorian era, the population of Britain reached up to two and a half millions because of the Industrial Revolution. People came here to, to leave or to work, and most of these people were living in London. Constructors built back-to-back -back houses in which we can see uh, regular sanitation. For example, like 100 people 
there was there there were only one or maybe two uh, toilets. So the situation of the, the waste and the stink were getting worse in London, and streets of London were connecting, collecting all of those waste and directly bringing it to Times River and emptying it there. And there were lots of factories and their waste and slaughterhouses, the refuses from the animals were also directly going to to Thames River. So people thought that during the Victorian era, Thames River could clean those wastes because it was connected to sea. So they were keep dumping their waste to Thames River. During the Great Exhibition, George Jennings offered to design public attendant and he wanted to distribute water basin or the toilet, the modern toilet. So people who saw those water basin in the exhibition, especially those rich people, wanted to install them into their houses. However, the system was medieval sewage system, even though they are using the modern toilet. So then they combine the situation gets worse and the waste amount of the waste and the the steam were getting bigger and bigger in London. So even though they thought that Thames could clean those ways, Thames was a tidal river. So when it there was a tide, Thames was, was pumping those waste back to London. So when it pumped it, those wastewater was mixing with underground sources like, like wells or streams from which Londoners were providing their, their clean water. So people who think that they were drinking clean water, actually drinking their neighbor's excrements or waste. So in 1832, 1849 and 54, there was a cholera outbreak and lots of people died because of this cholera. Nobody, know, nobody knew the real reason behind it. And they thought that it was uh, the cholera was airborne because the weather was terrible and the blood and London was polluted. Also, the steam was everywhere, and they thought that this steam caused cholera. They tried lots of different remedies, but since they didn't know the main reason, they couldn't find a solution for it until John Snow. He was a physician living in Soho thought that it wasn't uh, airborne, it was waterborne, because he realized that there was a sweet taste water source in Broad Street. People who drank water there died. People who never drank water from this, this source were alive. So he developed his theory by refusing the asthma theory, and finally he proved that the, the main source of cholera was this pump in Broad Street. Therefore, he was known as as father of uh, epidemiology today. He convinced government to take the handle from infected wells in Broad Street in 1854, and the number of victims finally dropped. However, the weather was still terrible, terrible in London. So, uh, John Sir Faraday warned Londoners to take an action. However, Londoners didn't change anything in their savage or dry system. In June 1858, the great stink hit London because of the hot weather. The, the watering tanks was blown, opaque, and sticky. People were wearing masks, they're just closing their nose and mouth by using handkerchiefs to, to just escape from the stink. And luckily, House of Parliament moved to their new place, House of Parliament, in and just besides the Thames River. So they wanted to take an action. What they did was passing the bill uh, to reconstruct the sewage and uh, system related to Thames River. They chose civil engineer Joseph Bazaget, and they asked him to redesign the the old sewer system with a modern and new one. Bazanjet designed a modern sewer system 
and he also constructed water treatment station embankments, also alternative fresh water sources. Uh, those are still used by Londoners today. So here, as you can see, I try to collect as much objects as possible that are uh, involved in red, red stink and cholera. So each individual objects are they are uh, uh, standing there without needing one another, and none of them has a priority over one another. I just give different colors them to to make it visible and understandable. That's all. So we see lots of things in there, like lots of people, lots of uh, items, lots of systems like buildings and cultures. They were all came together. They all act, do something, and transform one another, trigger one another, and finally they create these big events as cholera and the great stink. So after the network theory was based on the black box of a plane. Like, you know, when there is a crash, they look at and listen to a black box to understand what happened just before the crash, what caused the crash. So similar to black box of the plane, I want to call cholera and the great thing as urban failure or urban crash. So I want to open the black box of this urban crash to see what inside. I saw those objects, they were all came together and they were meaningful and they are all together in a specific time, in a specific place. And they trigger one another and they create those big events. So my suggestion is using those plant ontology and actor network theory for any kind of um, spatial or doesn't have to be spatial, can be like COVID-19. So we can see what kind of triggers in those kind of events. Thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, actually, these three articles was regarding the uh, during the uh, pandemic or during uh, as the, uh, the paper uh, prepared by uh, uh, Hedayat, Dr. Hedayat was in fact about the long history of uh, um, London regarding the Public uh, Health Act. Uh, in, in 1890, if I'm not wrong. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, curiously, Emmanuel was talking regarding the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the building, the vent ventilation uh, issue in, uh, in the uh, um, health center care. Uh, Doctor, almost different uh, uh, area. Doctor uh, Taibi was uh, talking about the uh, education, pedagogical uh, uh, issue in the uh, during the pandemic, and uh, Doctor Hidayat was in fact more uh, going to the urban aspect uh, of the uh, environment, uh, which in healthcare facilities especially. Yes. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Dr. Menat, do you have any uh, questions? Since uh, it is very interesting, uh, then after that, you have also presentation regarding the post pandemic. Uh, actually, I think I, I'm sorry for joining late. Uh, however, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be uh, in this panel. Um, uh, actually, I find the presentations very informative and uh, very interesting, especially uh, regarding uh, uh, that they are covering uh, various uh, points of views uh, uh, from the, for the post-pandemic uh, Era, actually, we are still um, um, living nowadays. Uh, 
uh, and um, you know, re referring back to the historical uh, acts of uh, protecting the cities from, from uh, major uh, uh, disease outbreaks to how we can can apply uh, ideas and technology to adapt uh, during uh, pandemic uh, era times for education and uh, the similar uh, important interactive uh, topics. Uh, actually, I'm, I don't have specific questions, but I would have liked to um, uh, ask, I'm, I'm really very sorry if I have uh, popped in late, but I was interested in asking regarding the uh, VAR uh, technologies in building construction, whether there is any applicable um, uh, model to uh, discuss or any uh, further information regarding the topic, because as educators, we usually tend to uh, get into uh, uh, the details and how this can be applied uh, um, more uh, precisely, if I may ask. And again, thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, the invitation and for uh, the presentations. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, we are together with Burju that we uh, prepared the paper together. Um, actually, this is, this, our study is a part of a research project funded by the university, and it's uh, it's an ongoing project. So we are now implementing uh, what we we have planned in the paper this time. So uh, it was the planning time we prepared the paper, and now we are implementing. And almost the end of the semester, so we had uh, we have the experience now, and we we are going to uh, write a paper about uh, about our experience and ex experience sharing and we will give more details for sure but uh, we, we are uh, we are still parallel with our plan uh, we, we, we of course uh, there are some difficulties it's not easy sometimes uh, to coordinate students online uh, also in other thing building construction uh, detailings or building construction uh, subjects are another thing uh, we, we are trying to uh, combine but uh, actually uh, what we write on the schedule timetable uh, we, we put uh, I think you there, there are the, some uh, clues or some answers to your question uh, Dr. Maynard uh, that uh, inside there which tool when and uh, by using that tool what kind of outcome we get it, it's all uh, prepared there. Uh, I don't know if I can show now, uh, but the timetable uh, we, we apply inside of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it's it, it's sub we try to be clear at that point. But now we have also the uh, real time experience. So after mm -hmm. that, I think we will improve the paper and we will uh, share as an experience. Maybe would you do you want to say add anything else uh, in this subject? <laughs> Hey, Dr. Taylor, you can share uh, your screen if you have any information to share with us. Uh, I can share if you want. Yeah, I'm prepared. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for the question, but maybe we will share just a short time. Yes, I, I, I will be so much interested in, in seeing the results of the experiment, as in, you know, for for myself, Yanni. It's, it's... For sure, we, we are also excited uh, <laughs> what's happening to show. Can you see? Yes. Ah, yes. It's now okay, but yes. Uh, this is from like a construction uh, project, so it's not like a design course. So uh, our focus uh, was uh, preparing uh, general details and the uh, like structural system, all the systems, uh, general layouts for the detailed projects. But uh, we start from the conceptual project and uh, we give flexibility for students uh, to use their like hand or digital sketches for the first week to have a uh, general layout of the building. Then uh, we want them uh, to continue with uh, the Autodesk Revit uh, software. And uh, according to the uh, our schedule, they, they are starting from uh, one to 500. Then they will go to in detail uh, with floor plans. Uh, also, uh, with the help of Revit, automatically the sections and the 3D model and the elevations uh, will be prepared. 
but of course they need to use their information uh, and their uh, knowledge about architecture to uh, change the section details or the elevations. Uh, also, we are adapting uh, Simlab as a software uh, for a desktop VR mode and a mobile AR mode uh, to increase the integration uh, with students between each other, also with us. Later then, uh, they are continuing uh, with uh, one to 500 details for the whole uh, building systems from foundation to the roof. Also, we want them to uh, decide all the materials, finishings, and those elements. And uh, from this part, uh, from like week seven, we are uh, expecting to see like QR codes, some videos, and those uh, applications uh, to show integration, to minimize the negative effects of COVID pandemic situation. And uh, we are using also different uh, plugins uh, or different programs for the energy analyzers too. Yeah. Amazing, thank you so much. Mm, you're welcome. Uh, I want to say is something, uh, it's a little bit um, dealing with the same uh, topic. Uh, last year, the end of the year, we tried to make a, a VR uh, and three-dimensional modeling uh, for students' um, ex exhibition uh, because we want, we want to feel the real uh, exhibition hall in our university. Uh, we uh, modeled the real uh, hall and after that we put the uh, students uh, posters in it uh, and we um, uh, try how how we feel and how students feel their selves in the university like real. Uh, it will be good. Uh, it, it was be very good, uh, and they also excited uh, very much. So uh, it's a good way to uh, try it in the uh, in, in into the education part. Uh, it's a really excited uh, topic. I think. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Is there any other question? I don't have any questions from my sides. Um, I we we don't like... have too much uh, other question. We can continue the next uh, topic, but we don't uh, have online as online. Uh, it, it isn't uh, loaded. Yes, uh, Dr. Merve, let me check whether uh, um, uh, well, Taher or Hana are in. If not, uh, probably they will do online presentation or if not, uh, we will skip. No, I couldn't find them. Dear Tahir, dear Hana. Uh, there's, um, I think there's an HH um, <clears throat> name, but I'm not sure if this is Hana or not. This is dear uh, Dr. Hidayat. Uh, 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 with name of H H, am I right? Yes, this is Hidayat. That's correct. Mm. Thanks Other for the nice pronunciation. <laughs> Otherwise, we will go on with you again, uh, Doctor yeah. Hidayat. I'm fine. You you can choose. So okay, I'm sharing your Hi. next um, presentation. Yes. My name is Hidai Softoğlu. Today I'm going to talk about ephemera and ephemeral in urban. So as you all know that we are now trying to stay sweet and compete with global pandemic. We are taking some cautions like wearing masks and disinfecting everywhere, keeping our social distance from each other because we want to survive while we also continue our everyday life. So if the pandemic ends one day, it will be called temporary situation. It is ephemeral, not the permanent situation. But scientists warn us that there will be, there will be waiting some other disasters or um, environmental forces like uh, climate change waiting for us. So 
considering this future scenario, today I choose Times Frost Fair as a case study to talk about what makes something urban ephemera and how society produce their own spaces and continue their everyday life by using tactics in, in this kind of disaster. Ephemera is therefore a term to, to describe short-lived, short-time things can be anything. So today I will use ephemera for the situation that is not temp that is temporary but not permanent. And also I will mention about ephemeris. Those are documents that were produced out of out of the ephemeral activities. The history of cross layer based on the London Bridge. Uh, the cross between South London and North London was vital for Londoners. So they produce bridges for a couple of times because each time when they produced the bridge, it was affected by water in the Thames. And until the 12th century, uh, there were lots of crosses between North and South London. But in 12th century, Londoners built uh, durable bridges, which you can see from the image. It was more than a cross, since there were lots of daily activities like eating, dining, even praying, shopping, and, and other things. But uh, when they built the bridge, they used these huge starlings in the water that blocked water flow. And when in between the 16th and 19th century, the Little Ice Age hit London, Thames River couldn't flow from one side to another. Therefore, it was just suddenly frozen with everything in it and on it. So you can see the ships there. It was all frozen and stuck in Thames River. And London Bridge was a kind of dangerous space since it had a slippery surface during the frost. And life in London was kind of kind of death that time. Londoners need uh, some tactics to continue their everyday life. So Michel de Suto described this external forces that keep ourselves and they isolate us from everyday life is as a strategy. So it is not about strategical thinking, but rather it is more about these forces and powers. So if there is a strategy, uh, people or communities need to find some tactics to continue their life. So therefore, tactics here and finding opportunities to get that space or to, to get benefits out of this space. In terms of improves, we can say that the frost itself was a strategy. And here Londoners were subverters. They resist the frost and they try to get this cross area as their own territories by developing some tactics. And this is the device space into three different phases. There is a primitive space, which is an existing one. We produce memories in memories in this primitive space that makes it memorable space. And there is a believable space. It combines memory and primitive spaces and blend with tactics during uh, strategical events. But in that case, what happened, there was a primitive space like, like Thames River and London Bridge, where they cross from one to another side, they dine, they shop, they entertain. And during, it was Christmas times when the frost hit London. So it was festive season. So Londoners combined all those primitive and memorable activities together, and they developed their own tactics to utilize Times River uh, where they can meet all of those functions. So they turn this vast area into a festival area. So they are organized a frost fair. So you see the London Bridge at the very back side and you see people are crossing from one side to another. They eat, they dine, they play game and they skate. They in on the eyes and, and doing other entertaining activities at the same time. So it is 
as you can see here, it lasts between December 1683 to February uh, 1684. So this an ephemeral activity, not because of this short time duration. It is also because of those ephemeris that were produced out of those activities. For example, if there is a person who wants to print a name on a stamp, they say, uh, that was a printer, that's like, like a, a dry sound. I want to stop uh, and I will play it again because I couldn't understand it is dealing with my connection or uh, it's about I can I can play uh, to check whether maybe maybe because I can see you easily but in this mm -hmm. Um, presentation. If you want, I can stop share. Uh, yes, please. Um, okay. Uh, going. Uh, I can say the minutes which we stopped it six thirty. Uh, yeah, I found it now because I think the uh, YouTube uh, is the sometimes this problem is not uh, uploading uh, quite well the uh, the video. Uh, dear uh, Dr. John, you can also since even you are very always well prepared, uh, you can continue. Yeah, I can continue if you want. You can just show yeah. the image of the presentation, and I can keep going. It, actually, it was about ephemeris. It, ephemeris is. Uh, are documents that were produced out of these ephemeral activities. So the images that we're seeing in, uh, on the screen, uh, the right one is, I think, I think the previous image, the, just before this one. So uh, at the right side, you are seeing a song that was only produced for Frost Fair. And on the left-hand side, you will see a sitem that shows that the king uh, was, the, ch the King Charles was in the, Frost. So those kind of ephemeral documents, uh, the, the, those kind of documents that were produced during those times, they were produced to prove that this ephemeral activity will end one day. And they need a souvenir or a memory to prove that there was a frost and there have been here. So they, for that reason, we call them uh, not only archive, but also ephemeris because they were produced during this ephemeral time. So next one, please. Maybe it will get better if you continue to just, sure. So, and for the next one, we will see some other frost until 1830, maybe. Can you try here? Uh, because Okay, I will conclude it. That's fine. So uh, what I was saying that if we can end pandemic one day, because we are collecting lots of documents like like masks, like, like images, videos, or other media things like media, how to say, um, media object that shows things related to pandemic. So we will use those kind of documents like ephemeris like, like um, I don't know, like the empty box of vaccine can be any kind of unused mask or other things. They will be an archive and they were produced out of this ephemeral, out of this um, temporary activity. So if we cannot finish it, 
it will be permanent situation. We have to live with it. But at the moment, we don't know if it will end or not. So I call this term kind of limbo situation. Therefore, I take the F from ephemera and connect with limbo. And I call current situation at, as F limbo. That was the conclusion, actually. Thank you very much. So it, it become kind of interactive presentation. Uh, sorry about the video. I check it a couple of times before I load it. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Hidayah. You're welcome. Uh, you, I know you are always well prepared, so you could continue. Yeah, you know, Murphy theory is always working with me, so it must happen one day. <laughs> yes. And the next one uh, from Associated Professor uh, Mennat. And I, I can share it if you want. Okay. Hello, I'm Minnal Hosini, and today I'm going to present uh, the research uh, paper uh, named Post Pandemic Home Design Adaptations Lessons Learned for Future. Uh, theory and practice as my contribution in uh, the International Conference of Con Contemporary Ur Urban Affairs in Architecture and Urbanism. Um, as we are all aware um, uh, that the year 2020 uh, caused a paradigm shift regarding the spread of COVID-19, uh, leading to quarantine and calls for staying at home have been widely spread Accordingly, the home entity have, has been subjected to sudden transformations from merely a place for shelter and family and familiar family private and semi-private activities to a place expected to foster and enhance for education, recreation, act as a work environment and provide specialized medical care if needed in several cases. The research aim was to provide lessons learned from the pandemic outbreak to enhance the architecture practice as well as pedagogy while addressing the future of home design in our communities. The methodology uh, used in this research depended primarily on deductive qualitative methods. Analysis of different spaces uh, for homes ha have been uh, conducted um, based on first-hand uh, data got gathered from residents of a wide category of uh, homes uh, and uh, the most uh, particular and uh, different uh, unique and unique uh, cases have been um, expressed uh, have been discussed and studied in uh, this research uh, in addition to this, surveys have been distributed in a wide uh, sample, uh, among whom were uh, the in-depth state uh, study sample. And finally, uh, there have been interviews conducted to uh, to be able to assess the level of comfort and tools of adaptation made by the residents during uh, the lockdown in uh, 2020. The research uh, structure uh, starts with a theoretical review regarding the adaptations in the global housing uh, uh, as um, a typology to meet the new needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to this, it's, it was important to highlight uh, the meanings of placeness in dwellings in order to understand how home is not just a, merely a shelter, but rather a bigger um, um, uh, entity which beholds several physical as well as psychological and mental layers which need to be addressed. Uh, following the literature, the theoretical review, uh, local case study analysis has been uh, uh, conducted. Uh, this was um, uh, done through physical space documentation and qualitative analysis using behavioral mapping surveys, interviews, and assessment of space uh, during and before the lockdown in order to compare how different users uh, started adapting their uh, available spaces in order to um, to be to have a better environment uh, during uh, the long period of time they had to stay at home. 
uh, in-depth qualitative analysis uh, for one selected cases has been uh, highlighted and will be uh, briefly explained in this presentation. And finally, comparative analysis between the case studies have, has been uh, also uh, uh, um, presented. And finally, the recommendations and lessons learned from uh, the current uh, situation. Um, the theoretical review regarding the new normal for our uh, uh, new, new, new normal following the COVID-19 pandemic has been um, uh, high, has been uh, widely uh, affecting uh, architecture up to this moment. Uh, it's not, although uh, as El Sharifi uh, exposes that it's not the first time in human history when pandemics reflect on how cities reacted in everyday life, and that there are problems from quarantine and isolation, which may lead to mental and social problems that have huge impacts on global economy from another side. It is important to apply more human-centered design in the future, and this aims to prevent chronic diseases, allergies, and sick building syndrome, resulting from the continuous lockdown and poor um, conditions in some cases. And uh, finally, social behavior and citizen awareness are considered important factors in dealing with this pandemic in the current era. Um, the need for new, for new home design as a result of COVID-19 has also been uh, widely discussed and debated by scholars uh, during the year 2020 uh, and 2021. According to Salem, to, pla to place uh, a home and uh, the needs for uh, new homes uh, is, uh, are related to place attachment, personal space and relations, relationships between individuals and groups, as well as proximity to nature, which will be revisited, especially as related to home designs in middle income classes, which are lacking this uh, attribute in the current, uh, in most of the current cases. This, re this reflects on how Bachelor advocates for the home <clears throat> to represent protective intimacy of the houses of our dreams, as well as those of our reality. He describes it simply as inhabited space. While they presents that the high density in informal settlements for lower and middle income countries pose a different set of challenges. Social distancing in itself has been a very uh, far-fetched challenge for so many uh, cases, especially in informal uh, dwellings. Um, it ha um, in order to summarize uh, what exactly needs to be uh, highlighted and reflected upon while regarding the home entity uh, to be resilient and to be sustainable for future homes, uh, given, given uh, the academic measures and the possibility of uh, considering this current new normal for a longer period of time than expected. So it is, uh, it has to be um, uh, questioned how to effectively avoid disease propagation, how to minimize the environmental effect, and lastly, how to maintain and improve the comfort of people depending, uh, spending most of their time at home. The case studies selected have been, ha are um, five samples from the wide spectrum of homes uh, which have been studied before and after uh, the lockdown situation 2020 and the five cases have been uh, selected uh, to uh, reflect the middle and higher and middle income classes in Cairo uh, where uh, special features uh, are uh, exposed in each case. For example in case number one uh, uh, the furniture adaptations were crucial uh, to create social interaction because when the residents had to uh, spend more time in their home, um, they started noticing that everyone was in their own uh, uh, bubble, so they needed to readapt the place to enhance and create social interaction during the lockdown. While they started adding some greenery in the terraces and to accommodate recreation activities, especially, especially in uh, when it was 
um, it was not allowed to go uh, out in anywhere, and it was, and this affected uh, to a great extent their psychological uh, and uh, physical uh, well-being. Uh, in the second case, there has been a, a more um, um, uh, constructive um, uh, adaptations for transforming the semi-public zone into work spaces from home uh, because uh, uh, the residents needed to work from home and they were not allowed to go to the workspaces as most of our cases and uh, the compromising, the comp compromising the office space uh, um, uh, affected to a great extent the privacy and we will see together how this has been affected has been uh, reflected on the uh, design of the home. In the third case study, uh, the residents need to use uh, the guest space to accommodate the decreased personal space inside the rooms and more utilization of natural sunlit areas for psychological wellness was also has also been one of the crucial adaptations they needed to work uh, on uh, while uh, adapting uh, for the lockdown. Uh, in cases number four and five, it has been uh, observed that, that uh, the families uh, have to add four uh, um, work uh, stations in the semi-public uh, uh, spaces of their home, uh, since they are they were not um, actually um, expecting guests as before, and at the same time, several uh, uh, family members uh, were studying at the university and they needed their own uh, concentrated uh, bubbles. And um, this were uh, the, those two cases shared um, mostly the same concept of uh, re adapting uh, the home uh, uh, workspace or study area. In case number one, as we have mentioned, uh, the main uh, challenge was to uh, provide more spaces for interaction. So they started uh, thinking of re-adapting the uh, uh, furniture layouts and to use uh, the balconies in order to create some sort of uh, uh, private uh, secluded havens in order to um, uh, enhance uh, the psychological well-being. In the second case, the um, most uh, dominant aspect was the need for a music studio, since the father has been working on uh, recording uh, music and it was not possible during the lockdown to use his uh, stu uh, the studio uh, uh, elsewhere. So the most uh, 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 secluded space was used for the music work while each and every family member had to use their own spaces uh, inside their uh, bedrooms and uh, to use the office room also for sometimes studying and sleeping in order to accommodate for the um, uh, proximity effects of the lockdown. In the third case, the main, it was mostly a better actually uh, a standard of uh, housing um, uh, and this allowed for uh, seasonal adaptations uh, during the lockdown, meaning that uh, they all, uh, usually uh, tended to use uh, 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 um, ventilation and cross ventilation and to, adapt, to use more the spaces which had uh, sunlight, uh, according to uh, spring and uh, summer and winter settings, in order to uh, use for uh, dis disinfection and to uh, enable for uh, more uh, uh, secluded, however, inter uh, family interaction zones, and it has it was easily uh, proportionally uh, adapted to create the. Uh, spatial uh, bubbles uh, since the area was uh, yeah, actually uh, uh, allowed for that. In uh, the case study, in the fourth case study, the main challenge was uh, having to share uh, the same home, uh, the same rooms for uh, uh, university students while each uh, student had uh, 
uh, their own uh, um, um, online classes and their own uh, work which needs which needed uh, uh, into, uh, um, concentration so we started adding in the reception area uh, uh, spaces for uh, workstations uh, and they uh, con con concluded that actually it was a good idea to start uh, creating bubbles of uh, interaction of uh, work uh, stations inside the home, even if there is no lockdown, since this will allow for social interaction while maintaining also that each uh, student had their own uh, uh, space one uh, unit, which is not um, affected by anyone else. In the fifth case study, also uh, it, there has been a shift in the private, semi-private and public uh, zones with uh, the uh, urge to create some quality time activities inside the uh, mostly uh, vacant uh, living and dining rooms and to use the reception area in uh, more uh, uh, personal uh, spaces uh, mode uh, in order to make use of each and every available space in the home. Finally, the qualitative analysis, which has been conducted on 140 respondents, uh, most of which have been females and uh, also uh, most of which have been working, um, it, it resulted that um, more than half the uh, sample have been working from home. However, uh, it has been observed that it, it almost 50-50 of uh, the respondents shared uh, do not have separate rooms for uh, themselves. Uh, almost 40 percent of the sample uh, mentioned that their privacy has been affected during the lockdown and uh, actually more than uh, half uh, the respondents mentioned that they used their own bedrooms with adaptations to work uh, from home as to the main alterations they mentioned was to provide more privacy, to provide more interactive spaces in order to uh, break this uh, boundary between having to be totally secluded from the family or being or not having the enough uh, needed personal space for uh, concentrating at home. Uh, a, a large sample also mentioned that uh, if there are any alterations they would handle would, would be uh, to uh, add more green areas uh, and a sector of um, the respondents mentioned that their homes need major changes, changes in order to um, um, adapt for any possibly uh, futuristic uh, stay-at-home uh, quarantine or lockdowns. Uh, the data in particular for this uh, qualitative analysis is uh, thoroughly uh, displayed in the paper. Uh, finally, the in-depth uh, study uh, for applying uh, the residence demand uh, has been applied on this case. Uh, first, it has been uh, assessed regarding to the environmental uh, uh, speci uh, speciality of this uh, space, uh, where uh, the northern, uh, the northeastern uh, elevation allows for ventilation, while there have been um, um, uh, parallel openings which allowed for natural uh, ventilation and and very good actually uh, cross uh, ventilation in cases of uh, uh, needing to air uh, the, the home. Uh, and also this allowed for um, natural sunlight to uh, disinfect uh, the uh, wet areas and uh, spaces for, for um, the living area. However, uh, the residents in this case mentioned that uh, their uh, semi-opened uh, plan design was not a ve very effective during the lockdown since uh, the 
open uh, plan uh, in the living room with the office and uh, the, uh, the kitchenette uh, blocked uh, some sort, this sort of uh, the needed um, seclusion during um, uh, video conferencing or during uh, online studying. So actually it ended up that um, each family member used uh, uh, the whole floor, which has which is open, in order to maintain for their uh, needed uh, uh, concentration uh, during uh, work. Uh, so um, perhaps this was one of the main issues to uh, regard as architects and, uh, and regarding uh, designing for uh, more contemporary modernized open plans however it has to be taken into account in the future that uh, more uh, secluded and uh, uh, possible uh, isolated spaces would be needed in case a family member would be um, uh, would have the need to isolate themselves uh, due to an infection or a disorder. Uh, um, to wrap up the paper, uh, some uh, guidelines have been concluded uh, as some lessons learned to uh, uh, um, change the standards of uh, how architects and designers and educators regard the home entity uh, post uh, uh, pandemic uh, as a post pandemic uh, uh, home readaptation. Uh, primarily, it is important to uh, make sure that there is enough natural ventilation in all spaces and to allow for direct sunlight to disinfect the wider spaces in the home. Uh, perhaps it would be uh, important, as according to uh, what have been studied from uh, the several cases, to reduce the spaces, especially in the Egyptian culture, uh, regarding the uh, guest uh, receptions and spaces uh, uh, dedicated for semi-public areas in favor of uh, adopting recreational and social interactive uh, family uh, spaces, which would be, which, which, which would allow uh, uh, every uh, space in the home to be actually efficient and utilized without any spaces which are uh, occasionally used. More psychologically appealing work from home spaces would be a new demand or a new need in post-pandemic homes. Uh, it's important to provide greenery, even if uh, uh, the standard of uh, housing is not uh, uh, for uh, the middle, uh, the higher middle income classes or the, income, or the higher classes, because um, uh, aside from having uh, this as a luxury and a recreational aspect, this helps a lot in enhancing and providing uh, a better mental uh, uh, and psychological uh, health for the residents. It's also important to provide a threshold for this infection, and this has been also expressed uh, uh, more um, thoroughly in the paper uh, regarding how to uh, admit and uh, what to admit to the home and how to start disinfecting uh, the uh, entries and the thresholds to provide for better hygienic uh, status. Uh, finally, physical and psychological well-being would be the priority for designers in the upcoming uh, phase, rather than uh, uh, more um, unused uh, spaces uh, in the new uh, uh, home designs. Thank you, and uh, I would be um, um, uh, pleased to answer any questions you might have. Best regards, and thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, also, I have uh, my presentation now, and it's very related with uh, Dr. Menna. And now I'm sharing uh, my presentation.
Hello, this is Dr. Merve Atmaca from Beykent University, Department of uh, Engineering and Architecture. My paper's topic is an evaluation on flexible architecture and smart building integration after the pandemic. This paper explains the necessity of a connection between smart building and flexible design in architecture through the criteria of concept and uh, historical development processes. It is expected that the expectations and needs of the users that have changed after the pandemic will accelerate the integration between these concepts. The purpose is smart building is maximum benefits maximum functionality and max maximum savings when it comes to smart building the automation systems of the building come to mind first but in the smart building concept the technical properties of the materials used in the building as a smart material and even the flexible space organization that can change functions with mobile systems should also be considered. When the design is viewed in terms of functional flexibility, flexible spaces that can serve different purposes simultaneously in the organization of the space will be discussed. With the online life that started after the pandemic, the design expectations are towards the inclusion of office functionality in a standard residence. We know that Physical life of the building is longer than functional life, the life of building. Therefore, functional flexibility is a must to be able to speak of real saving. This table explains the direct and indirect purposes of the concept in terms of user expectations. When the two concepts are integrated, it shows that all expectations of the users are met as a direct goal. If you uh, want to look at again, you will see one by one as smart building and flexible design, uh, all the criteria uh, will be checked if they integrated smart building and flexible design criteria. Here is an exemplary standard flat uh, plan in a project of 1,000 flats in Istanbul. This flat area is nearly 100 meters square. There is two bedrooms, one of master bedrooms, and uh, one living room uh, in the house, and uh, also kitchen, uh, bathroom, two bedrooms. Uh, optionally storage whole corridor uh, something like this it is it's, uh, approximately 100 meters square and if we consider the ever single family uh, life scenario the schools of the two children of different ages also continue online while each parent uh, works in different business segment for this scenario two separate study areas for each child and two separate study area for parents will be needed a number of flexible design solutions are required to maintain four different functions at the same time with the number of current room number uh, so we have to add some functions in the current functional rooms. Uh, for example, living room plus workplace for one. Uh, it has to be something like that. We have to add some flexible solutions in current situation. You can find the historical development of the concept and the issue in intersection during this development in the full text paper. I don't want to take so many times with the history of uh, these different concepts in architecture. Uh, but when we look at the uh, period of two concepts, 
uh, we can see some intersection uh, and these intersections explain the relation between uh, two different but integrated, uh, must be integrated uh, concepts. When we look at the housing design expectations after the pandemic, uh, we can summary that innovative and flexible new house designs compatible uh, with changing conditions, conversion of existing residences for changing conditions and including office functions in standard residential design. Here you see the current sample flat housing expectations of the pandemic to flexible systems. By dividing spaces with flexible furniture and building elements, their functions can be differ differentiated. Thus, all users can simultaneously perform their tasks without disturbing each other. Um, you can see some examples uh, from the different type of flexible solutions. Uh, some of uh, that is changing the background and uh, the other one is change the function of the room. Uh, you can choose what you need, uh, for example, to separate a, a room to different functions. You Maybe you can choose sliding walls, uh, but uh, in the other part, for example, in the kitchen, uh, you need only change the background so maybe you can um, choose the folding cover will be enough um, here uh, you can see a table this table shows the recommended comfort values according to design criteria for changing spaces through flexible design for the sample house the comfort parameters of the spaces whose function change in their division also change. For example, when an area used for sleeping turns into an office, the thermal, visual, uh, acoustic, and indoor air quality comfort requirements or values, standard values, are also different from each other. So, uh, these differences explain the necessity of smart systems that adapt to flexible design. Also, you can find uh, for the other functions in a house, um, living, cooking, working, sleeping, etc., for the sample flat. Uh, and you can find also the comfort conditions in, in the standards. As a conclusion, the pandemic that continues all over the world has shown that when health is under threat, the rights, priorities, and needs of people in many areas, such as housing, work, working, and social connections, uh, that can change rapidly. This means that designers should not only design the present, but also the future that is compatible with changing conditions. It is undoubtedly difficult to predict the future from today, but design approaches such as smart design and flexible design may be the keys to achieving this harmony. As explained in the paper, when smart systems are handled in a holistic manner with flexible design, the problem of ending the functional life of buildings is avoided, which prevents the increase of idle buildings who, whose Structural life continues. Flexible and smart building design measures should be taken to match the functional life of the building with its physical life. Saving, which is the main goal of smart buildings, also supports spatial saving with the concept of flexibility. It would be unfair to technology to leave the responsibility to, to the user for active systems that adapt to changing solutions. Therefore, when flexible design is considered independent from smart building systems, it is an incomplete design approach since it cannot fully respond to comfort requirements, especially during after the 
pandemic, but the teaching of the pandemic while the while it is on the agent to continue life from home as much as possible, the concept of comfort has become a prerequisite requisite for the productivity and psychology of the user. As a result, need residences need to be designed as flexible and smart residences that can act home officially. Thank you for your interest. Yes, any questions to others? Yes, dear Dr. Salar. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me clearly? I, I think I have some problem with my internet. Yeah. Um, I want to ask uh, Dr. Minnat and Dr. Marwa both together, uh, how much they believe that uh, the pandemic will affect uh, the, the, the design criteria in the future uh, after the pandemic? And uh, how much they believe that uh, the, the, the criteria for the post pandemic will last uh, if the uh, pandemic uh, will be vanished or will be finished uh, after uh, 10 years, maybe, or after five or 10 years, uh, they think that uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the criteria will be uh, very important for the investors or uh, again, uh, the factor uh, of economic will uh, uh, take front seat in the design uh, uh, process, because we have a, a example of um, uh, Spain flu. Uh, after uh, before hundred years, we have seen Spain flu, and uh, later on we didn't see any changes in in architectural criteria, especially in the design. So, how much they believe that this post a uh, pandemic design will go on successfully as they uh, show. So I can answer uh, first. Uh, I think um, this experience uh, sh showed that the name and type of uh, disasters may change, uh, but uh, various spaces should be designed to adapt to new situations. So maybe we, we can um, achieve uh, with these current conditions. Uh, we will go on our lives, but after that, we, we have to make some, uh, some touch to design, uh, to, um, to solve the future problems. So um, I am dealing with the uh, flexible design. Uh, and uh, I think that the flexible design may uh, answer too many different questions at the same time uh, about uh, sustainability, about uh, um, efficient usage of the functional spaces and changing the function of spaces. Uh, etc and uh, integrated between the uh, smart buildings so it's uh, very hard uh, relationship uh, between future i think but uh, also um, i have some uh, similar knowledge uh, about the uh, previous diseases uh, we, do, we didn't see any changes home design, but uh, I think it, it, it's be, it would be a little bit different uh, from the others because nearly two years we are uh, living, working uh, in our homes uh, uh, and th this is um, in all over the world. So uh, I think it, it, will, uh, it will be changed 
change some uh, design uh, points. Uh, if I may, uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murphy, and I'm really very uh, glad that um, we are sharing uh, uh, the more or less the same approach. Uh, actually, I believe um, that it's not going uh, that the, the world is not going back again to um, the normal we used to, to have um, uh, many. Um, uh, situations have shown drawbacks. Of the uh, uh, the traffic and uh, actually the environment too, from the overcrowding and the tr long transportation uh, uh, time. And uh, um, most theories are calling for a new normal where uh, there's um, a value for uh, every uh, uh, centimeter in any public or private uh, uh, institution or uh, architectural outcome. So it's, it's, I agree, of course, with you, Professor Salar, that it's an, um, mostly an inventory uh, uh, field uh, study. Uh, it's going to be uh, proved uh, correct or it's going to be proved as uh, um, uh, as uh, Dr. Hidayat has pointed out that it's just a temporary uh, time and we will have evidence that uh, from the mosques and uh, our uh, current status and our documents now that we there was a time when we couldn't meet face to face. And actually, I, 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 pointing out to this, when I was doing the presentation, I myself had COVID-19 uh, and uh, it was a very painful time when I had to lock myself down in my room and use and use it and uh, use it for the presentation and for the paper and for my online classes uh, in the university. And at the same time, my children were uh, having their classes uh, in another place in the home. Um, I think that perhaps um, uh, we have another mode or uh, an upgraded mode of living um, in our um, life in a different way than it used to be. Um, yet it's not, it's going to be, uh, yes, again, confirmed uh, as the years go through. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we have also one more question uh, uh, in the note uh, asked by Mojde. The question is probably the question goes to uh, Menot and uh, dear Merve, uh, which factor or criteria have more effective in the housing and building as private space in order to improve the health issue in this pandemic process? Probably it means that, I mean, uh, since you did the assessment, uh, which part of, um, which part of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the house is more effective to be, become more uh, private in this during this uh, pandemic issue. If I'm not wrong. Uh, okay, uh, I can uh, give an answer. Uh, I think it can be changed uh, as the scenario.